President, we are live and of course we're present, so you may uh, start the Great. Soon. Welcome everybody to the February 10th uh, Oakland Unified uh, School District Board meeting. Uh, Mr. Rakestraw, can we begin with an attendance roll call? Yes. Student Director Powell. Student Director Ramos. Director Ng. Director Ng, you, you're muted. Here. Director Yi. Here. Director Williams. Director Hutchinson. Director Thompson. Yes. Vice President Davis. Present. And President Gonzalez. I am here. Uh, we well, are going to. I'm present. Thank you, Mr. Rickshaw. We are going to recess shortly into closed session to discuss labor matters, real property matters. Um, pupil discipline matters. But before we do, um, are there any public speakers on our closed session agenda, Ms. Floyd? Yes, we have one, uh, Jim Mordecai. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Mordecai. Jim Mordecai, speaking as an individual, uh, thank you for uh, giving me the uh, privilege of being able to address the board at this time. Uh, I want to point out there's a distinction to be made between a privilege and a right. I used to have the right to address the board on any agenda item. I no longer have that right since uh, uh, the Gonzalez Amendment uh, changed. So anything uh, I, I say is just at the um, uh, beck and call of the chair as to whether I get to speak or not. And I would ask each and every member of this board to uphold the right of full public comment and leave this meeting because the agenda is flawed and not in compliance with the Brown Act. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mordecai. Are there any other speakers, Ms. Floyd? There are no other speakers, Madam President. Okay, great. We will recess into closed session. We'll be back here at 530. We'll see you then.
Chair, Madam President. Welcome everyone to our board meeting. Um, today is Wednesday, February 10th. And uh, can we begin with an attendance roll call? Yes, so the attendance roll call, second roll call, Student Director Powell. Here. Student Director Ramos. Student Director Ramos. Director Ng. Director Ng. Director Yi. Director Yi. Director Williams. Here. Director Hutchinson. Director Hutchinson. Director Thompson. Yes, here. Vice President Davis. Present. Uh, President Gonzalez. I'm here. Quorum present. Thank you, Mr. Rickstra. Um, colleagues, um, one of our one of our board staff recently lost uh, his father. And I wonder if tonight we could uh, adjourn our meeting in honor of the memory of Chen Fin Se Chow. Um, and so I really uh, just, we, our thoughts and our, you know, all of our love is with uh, the family, the Se Chow family as they go through this hard, hard time. Um, let's see. So for our closed session tonight, um, oh, we need to do the whole, all the recitals. So thank you for joining us. Um, tonight we're going to be piloting closed captioning. So we'll see how that goes and uh, welcome your feedback. General counsel, can you do our interpretation stuff? Thank you, Madam President. Um, uh, Ms. Walker Marquez, if you could do the uh, Spanish translation, please. Yes, hello. Uh, this is Rebecca Walker, and today my coworker David and I are going to be interpreting in Spanish in this meeting. So, uh, something for the English speakers please speak at a natural pace because we're doing simultaneous interpreting, and that goes especially when you are reading a presentation so we can convey everything that you're saying. Now, I'm going to do a presentation in Spanish. Bienvenidos. Esta es una junta que cuenta con servicio de interpretación simultánea al español. Entonces, para escuchar la interpretación en vivo, vaya a sus controles de la pantalla y va a ver eh, un icono, un símbolo de un globo terráqueo. Haga clic en él y va a desplegarse una lista con los idiomas y seleccione donde dice Spanish, que es español. Usted va a poder escuchar más alto la interpretación al español y más bajito todo el volumen de lo que se está diciendo en inglés y usted tiene la oportunidad de apagar la parte del inglés si no quiere escucharla. Si por alguna razón se escucha al mismo volumen los dos idiomas, sálgase de la reunión y regrese y eso normalmente soluciona el problema. Ahora, eh, dos cosas. Para hacer comentarios públicos, hágalo como el resto de la gente, de los participantes. Uh, Pida la palabra y usted hable claramente en español y nosotros le haremos la interpretación al inglés. Y para saber si hay alguien que necesita en esta sección de la Junta Interpretación al Español, por favor, levante la mano virtualmente o si no, en el chat escriba que necesita interpretación al español para que le damos el servicio. Si nadie lo pide en este momento, no se va a dar servicio de interpretación hasta el siguiente punto de la junta cuando alguien lo pida. Gracias. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Walker Marquez. Uh, I do not see any hands raised at this time, so we will not have Spanish interpreting just for the start of this item, but of course we will uh, later on uh, if there are hands raised. Uh, Ms. Ho, if you could do the Cantonese request for interpreting. I'm Thank you, Ms. Ho. Uh, no hands are raised, and so we will uh, also not start with Cantonese interpreting, uh, but of course we will ask uh, later on in the meeting as soon as go forward. Madam President, thank you. Thank you, General Counsel. Um, let's see here. So 
Let's see, as a reminder, um, we will ask for um, interpretation needs at the beginning of each item, um, but uh, we will release our interpreters for the night if there are no requests for interpretation services when we get to section T, new business. Um, and then for folks interested in making public comment, there will, there will be six opportunities. Well, one, we took public comment on closed session items, but when we get to section K, you can make a public comment on anything that is not on the agenda. When we get to section L, you can make a public comment on any item that is on the agenda. Tonight's meeting will probably go quite late. So that is a good opportunity if there's an agenda on that you would like to speak to. Um, section M, we are gonna be getting a report today on our uh, Oakland in the Middle enrollment campaign. You can make public comments there. Also on new business items, section T, and at the end of the meeting in section Z, any, any, a public comment on any topic at the end of the meeting. Um, people have been making e-comments, so it seems like people know how to do that, but you can also make e-comments via the agenda for the meeting in the Legislative Information Center. And you can always email us first name dot last name at ousd.org. Um, our usual instructions, we will all be on video. Board members and the superintendent will be on video throughout the meeting. Staff will only be on video when they're presenting or responding to board member questions. Um, if you have joined via the computer, you can raise your hand. There's an icon at the bottom of your screen. Um, and if you have joined by phone, you can raise your hand by pressing nine. Um, if you speak another language um, and you want to comment in that language, just say that um, before you start your um, public comment so that we can get one of the interpreters to come and do a simultaneous translation. Um, what you will do is just say one or two sentences at a time, wait for the translation, and then um, of course we'll give you time to make sure that you can get through your whole comment and, get inter and have interpretation. Um, make sure you're using a current version of Zoom. Uh, you can do that by Googling Zoom update. It's, we cannot um, trans, um, allow people to make public comments unless they have the most current version of Zoom. And if somebody says something inappropriate, I will do my best to address it quickly. I do not control the, the, the speakers. And so um, I'll just do my best and hopefully everybody will be cool about that. Um, reporting out of closed session today, on labor matters, item C1, um, we received a report and we had a discussion uh, we, and we did give direction. On legal matters, item C2, we received a report, we did, had a discussion, we gave direction. Um, on item C3, um, we approved the settlement. Uh, we approved the settlement. Um, the motion was by Vice President Davis. The second was by um, Director Yi, and that was a unanimous vote. On item C4, um, conference with real property negotiators, we received a report and had a discussion. And the same thing on C5, we received a report and had a discussion. Um, on item C6, we received a report, had a discussion and gave direction. Um, and then colleagues, because tonight's meeting is gonna go quite late, I, I just, I'm gonna move right now that we just extend the meeting until 12.30 AM so that we don't have to keep stopping throughout the meeting to do that. Is there a second to extend the meeting to 1230? Yes, there is. Okay, Mr. Rakestraw, can we take a roll call on the motion? I believe that Mr. Rakestraw uh, might be having technical issues. Um, Ms. Floyd, are you able to unmute and do a roll call? Yes, I can. On the roll call, on the roll call, Director Ng. Director Ng. Director Yee. I believe she's also having technical issues. Director Yee. Yes. Director Williams. Yes. Director Hutchinson. No. Director Thompson. Yes. <laughs> Vice President Davis. Yes. <laughs> President Gonzalez. Yes. The motion is adopted to extend the meeting until 12.30 a.m. February 11th. Thank you, Ms. Floyd. Um, we're gonna move on to item H, which is celebrations and recognitions. Is there anybody who would like to, oh, we will use this time actually to do our land acknowledgement, Director Williams, if you would like to lead us through that. Thank, thank you very much, President Gonzalez. So this is always, as we do our work to just be conscious and aware that 
um, land recognition and life and labor recognition is really important. Uh, we do the work that our ancestors have started. So we want to really honor them. Uh, this land on which we inhabit is specifically situated in the original ancestral home of the Olani people. We pay respect to the Alanis and all tribes of Alani and the indigenous people past, present, and future, and their continuous presence in a homeland and throughout their historical diaspora. And to both our indigenous and African forebearers, we commit to the continued struggle for liberation and reparations for it is though it's through this and through freedom that our justice that we give honor. So I just wanna thank you for just acknowledging all the hard work that many of our um, ancestors have done in the past, present, and will continue to do in the future. Thank you, President Gonzalez. Thanks, Director Williams. Now we'll take any board member uh, opportunities to celebrate and recognize your schools or good things happening in the district. Is there anyone who would like to offer a celebration or recognition? I think Mr. Yee is before me, but I'll go after him. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Well, I was just going to uh, congratulate uh, the the non Oakland nonprofit Arts for Oakland Kids, which just had its uh, first annual Artathon on Saturday, February sixth, to raise money for many of the projects and grants they've been able to support around art in uh, Oakland, including Attitudinal Healing, Kentari Chapter Five Ten. Junior Center, Living Jazz, Luna Dance, Oakland Public Conservatory, Prescott Circus, Real Story, Strings for Pride, The Crucible, The People's Conservatory, and the TOAD Quartet. They're really supporting arts in our schools and we thank them for what they have, that they help art enrich each kid's life. Thank you. Thank you, Director Thompson. Yes, um, I, I would like to recognize the Oakland Alliance of Black Educators um, fondly referred to as Obi. Um, it actually began with one of our illustrious superintendents, uh, Dr. Marcus Foster. He actually brought uh, Obi to uh, Oakland, California. I became a member of Obi almost 15 years ago. Um, I'm sorry, 25 years ago. 25 years ago, I became a member of Obi and I rose to leadership in Obi. Um, and has been, and I have been the uh, president of OB for the past 10 years. I've stepped down from president's uh, position in order to actually operate on the board, uh, Oakland Unified School District Board of Education. And I'm excited to say that uh, we have Dr. Sandy Stevenson uh, who has stepped in and she's now the new president. And I want to thank OB because OB works very closely with OUSD and has been, like I said, since the 70s. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director Thompson. Other celebrations and recognitions? Yes, President. Go ahead. Um, I want to lift up the work by Sheila White, our LCFF coordinator, uh, who did an amazing job verifying uh, the status of our families across the district. This has a huge impact on our district finances and our ability to better support uh, those families who qualify and our students with greatest need. And I'm going to shout out a few of the names. I, I asked her, like, how did you do this amazing thing? And, and I heard the names Carol Robodeau, Matilda Flores, Flynn Ng, Peter Bugno, and it's classified employees at every single school across the district that made this happen. So I'm going to shout out my district. I encourage the other board members to, to get in touch with theirs. <laughs> but at Sankofa, it's Leticia Perez, Erica Macklin, Bill Williams. At Chabot, it's Margaret Thorpe. At Emerson, it's Antoinette Holland, Sandra Burton. At Claremont, it's Marta Gonzalez and Shalina Harris. And all this hard work by our clerical staff is deeply appreciated, as there was a perception that our LCFF per percentage was dropping in OUSD, but Sheila and her team were able to keep that number steady, which will do so much to get our students the support they need um, in the coming years. So thank you so much to that team. Yeah, thank you, Ms. White. Go ahead, Director Hutchinson. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, I just want to acknowledge the, our first board meeting here during Black History Month, and hopefully we as a board will be working hard to honor Black History Month. Um, and then also I want to give a special shout out to Fremont High. 
um, which this year had a record number of uh, applicants listing Fremont High as their first option. And so it, it really bodes well, and I'm really excited uh, for District 5 and Fremont High with a stable administration, quality programs, and a brand new facility. Um, and now record numbers, hopefully, of incoming ninth graders next year. Uh, so it's exciting news, and hopefully we can start to uh, build off of that and spread that through District 5 and across all of our high schools. So big ups to, to the Tigers at Fremont High. Congratulations to Fremont High and Ms. Nidia Baez, who's worked really hard to get those families interested and so forth. Um, any other celebrations and recognitions? Go ahead, uh, Director Williams. All right, I can't just let Sam and Mike get in. Let me talk about my schools as well. Watch out, man. I uh, want to give a great shout out to Prescott. I love me some Prescott. Um, they are continuing to promote healthy um, eating with their partners, Mandela Grocery, um, a co-op and uh, Common Visions with organic produce uh, market and a healthy food pantry every Tuesday. Come on by and pick some food up for show. And sending uh, kids home with fresh collard greens and to cook with uh, the chef, chef in resident, uh, Sarah Keon. And uh, so we're doing some virtual cooking and shout out to WAMS and Ms. Umad for, um, for fundraising to help families find housing. Want to shout them out. West Oakland, that's what's up. Want to shout out Hoover, uh, Ms. Lizette, um, Albert, Albert, Ms. Lizette, I'll leave it like that, um, invited me to do a Black History um, Read Out Loud uh, with the elementary students in the coming weeks. So I'm really proud of uh, just building up those skills. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Williams. Um, and finally, I'll just say that um, I'm really excited. Some of you received an email today. Our former student director, Hemaket Saul, is going to be on the national stage. She's in a webinar with uh, another District 6 um, leader, Jamie Lolly from Frick uh, United. They're going to be on a webinar with John King, former superintendent. Um, uh, of Secretary of sorry, Education, and they're going to be talking about community schools, so something that we specialize in here in OUSD. Um, and then also, I got to meet with the Frick staff last week, and they have done over 500 home visits so far this year, so really trying to keep families, um, making sure they have everything they need, um, and keeping students engaged, so I'm really excited about that work. Um, I don't see any other hands up, so we, with that we will move on to item I, which is future engagement opportunities. Um, this is an opportunity for us to share with constituents anything that we have going on that they might uh, want to, you know, engage with us. Go ahead, Director Hutchinson. Just, just a quick reminder to everyone that the next budget and finance committee meeting with myself, Director Ng, and Direct Williams is tomorrow evening. So hopefully uh, we'll have good attendance and we'll really start diving into uh, the planning process for next year's budget. Thanks, Director Hutchinson. Other um, engagement opportunities? Go ahead, Director Yee. You are on mute, Director Yee. Sorry. The facilities committee is meeting this Friday at eight o'clock on Zoom, and uh, look forward to anybody interested in uh, in the uh, strategic review of our facilities department and its work. Thank you. Thanks, Director Yi. Uh, Vice President Davis. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have a, another forum on the 25th of this month. It's going to be on improving enrollment in o Oakland Unified. So just some examples of projects. Uh, one of them we're going to hear from tonight, uh, Oakland in the middle, uh, that are promoting our schools and getting more students in and other ideas like the pilot at Chabot and some of the other proposals that are out there. Uh, I, I don't have anything on my website yet, but I will send something out this weekend. Great. Thanks, Dr. Uh, Vice President Davis. Any other engagement opportunities? Go ahead, Director Williams. Uh, yes. Uh February 16th on a Tuesday, we're going to have our reopening conversation with District 3, um, our district presentation. So please come out, get some information on what our next steps are. I look forward to talking to you. Very excited to engage you. Um, so it should be on my website. Just hit me up. 
And also I've been talking with Oakland Undivided and we really are um, to Kita and um, Shaquille and uh, Audrey really are trying to uh, figure out how to uh, engage parents on our devices and just really continue to educate families. Um, so we'll be uh, knocking on your door real soon. So thank you very much. Great. Um, I will just add that um, our PSAC meeting is going to be meeting next on the 17th, and they're going to be focused on the budget uh, for next year. So that's an opportunity to weigh in. Um, also, office hours for me this month are going to be on the 26th at 4 p.m. That's on my website. You can RSVP there. Same thing with the, I'm doing an engagement meeting on the enrollment stabilization policy that I've proposed. Uh, that's going to be on the 18th at 5 p.m. That's on my website. Um, and then I'm going to be meeting with CCPA um, families and staff on the 23rd at 5 p.m. And that's going to be about Measure Y and the school site expansion plans. Um, and then I'll be at the Frick United Black, uh, Black History Month celebration on the 26th at 3.30. So those are opportunities to, to see me and chat with me. Um, any other engagement opportunities that folks would like to share? Okay. So not seeing any, we will take um, any modifications to the agenda for this evening. Yes, can I uh, pull uh, V19, which is 21-0140. Okay, are there any other um, modifications to the agenda for this evening? Okay, not seeing any others. Um, we will move on to, oh, before we move on, General Counsel, do we need to do an interpretation check? Yes, thank you, President Gonzalez. Uh, Ms. Walker Marquez, um, if you could do a check for Spanish needs for this item, and I'm going to uh, lower all hands. Uh, that way, only hands raised will be for requesting Spanish. Hola, buenas tardes. Esta reunión cuenta con interpretación al español, si ustedes así lo piden. Así que, por favor, si necesita interpretación al español, levante virtualmente la mano o escriba en el chat que necesita interpretación al español. Para acceder el, la interpretación, busque en la parte de abajo de su pantalla el símbolo o el icono de interpretación, que es como un globo terráqueo. Haga clic en el globo terráqueo y encontrará la opción de español, que está en inglés, de hecho dice Spanish. Haga clic ahí y usted tendrá que poder escuchar el español a un volumen más alto y el inglés a un volumen un poco más bajo. Y usted tiene la posibilidad, de hecho, de apagar ese volumen. Eh, si nadie levanta la mano en este momento o pide interpretación en el chat, entonces en este punto de la agenda no se dará el servicio. Si nadie pide interpretación al punto T de la agenda, entonces después de ese punto ya no se ofrecerá el servicio. Gracias. Thank you, Ms. Walker Marquez. Uh, no hands up, so no Spanish interpreting for uh, this item. Uh, Ms. Ho, can you check for Cantonese? Go away, Ola, and say, Kuyan, see Ho. 這裡歐倫聯合校區教育委員會會議,假如你需要廣東話翻譯,請你去營平的右下方,點擊一個地球形狀的符號,然後選擇中文,你就會聽到我們的廣東話翻譯。假如你需要廣東話翻譯,請你
I'm a Latina mother. I'm parented by racial kids in second and fifth grade. I'm here to share the deep anger I feel about the outrageous failure of OUSD to reopen schools. In Oakland, we're now at an average of 20 per 100,000 cases below the threshold of 25 set by California's Department of Public Health. New York City, the country's biggest school system, has safely reopened with community-wide infection rates almost three times our current level. Even though only 31% of students have returned, parents have the dignity of a choice. Remember, nobody is talking about denying families the right, right to remain remote. We're talking about denying families the right to return in person. Your own survey reported that 2,561 non-white families wanted their children to return. I share this as someone with children who are Latino South Asian. If OUSD allows OEA to move the goalposts by adding the unnecessary requirement of vaccination, and we're still pretending we can't reopen, OUSD will not only be morally bankrupt, but economically challenged for a generation. And you are dreaming if you think <coughs> it's going to increase with everything that you're doing and the way you're behaving. And I am one of many parents about to give up on you just as you've given up on our kids. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jim Mordecai. Jim Mordecai, speaking as an individual, uh, I feel like I'm trapped in a Gilbert and Sullivan opera uh, at this school board meeting. We have as our tyrant, uh, Shante Gonzalez, and then we have all the minions that follow like sheep over the cliff. An example of that, is the fact that uh, the Honorable Tyrant uh, passed a modification to the right that I had to address each item on the agenda. And she modified it so she would decide whether or not I got to speak. So I had, uh, th had four times a uh, click to uh, be recognized but they went on celebrations and they would not let me as a member of the public speak. So uh, I asked every member of this board, including the students to stand up for public speaking, full public speaking and leave this meeting right now. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dina Franson. Hi, I'm speaking today to express the pure frustration that many families and teachers are experiencing with the ongoing denial of expert guidance to open schools. California works with some of the greatest minds. Your OUSD staff collaborates with Lawrence Livermore Labs and UC Berkeley for guidance and has followed through. Let me dispel some myths. Alameda County hit the case rate to open TK to six on February 2nd. Oakland was right behind that on February 4th, despite the myth that Oakland is an outlier within the county, it is not. There is a myth that Oakland has some of the highest zip code rates in the country. Maybe true when the virus hit the West Coast first, it's just not true. <clears throat> Our hardest hit zip code is at 42 and falling every day, moderate per CDC. That is under New York City's average rate of 51. New York City, an average. New York City who has their elementary schools open and is returning middle school in two weeks. Teachers, kids, and families with underlying health issues will be able to continue with virtual learning. People will have a choice. Schools can actually help a community lower rates with proper protocols. There is zero reason to not be opening for the youngest children now. It's called the Matthew effect. It's time to show strong leadership and that we care about our kids. Thank you. Our next speaker is M Michael McDaniel, Jr. Thank you very much, esteemed members of the board, for your time this evening. I would like to speak on two things, first of which is the constant use of misinformation to the point where it feels like a true subvert agenda of undermining and derailing any efforts to improve our Oakland public schools by pitting traditional schools against non-traditional, or in other words, district against charter when the fact stands that both are public schools under OUSD. And if anyone has been asked to pay for their child to attend any school, I wanna make it clear, that is not a charter school. Public charter schools, just like the direct counterpart public district schools are free public rights. Charter schools came about due to the voice and needs of the community, not lobbying from entities that have no children that are affected by these problems, nor do they live in the community. 
No amount of trying to change the narrative to satisfy political agendas will ever change that. I was born and raised in Oakland. And as an individual that has been directly affected by the type of entrapment that an enrollment policy like the one currently being proposed by the board creates, I must plead with your better sensibilities to do the right thing and not set Oakland public school system back more than 30 years. Thank you again for your time this evening. Our next speaker is Karen Morphin. Hi, I'm talking as a Latina individual, Oakland resident of East Oakland. I wanted to publicly speak in regards to the proposal that will be read publicly next meeting, uh, presented by President Shanti Gonzalez for a stabilization policy. I want to make clear the uh, my frustration with this program. Uh, we're trying to mask a problem that OUSD has that significantly affects our brown and black students. We're trying to hide information from our residents to make a selection based on what it's individual needs of their families. By not putting information and by hiding information from our parents in OUSD, we're putting our, the most at-risk students and those who have not been properly served by OUSD uh, we're hiding their right to choice and information. I wanna emphasize that hiding information for, for underserved and underrepresented students has been historically presented as a systematic racism issue. Let's Thank not you, go that Lauren, way. That's your time. You. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker is Osada Olabala. Yes, thank you. I wanted to make reference to the last meeting on the consent agenda was an item. It had to do with the hiring of lawyers in San Francisco that would be dealing with international hiring of teachers. It appears that you are pursuing hiring teachers from out of the country. At the same time, it looks like we're gonna be losing our teachers who are already uh, working for us. I don't understand why we have to go out of the country to get teachers. I think some time needs to be spent on that. I also heard um, Ms. Hodge say at a meeting that 80 something, 80 something numbers of black men were being uh, released from their jobs at OUSD. Please, we have to have some explanation on why you are pursuing going international to find teachers when it appears that we're releasing teachers at the same time who already work in the district. Thank you, Ms. Olubala. That is your time. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Anthony Carlos. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, hello, my name is Anthony Carlos and I am a Latino and a senior at o uh, Oakland Charter High School. My parents told me that if anyone could make it into college in my family and start a career afterward, it would be me. As I grew from a child to a young adult, I was raised in many different environments from Antioch to San Francisco to where I live now in Oakland. Throughout those years, I transferred from public school to public school, although my parents noticed a lack of rigor. That switched when I attended Kidbridge Charter from fifth to eighth grade, where I had to adapt to the rigor and events onwards. Once I graduated, I got into OCHS, where I have been challenged since day one. I am beyond grateful for being a part of the school and so much so that I'm prepared to take on college knowing that I prepared myself for that moment since I stepped foot on campus. I do not think it would be anywhere anywhere as prepared if I had attended a public high school. In all, moving the charter school enrollment to another website limits families who strive so much for their children and make it so much more difficult to choose a school for their ch children's future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carlos. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Maria Flores. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon, um, President Gonzalez, Vice President Davis, and directors of the board. My name is Maria Flores. I'm here representing Families in Action. Nelson Mandela said, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. As a, 
As a board of education, you have the decisive power to vote for or against school quality and equitable academic outcomes, especially for black and brown students. On February 24, you will, you will have the opportunity to approve the expansion of Edis Academy so that they can avoid closure. Let's be clear, Edis is a high quality school that outperforms 12 of, 11 of 12 neighborhood schools in the Fruitvale traditional and charters. The Edis community has stepped, has stepped during the pandemic and doing mental health checks, wellness checks, and further personalizing supports so students and families may have hit um, COVID and economic distress um, can have the tools to succeed. In two weeks, your vote on EDIS material revision to increase enrollment it will, be, will set a precedent. The OUSD Board of Education will vote to close a high performing school. So let's do it right and keep it open. Thank you, Ms. Flores. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker is Darren Rivas. Okay, Good afternoon, Rivas. board directors. My name is Darin Rivas and I am a senior at Oakland Charter High School. When I first applied to high school, I was sent to the school nearest to me that I didn't even apply to, which was Fremont. Luckily, there were charter schools who gave me the options for schools that provided me with the opportunity to receive a quality education. Oakland Charter High School is a small, safe school community where staff support students academically and emotionally. Compared to other OUSD public schools, OCHS's small classrooms allow students to receive the one-on-one -on -one attention they need from their teachers and gives parents more opportunities to be heard and involved in their children's education. It is a college preparatory school that provides me with the resources necessary to thrive and go to college. Attending college is a very important goal of mine. Such an impact has been made from the school, not only for me, but also my family that now my sister applied. As I become a first generation college student in a low in income immigrant household, I thank OCHS for preparing me for success. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Javier Barraza. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Javier Barraza, and I'm a charter school alumni and uh, resident of East Oakland. Um, at first, uh, the, the main reason I'm here tonight is really just to, to talk to, to have, have a chance to talk to Mike and tell him something. Um, I first want to congratulate you, Mike, um, on, on winning the D5 uh, board seat. I know something that you've been working on for so many years, so I'm very happy that you know, you're in that position now. Um, the reason I'm here tonight is because you know, there's a group of parents and youth um, who really would love to have a chance to talk to you um, just about, you know, what you have planned for this um, for this year and your overall goals um, for your term. Uh, my question is, you know, how is the best way uh, to get in contact with you and hopefully, you know, set up this meeting sometime in the near future? You know, would it be easier through email, through text? Um, hopefully you can you can let me know through the chat, but um, I really appreciate your time and, you know, look forward to meeting you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barasa. Next comment, please. Our next speaker is Ms. Alvarado. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Mayra Alvarado. Could you all hear me? Um, and I'm talking to you just as a, a fifth grade teacher in Fruitvale and Manzanita Seed. And um, I just want to thank, I know that you're probably getting a lot of pressure from different sources to try to reopen and like open for all and just the experience that I've had losing family members losing some community members of our even our own school to COVID um, I want to focus on how to improve distance learning I know my students have learned so much through this time and I've grown so much as a teacher I'm grateful for recent opportunities for PDs that I've been able to attend and I hope that we could focus more on that right like distance learning for all of our students, but specifically our black and brown students. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Alvarado. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Sean Anderson. Hi, everybody. I'm Sean Anderson. Uh, I'm a parent of a third grader and an incoming kindergartner. OUSD, its executive leadership and its board of directors have failed to come up with an opening plan for students relying on arguments which have been rebutted practically by districts large and small, urban and rural, which have been safely reopened for months. 
in-person learning does not correlate to higher community infection rates. Stating something different is simply wrong. The city of San Francisco has sued its district for similar failures. Oakland should follow suit to right this wrong. OUSD is failing to fulfill multiple state and federal obligations, including federal child find obligations, as we see mental escalating mental health impacts of this poorly thought out distance learning program. Please open the schools for all parents and the community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Next speaker, please. All right. Just a our next speaker is Montserrat Mejia. Good afternoon, Board of Directors. My name is Montserrat. I am a senior at Oakland Charter High School. I am an undocumented student and my mother has always wanted what's best for me. She wanted me to have a choice, a choice to succeed. So for me, getting into trouble has never been an option. To her, going to a public school meant putting me in harm's way. In Oakland Charter High School, drugs, violence, and illegal actions are not part of our culture. I cannot imagine the type of person I would have become if I attended a district school. But what I can say is that my charter school, Oakland Charter High School, has never put me in harm's way. And because of my clean record and my opportunities to participate in my community, I will be receiving my DACA status in the next couple of weeks. OUSD committed a pledge to its community members and students to provide every student with access to quality quality school. Parents and students choose charter schools over charter schools for so many reasons. So to me, it's not rational as to why it would be beneficial in any way to take that choice away from parents and immigrant communities when choosing a school. Moving charter school option to another platform would take that choice away. Doing that would not only put minority children just who are already systematically behind further behind. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker is Ishmael Amandaris. Mr. Amandaris, are you there? needs to unmute himself. Okay, let's come back to him. Let's take our next speaker. Okay. Our next speaker is Stephanie Velasquez. Hi everyone and good evening. My name is Stephanie Velasquez and I'm a junior at Oakland Charter High School. Uh, today I'm here just to reiterate and emphasize some of the points that my peers have made. Um, and emphasize how poignant it is for us to get rid of all these misconceptions around public charter schools, which divide us as a community. Um, during my time at OCHS, I have gotten nothing but the best education and support I can receive in Oakland. And I really hope that as our board, as our board members and representatives, you take the time to get to know us as a community and support us and our education because we are community members and our voice matters as much as anybody else's. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Velasquez. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Paloma. Hello. Hi, actually my name is Juanita Villa and I'm a parent of a third grader and first grader at Montclair Elementary. And I just wanted to say that I really think that OUSD needs to open up the schools for our kids. Um, you know, luckily my children have, you know, myself to help them through the school day. But I think of all the other students in their classes that do not have a parent or another person or can't afford a pod instructor to help them you know, do their schoolwork throughout the day, print all the paperwork. It's a lot going on and the students are suffering. And I really think that OUSD needs to open the schools. I mean, teachers are now eligible to get the vaccine. What will happen once they get vaccinated? I mean, are we gonna think about a hybrid model? Anything like that. I'm okay with a hybrid model, but we really need to open the schools. It's just a disservice to our children. I really believe that. Thank you, Ms. Via. Next speaker. <laughs> Our next speaker is Kim Davis. Good evening. Um, uh, Kim Davis, parent. Um, I, you know, I, I found myself all day watching the um, impeachment hearings today, just sort of 
uh, totally absorbed in this um, tragedy that has hit our country that, um, you know, that, that, I don't know, it, it makes me feel very um, sad and very uh, frustrated that we have folks who are, um, you know, so insistent on getting their own way um, that, you know, that it, it processes aren't, aren't followed through. And there's just this demand that um, you listen to me, you do what I say. And I hear parents and I hear their frustration and I know everyone is frustrated. We all want our kids to be safely back in school. That is a, the ideal setting. And I also know and appreciate all of the work that has gone into providing for families, food and needs, trying to make the best of a pandemic situation. And I appreciate all of the care that you are taking to ensure that everyone feels comfortable that we're ready to go back to school. Every, that parents you, across Sandra. our districts. So I just want you to not be bullied by, by voices that continue. Thank you, Ms. Davis, that's your time. You. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker is David. Hi, good evening, David Castillo, OUSD parent. Um, I'd like to start off quickly just with that. Uh, you know, giving a shout out to all of the charter voices in the community. It's great to hear students, teachers, and, and parents speak up about um, about their wonderful charter schools and about the uh, seriously misdirected enrollment policy that's going to be up on the docket pretty soon. Um, but calling tonight as a parent, um, I'm currently teaching a pod of seven children that all attend OUSD schools, elementary, all family, all black and brown. And, and since the beginning of the year, I've seen learning loss in my own kid. I've seen learning loss in the children I work with. As one person, there's only so much I can do. Uh, distance learning is not working for kids. Um, kids aren't getting challenged. Uh, there's very little assessment. Um, and you just got to open the schools now for people that want to return. It's, um, we're, we're at that point. Uh, be transparent with the community around what's happening with OEA. Um, and just tell us what's going on because a lot of us are in the dark. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Castillo. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker is Emmanuel Lalande. Good evening, I'm Emmanuel Lalande, a sophomore at Oakland Charter High School. I've been in charter school since sixth grade. Ever since I started attending OCHS, I have excelled academically. I'm prepared for college and know what I'm capable of. OCHS prepares me for the future and never fails to educate me. Having charter schools that can help other students and parents is essential. And I hope you guys give parents the option to attend charter schools. Thank you, Ms. Lalonde. Anyone else, Ms. Floyd? We're gonna go back to Mr. Armendariz. Ishmael Armendariz. Sorry about that, I clicked the wrong button. I apologize. <laughs> um, hello everybody, um, I, my name is Ishmael Armendariz and I'm, I'm speaking right now as, as an individual uh, and particularly as a, as a Chicano and as a, a member of the Latino X community. Um, just one thing that I, I wasn't gonna say anything but this really caught my ear. We have to be really careful on how we address um, some of these issues, particularly coming out of the Latino community and the anti-blackness within our community. When we use words like I feel safe at my school when your school is only blocks away from another public school. What you're really saying is that there are less black students at that school. And I've heard that within this conversation and it's, un it's unfortunate. We, we, we in the Brown community have to be better about the words we use and the history of those words and what it really means to be public safety. So I hope we can do better on that conversation. And then the last thing I just wanna say really quickly, um, um, we uh, lost a, a member, a longtime OEA rep to COVID. She served 37 years in this district. Um, she was very controversial. I, I love her. She, me and her got along well. Um, her name was Linda Grayson, uh, 37 years special education. So I'm hoping that you would uh, end the meeting in her honor. Uh, she was a friend of mine. Ms. Floyd, are there additional speakers? Yes, there are two additional speakers. The next speaker is Shannon Woodworth. Good evening, can you hear me? Okay, um, I have two kids at OUSD, a first grader and a third grader. 
And I just want to um, reiterate the massive amount of learning loss in our little ones. Um, I really plead to the board to please get the little ones back to school. These early grades are so absolutely detrimental to creating a positive foundation for healthy education. Right now, my first grader hates school and I do not want her to have those feelings of school for the rest of her life. These, this is an important moment in her education career. Please bring back the little ones at least and get these kids in the classroom and then we can build from there. The Alameda County numbers are looking good. Please get the teachers vaccinated and, and, and expedite that process for them as best you can. And please get the little ones back to school. We're just pleading with you. We're desperate and we want you to hear our pleas. Thank you. Ms. Whitworth, next speaker. Our next speaker is Sharon Rose. Hello, thank you. I want to question the attendance data that is contained in the superintendent's report. So according to that report, 88% of students are attending school. And I can't believe it. I think that what's going on is that people are, that students are being counted as present if they're there for one hour, or if they show up for one class in the case of high school students. And that's not good enough. We're losing so many kids, especially high school kids who are dropping out of high school. The board needs to address this and measure the attendance in an accurate fashion. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rose. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Megan Bumpus. Good evening, Megan Bumpus, fifth grade teacher at Reach Academy, parent of almost two OUSD students next year. People who watch these meetings, who make the conscious effort to comment, to participate without being paid to do so should not be silenced. But this practice of limiting public comment at these board meetings to two opportunities throughout a mini item agenda does exactly that, it silences us. I waited more than an hour at the first board meeting on January 13th to comment on an agenda item, the student director's report. President Gonzalez allotted each speaker two minutes instead of one, and before my name was called, public comment was closed. These public meetings exist to give the OUSD community the space to access and weigh in on major district decisions. We have that right. So limiting our comments on all of the items on the agenda to a single minute or even two and sometimes zero is so contrary to that process. What you're doing, using power against community members is harmful as it removes you from the very people you serve and those of us who advocate for them. And that power the board is using against us is a form of violence. So stop silencing the community. Thank you, Ms. Bumpus. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Ben Tapscott. I checked in uh, the last school board meeting and I was really disappointed. I don't understand how you're gonna expect public to talk in one minute. Uh, I watched the board meeting. We have six high schools. Every time we have a bond issue, uh, they use McClymans as getting improvement. The bond issue is approved. Uh, no funds go to McClymans or very little. Six high schools, four of them have been remodeled McClymans is the oldest school and Skyline is the newest. It was very obvious to me last time I watched the board meeting, black, black lives do not matter. The new board members got hoodwinked into voting on something they had no prior knowledge of, if I understand the conversation, which is the superintendent's job. We are in worse shape now in our schools than we were 40 years ago. Title VI of the Civil Rights Act against the law to discriminate. They don't give those kids over there. 24% are black. Thank you, Mr. Taps. That, yeah, I figured you'd cut me off. That is your time. Next speaker, please. Our last speaker is Mark Airgood. 
Yes, uh, this is Mark Ergood, special education teacher and OEA rep at Edna Brewer, um, part of the Equal Opportunity Now, by any means necessary, Civil Rights Caucus in the Teachers Union. I'm speaking against opening schools or expanding uh, the hubs. This is not a time to be opening the schools. We have to put human life first, and we cannot be having the lies and pseudoscientific studies put forward as a reason to open schools. The illness, the loss, the trauma that's been suffered, especially in the Black and Latino communities, is not being forgotten. Right now, we owe the parents, the students, the teachers of this city and across the country for in, in, in um, big numbers, not returning to school, not putting the, the children at uh, danger. They are right. And this is not, there's nothing changed. We have, we're in the middle of a historic pandemic. If Thank things, you, Mr. Ergood. that is your time. With that, we will move on to item L, which is public comments on all agenda items. So this is a chance to comment. Oh, Ms. Uh, General Counsel told me we need to do interpretation check. Um, so please lower your hands um, so that we can do our interpretation check. And then we will take comments on agenda items. Buenas tardes. Esta reunión cuenta con interpretación simultánea al español si así lo piden. Entonces, para pedirle, para pedirlo, por favor, levanten la mano virtualmente. Marquen uh, donde dice raise your hand. Levanten la mano para saber si hay alguien que quiere interpretación. Si por alguna razón no pueden levantar la mano, entonces, por favor, escriban en el chat necesito interpretación, necesito traducción, necesito español, algo así para que sepamos. Si nadie levanta la mano o escribe en el chat, entonces en esta siguiente sección de la agenda no vamos a ofrecer la interpretación, al menos que se pida, y eh, vamos a volver a hacer, um, el ofrecerla al siguiente punto de la agenda. Eh, va a encontrar un icono que dice interpretación, es un globo terráqueo, haga clic en el icono y apriete donde diga Spanish, que significa español, y debería de poder escuchar la interpretación al español. Gracias. Okay, thank you, Ms. Uh, Walker Marquez. Um, so no hands for Spanish, and so there'll be no Spanish interpreting for this item. Uh, Ms. Ho. Here Thank you. Uh, no hands for Cantonese, and so there'll be no Spanish or Cantonese interpreting for this item. Uh, Madam President, go ahead. Thank you, General Counsel. So we will take um, public comments on all agenda items right now, item L. So now is the time to raise your hand if you would like to make a public comment on an item that's on the agenda tonight. We will also take public comments on special orders. We will take public comments on um, our new business and we will take public comments at the end of the meeting. So there'll be several more opportunities. Um, Ms. Floyd, can you call our first speaker? We'll do one minute. Okay, our first speaker is Holly. Hi, thank you. My name is Holly Wilson. I'm an OSD staff member. I'm calling to support the Black Reparations Resolution. The time is now to invest in training, coaching, and evaluations for teachers and admin to eliminate anti-racist and most notably anti-Black practices that perpetuate the school-to-prison pipeline. And I want to reiterate that this must be a community-driven process, especially because OUSD is sorely lacking in holding its own community members accountable. We must gather and develop a team of parents, students, community members to evaluate and monitor implementation of training and coaching. And we urge you to put students and families first and work to repair the harm caused to them by the system that is the district. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jessica Black. Good evening, community members and school board members. 
My name is Jessica Black and I am with the Black Organizing Project. We stand in solidarity with OEA and the Black Reparations Resolution. To some, reparations may sound radical. Reparations is about repairing the harms of racism. What we know is the disparities in suspensions, expulsions, arrests, and school pushout are egregious. These harms aim to break the spirit of young Black students while denying them access to a quality education. It gets coded in language like, let's figure out what the opportunity gap is, when in fact, it's anti-Black racist practices that have Black students over-criminalized and under resources Abiding by white supremacy is not revolutionary. It's not normal. Repairing the harm to our students is revolutionary. The time is now to do something revolutionary and support the Black Reparations Resolution. It is not enough to uplift and celebrate Black life one month out of the year. We need to put action behind our words and show that you support Black students and families all year by voting yes to the Black Reparations Resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Black. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Saletta Hunter. Good evening, board. As an OUSD educator and chair of African American Site Advisory Team, I'm here to support reparations for Black students. Frederick Douglass stated, "Education means emancipation." The more I read, and the more I'm led to, a, the more I'm led to abhor and detest my enslavers. I can regard them in no other light than a band of successful robbers who had left their homes and gone to Africa and stolen us from our homes and in a strange land reduced us to slavery. Once you learn to read, you will be forever free. Frederick Douglass. ELA literacy development and professional development is non-existent in our district. As an ELA teacher, I work at a school where over 90% of black students graduate with a level of illiteracy let remain underserved in our district. 30% uh, of teachers at our school do not have credentials, but teach core English classes and teachers who do not look like us and the same numbers are there to teach and then leave within two years. It is my belief that as long as these educational practices and institutional racism continue, OUSD is enslaving its communities. As a black teacher transitioning to administration, I'm forced to leave a district I love because the dominant culture controls black students' freedom through literacy and special education. And it's not challenged by someone who looks like them, but may have forgotten that access belongs to everyone. Thank I'm at Councilmont and I'm at East Open Night. Feel free to. Next our, speaker, our next speaker is Asada Olabala. Yes, let me address item uh, V1 first. The date of that contract started on September the 1st of 2020. Uh, same comment that we have to get contracts approved by the board before any services or resources are presented. Uh, V7 is in-person learning. V10 is also a contract that says in-person support. Uh, I don't think we are doing any in-person learning or support at this time. Uh, we have V7, V20, and V11 going to the East Bay Asian Youth Center. And I've seen many agendas where this particular group continues to get many contracts. I am saying that you have a tendency to give contracts to certain vendors over and over again. Uh, V12, you have a reading tutoring program over at uh, Laurel, that's good. I don't know how we're doing it at home. It says at home, I don't know how that works. V14 started on August the 10th and ended on August the 19th. And you're just pro approving it tonight. Uh, please, let's do something. And I do not like the idea of giving out data. V17, you're giving out personal data of students. You did Thank it last, you, last time to two vendors, Open Promise and another vendor. Students, you, personal data. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker is building and trade, building and construction trades. Yeah, hello, good evening. Uh, thank you, President Gonzalez, Superintendent uh, Trammell, uh, for, for letting me speak tonight. I'm going to speak on C4 through 6 uh, on the negotiations on possible uh, sale of land. Um, we look forward to working with the school district uh, and the board on uh, with this possible sell off of land to make sure that. Uh, that where the district has a proprietary interest to build on that land, um, that the building trades 
uh, is involved so we can build on that with good union jobs. We can use the PLA that we have um, on uh, with the school district. We just passed that certain type of PLA uh, in Alameda and we hope that you do the same thing here with Oakland Unified. Uh, I appreciate the time that the board has given me tonight and we look forward to working with you and especially our new board members. Congratulations, I haven't had a chance to come on this year, but thank you, uh, congratulations to uh, your new seats and we look, to look forward to you on many issues that, that come in the next, uh, the next year. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alvarez. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Savannah Shange. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Savannah Shange and I'm education faculty member and Oakland parent and member of the Black Organizing Project. I'm here to support the Black Rep Reparations Resolution, especially the establishment of the Black Students and Families Thriving Task Force. That task force will be guided by research-based, data-driven Black Thriving Indicators. And as part of that process, we can invest in a reparations fund for students and parents who've been harmed by police and school security on school campuses. That includes dedicating funds to support students pushed out through suspension, expulsion, involuntary transfers, and those who lost class time through in-school suspension. Parents and community members who've been profiled and harassed by police and security on campus are walking around our city every day with that harm and betrayal day in and day out. A reparations fund can support counseling, employment programs, housing support, food access, and other initiatives guided by the Black Thriving Indicators. We have the resources and the opportunity to repair these multi-generational harms. It's up to you to determine whether we have the will and the integrity to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Shanjay. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker is Kampala Ransifer. Hi, good evening, directors and Superintendent Johnson Tremell. Uh, my name is Kampala Taze Ransifer. I'm a teacher and parent in this district, and I'm here to ask the board to vote on and pass the reparations resolution during Black History Month. Look, we, we just can't hide from the fact that we're failing Black students. We've been sued by families dinged by the state. 69% of our students are reading below grade level. We have suspend, we suspend black students, especially those with IEPs at disproportionate rates. And we're closing schools uh, with large populations of black students. Um, this is what we're doing. This is our current reality, but it doesn't have to be the future. We need the kind of courage and leadership that it took to pass the George Floyd resolution. We need this district and the leaders here to take a stand and prioritize black students and pass the black reparations resolution during black history month. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Taze Ransifer. Our next speaker, please. Our next speaker is Kate Leahy. Hello, um, my name is Kate Leahy and I do not live in Oakland. I actually live in San Diego County, but I'm taking time out of my busy schedule. I'm a student, I work full time and I am a single mother of three children, but this measure is important enough to me, even though I don't know anyone in the school district. I just wanna show my support for the reparations resolution because it is so essential that these children are being given the education that they need and they deserve to thrive and flourish in life. So I just really wanted to take the time out for you to please consider, you know, consider passing this and saying yes to it because it really is gonna make such a difference and positively impact these children's lives. So please do that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Leahy. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker is Lisa Kanizara. Lisa Kanizara, you need to unmute yourself. Okay, let's come back Sorry. to um Hi, this is Lisa. Um, I just wanted to say I'm a resident of San Francisco and I support the um, Black Reparations Resolution because I think it's imperative that students have the support that they need in order to grow. And I think that it's important that faculty members are able to have the anti-racism education so that they can better support and understand the experience of those students. 
Furthermore, I think it's imperative that they're also taught accurate history instead of just kind of um, history that may be whitewashed throughout the years. It's important that I understand things like the Tulsa race massacre um, and be able to have an accurate understanding of these things rather than something that's just kind of been pared down over the years. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Canizaro. Next speaker, please. Our next, our next speaker is Kimberly Gaila. Good evening. Uh, 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 congratulations to the new Oakland board members. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a, a Bay Area native of San Francisco, California, and I heard about the black reparations for, for um, black students through color of change. And it's been a long time since the Oakland students suffered to, to a systematic racism. And I support that. And some, I, I assume some black families are suffering during this pandemic with the in-home schooling because some black families don't have um, proper Wi-Fi or internet. So thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you and have a nice evening. Thank you, you too, Ms. Gila. Uh, next speaker, please. Our next speaker is Jim Mordecai. Uh, Jim Mordecai, uh, speaking to this Gilbert and Sullivan author, uh, the Honorable Shante Gonzalez uh, is the leader of the band, and uh, that's understandable. But what is not understandable is all the school board members that you would think would stand up for the right for the public comment, and they are still at the meeting. Why didn't you walk out? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mordecai. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker is Janie Grantham. Um, good evening to the board and Supervisor Trammell. So this evening, my name is Janine Grantham and I am asking that the board passed the resolution, the reparations for black students resolution during this Black History Month. If black lives truly matter and if Black History Month means more than lip service, it's time to do something. We need a comprehensive plan to support black students that's actually results in black students achieving. There has never been a solution to match the scale of the problem. There's never been a comprehensive multi-year systemic plan and significant resources to protect black children from the anti-black racism cooked into our institutions and school district. So we ask that you please sign the resolution this month. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Grantham. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Ben Tapscott. In 1964, Wilson Riles, our state superintendent, said the greatest challenge facing educators today is teaching our children how to read. If Black Lives Matter and Latino Lives Matter, we need to do a better job of teaching our children in grades one, two, three, and four, pre and post tests, one class per class, not first and second graders in the same room. We can spend 5 million on 1000 Broadway. We should be able to educate our children by grade five. Our next speaker is Dr. Sharma. Dr. Sharma, you should unmute yourself. Ms. Floyd, let's go on to the next speaker and come back to that person. Okay, our next speaker is Ms. Alvarado. Good evening, everyone again. Mayra Alvarado here, fifth grade teacher with Oakland Unified School District. And I'm um, speaking in support of the reparations for black students resolution. Um, and I'm coming here also as a Latina, Chicana, 
trying to bridge the um, division between black and brown communities. Some people might ask, well, what is this resolution gonna do for Latinos? I, I put it the other way, right? Like if we support our black students who have been pushed out of this district, we support all of our students. Let's support our black students by passing this now. This should have been passed yesterday, right? But like, let's do it now. Let's do it during Black History Month. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Alvarado. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker is Carrie Anderson. Um, good evening. My name is Carrie Anderson. Um, I am a third grade teacher currently at Manzini Community School, a former OUSD parent and a resident of District 5. Um, I am also speaking tonight in support for the reparations for black students resolution. I strongly urge you to consider it, debate it, and fully support it during the month of February. In my 16 years of teaching in OUSD, I have watched countless black students be pushed out of our schools. I have watched countless black teachers be pushed out of our schools. And I have watched our schools not give our black students what they need to succeed. So please do what needs to be done during the month of February. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Pacolia Manigo. Good evening, Board of Education and good evening to you, Superintendent Johnson Tremell. My name is Pacolia Manigo. I'm the Executive Director of Bay Area Plan and I'm very proud tonight to hear the community support for you all to take some bold steps. It's not easy to state that black students are at the bottom of a district. More importantly, it's not easy to call for such a systematic and radical change that this resolution actually does call for. The time is now for you all to take a stand. The board uh, has for years named that there's something that's needed to be done. However, there have been very few actions taken. This is the time, this is the time for you to take that action. So we're asking you to debate it, to discuss it, and as well pass this resolution in the month of February for in honor of black history, but also in honor of the fact that we are in a pandemic and that black students and black families need to see priorities lifted uh, regarding them so Thank that you, they stay Ms. in our district. Thank, Thank you. you. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker is David. Hi, good evening, David Castillo, OUSD parent. Um, I wanna to speak tonight in, in general support of the direction of the reparations for black students within OUSD. Um, you know, I haven't read the full, full plan, but I think in general, I support the, the direction that it's heading. Um, the devil is always in the details. Um, I think many of the elements in the plan are not necessarily central to teaching and learning and school leadership. I think that's where we need to focus. I appreciated the earlier comments around literacy. Um, that's really where um, we'll be able to, to unlock the potential of all of our students. Reading in the early grades is the true gatekeeper. Um, it's shocking to hear that there's no clear literacy curriculum within OUSD that needs to change. Um, I'm also trying to figure out where the energy is, is being directed towards. Um, we have a, a school district with a, teacher's, a teacher core that's 50% white. So I'm glad OEA is on board, but the plan is gonna have to be very focused wholeheartedly on classroom instruction. That's where children spend the majority of their time in schools. Also speaking as a Latinx individual tonight, I feel like if this plan is executed well, uh, it will lift all boats in OUSD. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Castillo. That is your time. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Trish Valenson. Hi, my name is Trish Valenson. I'm an OUSD parent, a library technician at Rise and New Highland Academy in East Oakland, also an SEIU union member. First, I wanna express my support for reparations for black students. Also, this is not a time to fall to the pressure of a few privileged parents whom have been pushing for the rush reopening of our schools. I have family who live out of state and schools are reopened too quickly and there has been multiple disruptive disruptions to student learning since they had to switch back and forth between in-person and distance learning. Um, just because of the COVID transmissions, as well as quarantine times, lack of subs and bus drivers. Finally, 
we need to ensure the seamless transition of SEIU's SSOs into their new, more restorative positions without them having to reapply. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bellinson. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Kim Davis. Good evening, uh, Kim Davis, parent. Um, I would echo what Ms. Bellinson said um, about the SSOs. Uh, promises were made in the process of the passing the George Floyd resolution. Um, and I, I would hope that we would live up to those promises. Um, but I primarily wanna just say that I am in full and complete support of the uh, reparations for black students resolution. This is a visionary plan to, that you know, OUSD could be the leader in this area in the same way that they have been with the George Floyd resolution. This is the time for us to take an action like this and show where our values are, that we are actually going to put our, our energies and our money where our mouth is when we say that we believe that black children and black families and, and black lives matter. So I urge you to take the opportunity to do this. It is a well-crafted plan. It is community-based uh, after I understand a couple years. Please do it now. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker is Lila Jackson. Um, my name is Layla. Hi. Um, I'm a Black 16-year-old student in the OUSD. Um, I'm here to support Black students for reparations. Black students have been oppressed, not oppressed, sorry, or actually they have been oppressed, um, overlooked and neglected. Um, and you have the opportunity to make Black lives absolutely matter in the OUSD. Um, black students deserve reparations. Pass this resolution this month because we deserve quality education now. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Next speaker, please. Our next, our next speaker is Aya Mustafa. Hi, I'm Aya Mustafa. I'm a 16-year-old Black OUSD student, and I'm here to support Black students for reparations. Black students have been neglected and overlooked. You have an opportunity to make Black lives truly matter in OUSD. Black students deserve reparations. Pass this resolution this month. We deserve quality education now. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mustafa. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Francisco Resendez. Oh, I'm not gonna be able to um, bring Francisco aboard. Our next okay. speaker, Luna Fife. Hi, my name is Luna. I'm a youth organizer and a black OUSD student. I know from personal experience that our schools do not put nearly enough consideration and care into the education and well being of Black students. It's one thing to say that Black Lives Matter, but another to show that they do. There has been a systemic disinvestment in Black people, and that is evident in Oakland schools. We have been and are actively being silenced by your passivity and indifference, and today we are making our voices heard. If you care about Black lives, bodies, and people, you care about Black education. Pass legislation this Black History Month to prove that you do. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fife. Ms. Floyd, is that all of our speakers? That was our last speaker. OK. With that, we'll move on to our special order. Oh, I think um, Council yeah, Member Fife oh. may want to speak. Yes. Uh, Carol Fife. Yes, I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak here today. I see a lot of um, folks that I've known and organized with on this call for years. And um, my name is Carol Fife. And before I was an elected official, I was a teacher. I was a parent of a black student who had to go through a violent encounter at Roosevelt Middle School with a student who threatened her life and organized her her classmates today to be on this call advocating for what they need as black students in OUSD. So what I have to share pales in comparison to the black babies who are on this call trying to get you all tonight to work in their best interest. It is in the historic, the, the history 
of this country to throw away black children. And the education system is one of the ways that that starts and continues us on a path to, to just really bad outcomes, right? And this day, today, this month, this Black History Month, you have the opportunity to listen to organizers, students, teachers, elected officials that are urging you to pass this resolution. And because I know some of you personally, I know you're invested in the well-being of our children. And I expect you to show that. This is, this is minimal in comparison to what our children deserve, minimal. So do your job as elected officials and listen to the voices of these babies who are on this call demanding that you think about them and put their needs first. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fife. With that, we will move on um, to our special order of the day, which is a presentation on the Oakland and the Middle campaign. And Vice President Davis will be assuming uh, facilitation for a little bit here. Uh, let's do a translation. Thank you, General Kelly. Uh, Ms. Walker Marquez, Spanish, please. Mm -hmm. Buenas tardes a todos. Esta reunión cuenta con interpretación simultánea al español, si así nos lo piden. Entonces, por favor, si quieren escuchar la reunión en español, hay dos posibilidades. Una es que levanten la mano virtualmente o que escriban en el chat que uh, necesitan la interpretación al español. Es muy importante que lo hagan porque si no la piden, entonces en este punto de la agenda no se los ofreceremos. Pero si sí lo piden, para acceder a la interpretación, lo que tienen que hacer es ir al icono del mundo, del globo terráqueo, que dice interpreting, interpretación. Hagan clic ahí y luego marquen donde dice Spanish, que significa español. Y ahí podrán escuchar todo lo que se está diciendo en inglés, lo van a escuchar en español a un nivel normal y lo que se está diciendo en inglés a un nivel más bajo. También tienen la posibilidad, ahí van a ver, de apagar el, lo que se escucha en inglés si solamente quieren escuchar la versión en español. Entonces, por favor, escriban en el chat o levanten la mano virtualmente para saber qué necesitan. Si después del de punto T de la agenda nadie pide interpretación, entonces dejaremos de ofrecer el servicio. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Walker Marquez. Uh, don't see any hands, and so no Spanish interpreting for this item. Uh, Ms. Ho for Cantonese. 各位奥林士和乡亲们好,你们的奥林士和乡亲们好,教育委员会会议。假如你需要广东话翻译,请你用平的右下方,点击一个地球形状的符号,然后选择中文,你就会听到我们的广东话翻译。假如你需要广东话
G, are you there? Everyone, I'm here. <laughs> okay, great. Let's start. So, uh, hello, everyone. Um, good evening, directors, Superintendent Johnson Trammell, and especially the staff, students, and families of Oakland. Um, we're very happy to present tonight. My name is Cliff Hong. Um, I am a parent of two OUSD students. And I also, until this past summer, uh, was the principal at uh, Roosevelt, uh, and I just finished up my 10th year there. And now I'm in this new role as the middle school network superintendent, um, and very happy to, to be able to serve in this way. And I'll let uh, Jeff Wu introduce himself. Thanks, Cliff. Everyone, my name is Jeff Vu. Um, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about Oakland in the Middle and this campaign this evening. Cliff, are you handling slides? I am. I think we can go ahead and just jump to number four. Okay. And uh, so, um, perfect. Yep, so, okay, great. So just to start, uh, this is our ask of the board. We're really here to um, share our work around Oakland in the Middle. This is really about aggressive enrollment. So we're talking about declining enrollment in our district. And uh, for us, we wanna to respond to that. Um, we think we've got good schools. And we think that we have places where kids are gonna get a great education. They're gonna learn, they're gonna have a great experience. We need to do a better job out, getting out there and making sure that we are communicating this to, um, to all students and all families. So um, we wanna share the work that we've done. We feel very proud of the work that we've done in the middle schools to increase enrollment. And uh, for tonight, this is really just a discussion and not, uh, not up for a, for a vote. Go ahead, G. Great, thanks. So just briefly, we're gonna be talking about what is Oakland in the Middle, um, some of our learnings around enrollment in the last uh, year and a half. And then we're gonna share some successes, challenges, and kind of next steps in current focal areas. Go ahead, Cliff. So again, my name is Jeff Vu. I've worked in OUSD for the last 12 years as a teacher, dean, um, and then a principal, most recently at Roots International Academy. We're so excited to talk about Oakland in the Middle tonight. Um, this is a campaign that was born actually from my time in the district and upon leaving my site, really trying to rethink enrollment, marketing, um, and the stories we tell. I personally love middle schools and I really believe that our programs are robust, unique, and competitive. I had pitched this idea to our former network superintendent, Mark Triplett, under the belief that our enrollment really can't be assumed and that we have to work for it. We have to work for every student um, who's transitioning from elementary school. I believe that a lot of families still remain unaware of our offerings and opportunities. And I believe this is one of the reasons why we're not actively chosen. Um, and also why prior to 2018, we continue to witness um, decline in our numbers. So as you can see, our work is multifaceted, but ultimately it's about shedding a light on middle schools and helping families transition from elementary to both feel informed and excited about what's next. So we really have been in the last year and a half, we've been exploring and experimenting um, with as many outreach avenues as possible to stay connected with families um, and our middle school communities. And we, we have really been using all of the tools available to us, both free um, and ones that we are privileged enough to have at the district. We use free platforms like social media. Um, we've created an online hub and website for Oakland in the Middle that can distribute to all of our schools. Um, we've developed personalized mailers and touch points with families and kids. And um, like I said, we're using school resources or district resources like our school messenger system and school mint. So Cliff, Go ahead and talk about our goal and some of our initial strategies. Yeah, so let's get down to the brass tacks. We, our, our goal was to increase the enrollment of sixth grade students um, by at least 10% over the next five years. And this was starting in 2018. And so we're excited about the, the movement that we've, uh, we've made so far. And we, when Jeff and I talked, we really isolated, well, who's our audience? When we talk about prospective students, it's not just the students, it's really the students themselves, but also talking to the families and also talking to um, staff at elementary schools. Uh, so we looked at these three populations and said, how do we speak to them? How do we talk about our schools 
uh, in a way that that the, these three stakeholder groups can hear. And of course, these are, are not monolithic groups. And within each of these groups, there's different ways to speak as well. So uh, we came up with different ideas. And I'll just highlight a few. I'll, just, I, I'll highlight two uh, under each of these groups. For the students, we really wanted to convey that they're going to have a, a great experience. And I mean, middle school is so much about the social um, the socializing and the social, social experience, partly why the distance learning is so hard for the students now. And so we really communicated to them, you're going to have a great experience. It's going to be fun. There's sports, there's, um, there's music, there's, there's, there's friends. And uh, Jeff did a really good job um, communicating through these different social media platforms, creating websites, uh, and really communicating to students in, in their language. Um, for families, uh, I'd like to draw your attention to the last two bullet points um, under that section and uh, spotlighting staff, students, and, and the school culture through videos that, um, that he made and that we were able to, to post online and also working to make the process to apply, enroll, and register as easy as possible. What we were thinking about um, early on was uh, uh, in the process of trying to communicate to families is how what we want is to remove an obstacle course from from the moment a family says my child I want my child to go to an OUSD school it should not be an uh, 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 an obstacle course for them to get into the school it should just be as smooth and streamlined as possible and so so we thought about how to to, to think about cutting down steps um, for families to get get to us and then finally for schools. We uh, worked with elementary schools to be promoters of our, of our middle schools, talking with the fifth grade teachers, um, continuing to build relationships with them and, and with the uh, elementary principals so they know what programs we're offering. And, uh, and also, um, uh, not just to the prospective families, but um, to uh, the schools as well, sending letters, postcards. And you've seen an example of, of one of them here um, in the picture. Great. So given that, we're, we're really proud of the work we've done. Um, we're proud to report that since the 18-19 school year, we've seen grade six enrollment um, increasing already by 4%. And in a most recent update from our enrollment team, um, I can also share that we are the only network who's seen positive increases in application rates this year, something that we've been actively targeting through our postcard, um, system through our personalized phone calls and to working with our schools to connect with families sooner and elementary schools sooner. Um, go ahead, next one, Cliff. So one year after launch, we we're able to grow our sixth grade enrollment by almost 100 students. And we believe we've been able to achieve this for two primary reasons. Number one is developing and sustaining a brand for Oakland Middle Schools. Oakland in the middle is intended to be a unifying project. We want students to anticipate being represented or seeing their school represented. Teachers and staff forward and nominate all-star teachers to be featured on our YouTube channel and our all-star teacher um, campaign. And the idea is developing a sense of pride um, in this social sharing era leads to just simply more positive exposure and great advertising and oftentimes free advertising for our programs. The second piece is really around relationships. Oh. Not quite yet, Cliff, thanks. And we know that it's challenging to stay connected with our elementary schools. So this position has allowed, I think our network to bridge that communication with both elementary school principals, as well as those really important fifth grade teachers to just keep us in mind and continue inviting us into their classrooms to talk about our programs, so. And then, as we look to the future, we're really focusing on three kind of challenge areas. Number one is understanding family desires and better understanding family desires. We've started doing this by um, attempting to anticipate trends, looking at last year's data and previous year's data, everything from conducting interviews to really brainstorming what we think are in the minds of our families. Um, two is kind of, uh, strengthening the breadth in which we are providing information to families. That's why we're using our extensive social media platforms, uh, physical media, um, as well as trying out new things like this month's virtual tour week 
uh, which was an opportunity to highlight systematically um, across uh, the virtual space and Zoom, nine of our 11 uh, middle schools and communicating with families, a single space where they could log into um, and check out our awesome programs. And from this, as you can see, we were hearing feedback from our community, but also from uh, families in the other grade levels um, that they'd love to see this at both the K-6 and high school level. And then lastly is really working with school sites on processes, um, supporting our schools, training our staff um, and connecting all of us um, behind the scenes at, like Cliff said, making this process as streamlined as possible. So an example, go ahead, uh, next slide. For, for our first challenge, I think one thing we really need to do is we need to develop a system um, that will help us understand our families better. There are so many questions that would improve the efficiency in which we can communicate with families and allow us to have our work um, really rooted in data and what our families want. So how are they receiving information? What really are the characteristics they desire? Why did they choose certain schools? And if they didn't choose one of ours, um, why not? And next is just, again, strengthening the avenues of communicating with our families. We've already you know, tapped into and really made a dent in uh, saturating with all the free tools, but just thinking what's next and how can we utilize more of the free spaces that we have or consider investing some in you know, paid promotions. Go ahead, Cliff, and you'll finish this off. Um, yes, and then so our third challenge is uh, to continue to work with um, school sites and uh, uh, just all the different processes in uh, the district to strengthen um, the process from, again, from a prospective family choosing to come to one of our schools and actually um, starting at the school. So um, again, like we're, we're working with the school sites to, to, to beef up their systems to call families and support the online enrollment and registration process and also continuing to, uh, continue to work with our um, awesome enrollment office to support uh, school office personnel um, with confirming offers, other outreach and continuing to streamline. So again, I just wanna leave you all with uh, the idea of, of aggressive enrollment. We have a great um, set of schools and uh, really a lot of it is us being able to communicate what we believe about our schools to families the last thing I'll say is to me, this is, a, this is an equity issue, making sure that families hear uh, the different options and to make sure that every family knows um, what we have to offer. And for us to also hear from the families what they want from our schools. They are our clients and we work for them. And so uh, we wanna make sure that we're, we're doing right by their kids. Otherwise we shouldn't be surprised that they vote with their feet and, uh, and, and not come to our schools. So aggressive enrollment, we're excited to continue on with this work and, uh, and help um, wherever we can in other parts of the district. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Hong and Mr. Vu for that awesome presentation. And I wonder if my colleagues have any uh, comments they would like to make. Yeah, if, if I can, sir. Director Thompson. Yes, I, first of all, I just want to thank both of the, the, the young men for a wonderful presentation. Um, I thought it was very uh, robust and it showed real commitment to actually wanting to increase the enrollment at the middle school level. Uh, but speaking as a parent, as an educator, um, one who's actually been in the classroom, who's taught one, who's also been um, uh, a site administrator and also a county administrator over all secondary schools, I was just wondering and I know uh, your focus was on enrollment, but I'm just wondering where is the academic part of that, uh, of, of your selling that? Because I do think under the family portion, because um, I, I think uh, um, targeting families, families want to know that there is a robust academic program that would be provided for their child. The second thing is I love that articulation that you're talking about with the elementary schools. That's absolutely wonderful. And I think what happens if, if, if the target is placed under students, what happens is at the elementary school um, level, most of our, a lot of our children are really um, concerned about a strong academic program, even though sometimes they act as if they're not. They really are. Take it from me, I'm an elementary school teacher. So, um, and I know bridging that 
with elementary schools or what you're doing, I think would actually help. So having, maybe having something under the family portion that talks about a strong academic program and then maybe bridging with the elementary schools and then having the conversation about a strong academic program that could be continued from elementary school into middle school. But that was Thank a you. wonderful presentation. That was very good. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Um, yeah, one of the things I'd say about that is every school already has their, um, their I guess, pitch or their, their way of talking about their schools. And they always include the academic portion of, uh, of what makes their school strong. And for us, centrally, our thought was, let's do um, as, as good a job as we can communicating to the families and pointing them to the specific schools, hence like the tour week. And then there, the, the, we switch it over, hand it over to the schools and let them do their thing. And so, yes, definitely you're right. And um, it's something that the schools are doing. Thank you. Uh, yes, Dr. E. Thank you, and it's great seeing you uh, too in the presentation. Um, my question is, when you have the uh, virtual tours where people are able to pick and choose between the schools, it seems like you're, emphasi <clears throat> you're emphasizing school choice over, uh, <clears throat> over feeder patterns in neighborhoods. And uh, is that a conscious decision? Do you find that, that parents are been more agnostic about sending their kid to you know, their neighborhood, what used to be called their neighborhood or feeder middle school? And do the, uh, do the middle schools end up uh, competing against each other? Yes, so yeah, that's a good question. So that tour week definitely was intended to have uh, families see a broad range of schools. But one of the strategies that we um, also used was to ensure that every um, feeder elementary school, uh, those families, those fourth and fifth grade families heard from their feeder middle school through targeted mailings and communications. So um, uh, encouraging that feeder pattern. And um, so it's a mix of strategies. Okay, and then, uh, well, I, I think it's something that you probably would need to clarify for me for the longer period. But the second question I guess I, I have about this is uh, you increase your enrollment by 100 and your goal is to increase by about 250, you know, 10%. And I'm, I'm really curious whether you believe that um, the, the 100 kids came <clears throat> um, as opposed to um, leaving uh, the district and going to a charter school or some other, what do you believe that, where do you believe that surplus of kids came from? Yes, that's hard to say. And I think that's why one of our recommendations is that we do more of a, um, a, a better job um, using data and analyzing maybe through empathy interviews, families who did choose us. Um, I imagine that, I mean, I'd like to think that because of our outreach, people um, chose us instead of going, you know, uh, people are leaving the city or choosing charters or going to private schools or um, using fake addresses to go to surrounding districts. And so I imagine we got uh, students from, from any of those, um, uh, those places. But yes, this, that, calls, that is a call for us to do a better job understanding our families. If I could add, um, I also think that like, we know students are there. We know they're coming from our elementary school. So we're not pulling these students out of thin air. And having been in middle schools, recognizing that, a lot of the, the, the name of my school and the reputation of my school was on our shoulders as a community. And that, that space was wide open for marketing and communication building. If, if I wasn't reaching out to um, neighboring elementary schools, like there wasn't a structure or system there. So this was a really like low hanging fruit for us um, to recognize that students are there, families are there, and really it's about building a relationship there and keeping the exposure of our programs um, at the forefront. And so I think that, yeah, the belief is that our programs um, are things and opportunities that families want. And it's kind of our job to start filling in that space with the necessary exposure for, for kids and for families to know that we exist, we're doing these great things. Um, and so 
last year was really around like a tier one approach of just like, let's just get out there. Let's just let people know that we're right here. We're right next door and we have all these great programs. Um, and I think that made a, a, a really significant impact already. And so I think as we head into tier two, how do we get more nuanced? How do we get more responsive? Um, which is why we're so excited about continuing this work. Director Hutchinson, did you have a question? Yeah, thank you. I, I think just three quick questions are kind of tied together. And But first, uh, following up on Director Yi, it would be nice to see um, uh, some quantifiable numbers. So maybe like the retention rate uh, from fifth grade to sixth grade and, and a comparison. So yeah. we can get an idea of where we are getting these extra students from. Um, it was really good to see these numbers. <laughs> Let me just stress that. Um, and it was encouraging to see uh, an enrollment plan that actually is paying tangible results, which I don't recall seeing in the past. Um, I, I know it's hard to tell, but I'm just gonna ask the questions anyway, because we don't have enough years of, of data. Um, do you think that COVID still had an impact on um, middle school enrollment? And, and, and I know it's just an opinion, but could we have maybe even seen a larger increase if not for COVID or, you know, it, did COVID play a role in this at all, do you think? We're not gonna know, we're, we're gonna know from this, from this year um, okay. because all this data uh, was collected wow. before COVID hit last March. So um, we are definitely keeping our eye on that to see what this data tells us. Okay, and kind of a follow-up to that, um, it, you know, it really looks like you're almost halfway to the goal in one year. And so is there gonna be uh, any conversation about resetting the goals or reevaluating since this is going well? Um, and then kind of the follow-up to that is, is there any lessons yet that we can learn that we can then replicate district-wide? Um, because to see that enrollment is increasing here when we're having these enrollment hits other places, um, you know, if we can get towards figuring out that secret sauce, that would be great also. And so I know it's still early in it, but hopefully we're, we're starting to set up the data to get to those points too. Yes, and our PowerPoint was designed to embed um, our recommendations. And so hopefully that can be a place that people can look uh, for exactly what you're saying, Director. Thank you. Great, and, and then just the last thing, one of my mantras is on be every place. Please um, don't forget to include the school board members and other folks in the um, advertising, the recruiting and spreading the word um, because we should be the lead cheerleaders for our schools. Thank you. Thank you, Director Hutchinson. Other comments? Yes, Director Williams. Oh, sorry, Director Ramos, go ahead. We'll let Williams go. I, I defer to <laughs> Director Ramos, for sure. I defer. Oh my God, here we go. <laughs> Back and forth. Uh, no, Director Hutchinson took my question <laughs> with the COVID uh, pretty much. Um, well, first of all, I just wanna say my love to uh, my, no, well, he's not my principal, but I want to say he's my principal, uh, Vu. Um, he was an amazing, amazing leader at Roots and knows so many outcome students from Roots, and I wish I could have gone to Roots. Um, and he's just an amazing leader, so I'm, <laughs> I'm so happy to see him and representing and still, like, fighting for our North Oakland Middle School. So definitely just want a huge shout out there. Um, yeah, basically, it was what, it was same thing as uh, Director Hutchinson said about the COVID and how it's also impacting our strategies to get more Oakland students, especially our fifth graders, into uh, middle schools. Um, I'm also wondering, is there any way um, we're also getting testimonies also from fifth graders who are now like sixth graders and seventh graders from middle schools to see how they have, you know, experienced like how, what was the transition? What like just giving it out to our elementary school because I, I wish I could have seen sixth grade or seventh graders when I was in fifth grade um, and seen how they like, you know, what's middle school like? And especially during our COVID, like what, what, how is it looking, especially during distance learning and how are they, I don't know, just having that testimony and seeing how students are feeling. Um, and also, how are you guys also involving students as leaders or the student leaders who are, who are at, the, at these campuses, especially our middle schools um, during these uh, presentations for like our eighth, for sixth grade, fifth graders, fifth graders, sorry. Do you want to comment on that? Yes. Uh, thanks, Jess. I, I, I think your formal title is president. So I'm just going to go with thanks, President Jessica Ramos there for uh, those kind words. Uh, you know, our schools 
the, have really been on top of their recruitment strategies. And I think a key part of that is um, elevating student voice every opportunity they have. I think about some of our best recruitment strategy comes from middle schools doing just what you said, having students sit on those panels, those virtual tours that we hosted um, at the beginning of this month, every school included students um, and families speaking about their experiences transitioning. And I think one of the most beautiful parts of being in person was, you know, a school like Elmhurst bringing their students to elementary schools and creating a panel made completely of student voices where they could, you know, um, respond to all those fifth grade questions that, you know, are, are unique to the fifth grade mindset and not necessarily something that teachers are always thinking about. What's lunch like? Is there bullying? What do I do if, you know, um, I need this. Um, and, and I think the students are such tremendous ambassadors. So the best voices for our schools, really. So yeah, something we're working on and something that I, I wish we had more opportunities for, quite honestly. Keith, thanks, President. Go ahead. Yes, um, thank you. Um, Cliff and Boo, thank you very much for that, man. Um, I, man, I, I'm ready to shed some tears right now. <laughs> Um, because I think that we're in a place that as a district, we're starting to pivot. We're starting to get it. We have to fight for every single student to come to our schools. We cannot take it for granted anymore. We cannot just think automatically parents are going to enroll our schools because if our schools are not doing the right stuff, parents are not coming to our schools. If we're not advertising what we're doing, parents are not coming to our schools. So it's time for us as a district to really like fight for our students and show our parents that we really care about them. We care about the neighborhood. We care about the kids. So I just want to thank you for that. Um, showing that. I think when I first came on as director, maybe my first week, I'm firing out emails and Jeff, uh, Cliff was the first one I got in touch with. And I, my, that was my question to Cliff. What are we doing, right? What are we doing? Because we got to fight for every single kid. And Cliff was like, I got you, Mr. Williams. I got you, Director Williams. We're working on something. <laughs> so I appreciate that. You know, I'm reaching out to my schools and asking, how can we help? How can we build these relationships? So you know, the thing that educators say a lot about our public schools is that our schools are, uh, our system is archaic. It was you know, started 100 years ago, and we haven't changed how we actually operate. And this Oakland in the middle is actually a change for us in how we engage our students, our parents, our communities. And so I'm so proud to see that that we are starting to look, oh my gosh, all this technology is all around us. Why aren't we using it the way we should be using it to really you know, connect? All the young folks are using it. Why aren't we using it to really draw our families and students to the schools? So I really appreciate you, Cliff, and I appreciate you, uh, Mr. Vu, for really taking a step forward and really showing the rest of uh, the divisions in uh, OUSD that it is possible. And that's what um, I, I say this, you hear me say it a ton of time, Nelson, Nelson Mandela said, right? It always seems impossible until it's done and you are actually doing it because five years ago or three years ago, or even last year, it, folks would think it's not possible. So I really wanna thank your courageous actions and just getting involved and challenging each one of us to actually move this needle forward, move this ship in a direction that we really are pivoting to uh, incorporate the voices of parents and students. I can go on and on, so I'm gonna slow down and stop right there. Thank you. Thank you, Director Williams. And I'll sneak in a question before I turn in the reins over back to, to President Gonzalez. Uh, I just wanna appreciate all the work. Uh, I know when my son was at Claremont, it's when I first started noticing Oakland in the middle on social media, I was just really impressed at everything I saw. And I was, I was teaching after school at Oakland Seoul at the same time. So just loving to see all of that, um, all the love that you showed on social media. And I, I think my quick question is just, how do you handle equity between different schools? So we have some schools with a certain amount of privilege and other schools that are really, uh, you know, concentrations of high need students. And how do you showcase all of them and make sure that you're, you're directing families to all of them and not lifting up one school over another or, you know, making it fair and yet equitable? One of the things that that happened this year was that uh, 
as some of the families were drawn uh, to certain schools, in those presentations um, were invited uh, other schools so that uh, we were able to, um, and this wasn't our idea, it was actually an idea that had come from a parent, but we were in full support of it, is um, giving uh, families this opportunity to take a look at schools that they may not have otherwise considered. And so that's one way we uh, went about that. Um, and I think that for us, we have been spending uh, additional time with schools that have been um, under-enrolled and uh, maybe uh, need you know, additional strategies. And so it's really, you know, every school is different, every community is different. And so it's really about building that relationship and understanding what does your school offer and what does the community want and trying to create that connection. And so it definitely is uh, ongoing work. And we haven't, I can't say that we've unlocked the, um, the, uh, the, the uh, you know, the, the magic for, for every school yet, but, uh, but I think it is a matter of us spending more time in places where there's greater need. Thank you. All right, President Gonzalez, it's all yours. Thank you. A couple questions. Um, did you guys notice patterns in which middle schools enrollment grew um, and which ones did not? So I'm curious about that. Um, and then I'm also just curious because you know that I've proposed an enrollment stabilization policy that calls for actually us making permanent investments in this work. Um, what were the funding sources and what kind of budget did it take to mail postcards and to do, I mean, this is, <coughs> excuse me, the social media stuff is cheaper, right? But <coughs> so I'm curious like about budget for that, you know, sort of outreach to families. Um, and if you don't know off the top of your head, you can email it to us later. But um, as I, you know, move forward and the board starts to deliberate about this enrollment stabilization policy, it will be good to have some information on those things. Yeah, I'll just say real quick that uh, all this work, including uh, Mr. Vu's salary, is all grant funded. The thing that's nice about enrollment is if we do it right, it actually pays for itself. So, you know, it's great. So our existing grants are good until when? Um, our existing grants, these are ongoing grants. And so um, it all depends on when the funder feels like they're ready to stop funding us, but okay. so far it's been, you know, the last uh, three or four years. Good to know. Um, and it would be great if, you know, when you have a chance to get us some budget information. Um, yes. Then patterns, did you guys notice any patterns about which middle schools grew and which did not? President Gonzalez, just to give you some more clarity to um, Cliff's point is a lot of the funding has come from Salesforce. Um, and Salesforce in, in general, we had conversations around prioritizing middle school. So in addition to recruitment, a lot of the supports for Principals Innovation Fund from newcomers was all nested in middle school. Um, so we can get you the numbers in terms of they are planning to provide investments for next year, um, but they've already um, you know, signaled that probably in the next two years or so, they will be pulling back. Okay, thank you. Patterns? Yeah, I can speak to that um, really briefly. Just looking at data I have here, it's pretty um, well distributed, but I do see our programs primarily in the East and West um, improving the most. And those are schools that we focus more on, knowing that our community is at, um, Claremont and Brewer oftentimes have the most demand. We really wanted to give more attention and weight that to um, our schools in the East and West. And I see schools like Westlake jumping by 18%, Roosevelt, um, Elmhurst by 20%, and Montero by 6%. That's great. Just quickly add that uh, one impact of kind of COVID and also the political climate was that we saw a big decrease in the number of newcomers that came to Oakland. And so some of the schools that might, to Director Hutchinson's question earlier, some of the schools where we might have expected to see a larger impact from this work had lower numbers than we might have expected because of that decrease, which hopefully, um, 
hopefully that will reverse in the coming months. Yeah. Okay, colleagues, other questions or comments? Go ahead, Director Ng. Yeah, hopefully this will be quick because <clears throat> I know that we're still on special order of the day only. Um, I want to thank also um, uh, all of this great work. I have also, I've noticed on social media a difference in terms of Oakland um, in the middle of campaign. And also when I've been asking parents about um, if they've seen uh, increased visibility of um, uh, on social media, they automatically say Oakland in the middle. So I think the work around branding definitely has paid off. Um, I wanted to make sure that there are going to be opportunities beyond, obviously, the big boost now um, are already around uh, the February 5th of the first enrollment period. But um, what happens often is after the decisions get mailed out, if, uh, if, if parents or families aren't receiving their first, maybe their first pick and are, are trying to um, determine their decisions, there's usually a bunch of outreach in March, April time. So. Um, wanted to make sure that there's opportunities for um, schools, another opportunity for schools to highlight the work or connections to be made for families um, to either connect with other families that may be looking at um, a similar school and or to connect uh, formal ways that we're, we're making connections and opportunities because <clears throat> um, I noticed a pattern over, over years. Some, some years there was some informal um, things that happened. Like I know some uh, director London had helped to organize like a group of parents that had reached out to her at, at a, to tour Montera, to tour other schools altogether. Or, um, but I know that in the past it's been more informal. But just wanting to make sure that we're planning for um, opportunities for families to learn about. Maybe it wasn't their first choice, but there's also really great um, programming happening um, across the district. I think that's key because um, parents listen to other parents, and so we really want to make sure that we um, have parents be promoters of, of the schools that they're at. And so that was one of the strategies that we employed um, this year. So yes, that's, uh, that's, that's right, uh, getting the parents to talk to other parents. One last thing I'd say is really like our, um, the thing that made, I feel like made this really come alive for us, not just make it a joyful experience for, for G and myself, but actually make the schools that much more attractive are the teachers. Um, the Oakland teachers are incredible and like uh, time and time again, it's the teachers that the, the, the prospective families are, are raving about. And so um, we just want to make sure that we recognize that, that they are um, really on the front lines doing this work. And that's that all we have to do is highlight this amazing work that they're doing. And that should uh, in and of itself draw um, families to us. So we're continually trying to figure out how to do that um, better and better. Thank you. Colleagues, any other questions or comments? It, just, just real quickly, thank you, Director Ng, that, that triggered me there. Um, when, when we have, since we don't really have a real appeal process, I would like us to be um, more aggressive uh, in targeting the students that don't get their first choice. So we can be more proactive instead of just you know, they don't get their first choice and we wait and see what they want to do. So if, and I don't know if there's time to build that into the plan this year, but definitely going forward, just to be more proactive in our communication, especially when we are giving families bad news, like they don't get their first choice. Great. Thank you both um, for this great work. It's promising and it gives me uh, hope. Um, so I appreciate that. We're gonna take public comments now. Um, so we will, so please raise your hand um, using the raise hand button if you would like to make a comment and um, we'll do one minute. Um, Ms. Floyd, can you call our first speaker? Yes, our first speaker is Ben Tapscott. Yeah, I was uh, impressed with what I was hearing, but I didn't get as much information as I had hoped I would get. Uh, they did elaborate a little bit on the increase. If you look at charter schools for the last three years, many of their enrollment has declined. I don't know if that's part of what we're seeing here, but the big problem we have is the inequities in curriculum in high schools and middle schools. If you look at the fact that East Oakland has six high schools and only one and a half middle schools, while Oakland 
used to have two feeder schools and now they have a fourth. So we need to look at our feeder patterns throughout the district because many parents will leave if it's difficult. We saw that at Grass Valley when they moved uh, students from Marshall to Grass Valley and put 10 portables on the playground and parents said, we're not staying in open. So we need to look at our inequities in curriculum at Mac, Castlemont, and Fremont so that if they don't get their first choice, their second choice is as good as the first choice. We, had, we need to improve all of our schools. On-site registration. The district, for whatever reasons, manipulated where they send certain students and tell them other schools are full. That is your time. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker is Jim Mordecai. Hey, Jim Mordecai is speaking as an individual, uh, and actually uh, a white individual that uh, spent most of his time in, in an isolated suburb. And in Oakland, you're isolated too because the society is so damn segregated. So what, what you have is uh, flat lands and the uh, and the belief that uh, somehow the schools are where the money is, and if you have the money, then you got the brains. Well, uh, Trump proved that's not true. Um, anyhow, uh, the, the, the basic thing that uh, drivers there are sex, you, uh, you got, uh, uh, and cross uh, uh, racial sex. And uh, a, a, another frightening thing is, uh, am I going to be physically safe? And I think that uh, the second one is harder to deal with. Uh, and you've got to set up programs that really can uh, that communicate that you are safe and then make it a reality, not just a PR uh, stunt. You have difficult work. I think you're on the right track. Just keep it up. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Mordecai. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker is Dirk Tillerson. Thanks. Um, ultimately, the question is quality. Um, and I think there are some schools like Alliance Academy that's showing incredible growth for black kids in ELA and math, Fruitvale Elementary, Claremont and math, Roosevelt historically, Cliff was from there in math, Elmhurst has done good work, Lighthouse. Um, but ultimately, we need to show parents that we're serving the children that are coming there. Um, and some of the schools that families actually view as more attractive don't necessarily serve those kids. Um, and so I think part of this has to be a, a, a transparency piece around how are the schools doing with different students. Um, I, I would commend the enrollment office for making an easier process more recently. Um, historically, OUSD made it, you had to put all your documents in before you could even apply. Um, they actually got rid of that, so I, I applaud them. Any, any barrier to applying that you take down is a plus, and any plus in terms of information for the parents that actually want specific pieces of information is a plus too. Thank um, you. I just think that, that's where we that's should go. Time. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Ms. Alvarado. Hey, good evening. Um, so I'm a fifth grade teacher, as I've said before, and I really appreciate the presentation. I feel like I've learned a lot just about the process that my students go through. And I think that because this process of the middle school application is so new to me, I was kind of left in like a dark place of like not knowing how to support my families and families that reached out to me were mostly like immigrant families, low income families um, with like technical difficulties. And so I tried my best to help them. And I know our front office staff is doing like an amazing job of reaching out to those families. Um, but I think in a solutions oriented way, like I think it would be really helpful as a teacher to have information centrally coming about like, what does the process look like so that we can support our families in applying for middle school. I tried looking at the website and I couldn't really find anything. So I think I would like to get that part as feedback to make the process even better for our most vulnerable families. Thank you. Our next speaker is Asada Olabala. Yes, uh, let me say this. 
a serious agenda around reparations to black children. It's going to have to look at everything that comes up and how black children are impacted by this initiative we're speaking to right now. So we need data. We need data that demonstrates an equity around children created an opportunity for them to be involved in choice where choice was equitably spread. And for black children, where there's some type of incentives to make sure that black children, because of the great need, had a, even more of an opportunity to have some choices. Reparation for black children means everything that comes up on the agenda around children has to open up that door to say, for our black children, what does this mean? This is not gonna be an opportunity to just have a little show around black kids. We gotta produce at every level. And this is one of the levels. This is one of them. And so everything that comes up, I'm gonna be asking the question, what does that mean for black children? Thank you, Ms. Olivano, you that's your time. Next uh, okay. speaker, please. Our next speaker is Kim Davis. Hi, um, I want to agree with Ms. Olabala a little bit that, you know, the, the reparations resolution is all encompassing, which is, I think, part of the reason why people feel like it's so complicated. It's not complicated, it's simple, but it is all encompassing because every single thing that we do impacts kids. And if we're going to make a difference in black kids life, we have to, we have to treat it that way. I want to say really quickly, thank you to Mr. Hong and Mr. Vu. Both of you are rock stars. I I firmly believe in the power of positive, um, sharing positive information because I think a lot of the reason why parents go to schools that everybody else wants is fear of you know not quite knowing what, what else is available. So I appreciate that so much. I would echo somebody said before about on-site enrollment. Enrollment barriers are problems in so many different ways and if we you know, if we have community schools and we're serving the community, we need to have uh, in the opportunity to enroll on site because kids will, families will just walk down the street to the charter school and do that uh, if they need to. Davis. So please do that. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker is David. Hi, good evening, David Castillo, OUSD parent. Uh, first off, I'd like to appreciate the work uh, that has been done by the team here around enrollment and, and making sure that barriers to like applying to schools and getting information about schools, um, those barriers are removed and taken away just um, so parents have more information. Um, I live in District 7. I do not send my child to my OUSD zone school because it's uh, sub 5% proficiency on reading and math on the state assessments. Um, I attend a D4 school. And so that D4 school, if, if uh, parents like me did not send their kids to that school, that school wouldn't have enough students to survive. So you really have a very complicated situation in Oakland with how you either allow choice or, not, or you do not allow choice. Going back to Director Yee's earlier comments, a lot of us are moving around. I appreciate the qualitative nature of the stories and, and, and that's used in the marketing, but we gotta be more upfront with quantitative, quantitative data around reading and math, graduation rates, suspension data. Parents are getting more sophisticated. Students are getting more sophisticated around their understanding of data and what makes a good school. Thank there are you, limitations Mr. around marketing. Thank you. That is your time. Next speaker, please. Next speaker is Michelle Payne. Yes, hello. So I'll be brief. Oakland Unified has a lot of committed, brilliant educators, but until we get a overarching reparations plan for black students, nothing in this district will go right. And when we're talking about the word versus the concept, we have to recognize that nowhere in this world are institutions and companies afraid of reparations unless it is for black people. We understand that African people in this country that when slavery ended, reparations were given out to the slave owners for their lost property. So in Oakland, there's a lot of people that aren't paid by the district that are willing to do a lot of work to support. There's a lot of organizations that will come in. There's a lot of things happening that need to come together. And this reparations resolution is just what's needed to bring all of this together. 
under one umbrella so that we don't have piecemeal incremental change that will never work. Incremental <laughs> never Thank works. You, Mr. Payne. Next speaker, please. Next speaker is Sayuri Valenza. Hello, I'm Sayuri Sakamoto Valenza, and I am a middle school teacher. And I just want to say thank you so much to uh, Cliff and Vu because I know our school has been featured and it has really energized us, and it feels great to be recognized. And I would love for you to do um, collect data on teacher retention because you also celebrate the teachers, like you were saying, and so that it's been really great to see. Um, as a, my family is Japanese American and my family received uh, reparations for uh, being interned and incarcerated. Um, and so I strongly believe in the reparations for our black students, especially based on the data that the community advisory committee has shared around the crazy high um, horrible disproportionate numbers of African-American students with IEPs and low income who are suspended at, at much higher rates. So we, we must um, have reparations for our black students. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Valenza. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Jamie Lally. I just wanted to say thank you to Cliff and to Vu for supporting our school. You know, we opened a brand new school in the middle of COVID, which is a challenge to say the least. So them helping develop a marketing plan that really supported lifting up the best thing about Frick United did not go unnoticed. It was a heavy lift. And I just wanna say we appreciate it. And um, I think it was into one of the director's comments, like what is our plans to um, engage with families coming forward? Like once they have their, their confirmations, well, we have a confirmation orientation event on March the 15th for families to do just that. So we just wanna say thank you for your hard work. Thank you, Ms. Lolly. next speaker. Our next speaker is Lucas. Uh, good evening, y'all. Lucas Brecky Meisner with Oakland Kids First. Um, I'm uh, calling in support of reparations. I, I think, you know, we work with students from across the district of all different ethnicities that back this. Um, this is something that students are, have been talking about intersectionality for a lot of years and understand that this is a moment um, that all students need to need to stand with this. And I think it's really important in a district that professes to uh, hold RJ high and this notion of re restoration, right? The reparations is, is about repairing harm, right? It is acknowledging and repairing harm. And I think the way that Oakland is sort of known nationally or is, you know, has a reputation of being ahead of the curve and yet the actual on the ground reality is not that. I think this is a moment for us to really put, um, that to the test and really commit to something unprecedented and create a blueprint for what other districts and cities and every system in this country really needs to do. And I think, yes, it's, it's, it's overarching because the needs are overarching and we'll need to continue to flesh out some of the particulars, um, but that's a fight worth fighting. And if we don't set the vision, if we aren't ambitious, if we don't set out, you know, create that, Thank then you. we're, we're going to do status quo. That Thank is you. your time. Thank you. Ms. Floyd, are there any other speakers? I believe that was our last speaker. Okay, colleagues, is there any anything urgent that you would like to say, um, or any questions before we move on? We're a little, you know, we're running a little late, but this is important. So, is there anything else folks would like to say or ask? Okay, not seeing any other hands. We're going to move on to the student board member report. Thank you, Mr. Vu and Mr. Hong, for the great work, and we look forward to continuing to see it going forward. Oh, General Counsel, go ahead with the translation checking. Thank you, Madam President. Um, let's see, uh, Ms. Walker Marquez, if you could check for Spanish. Um, just, you know, see, so just ask them to raise hands and uh, if, if they need to, uh, they need translation. Of course. Buenas tardes. Esta reunión eh, tiene, ofrece interpretación simultánea al español. Así que, por favor, si necesitan el servicio de interpretación al español, levanten la mano o escriban en el chat, quiero interpretación al español. Si ustedes no levantan la mano o no lo piden en el chat, no lo vamos a ofrecer por este punto de la agenda. Y si 
para el punto T de la agenda. Nadie ha pedido interpretación. Vamos a dejar de ofrecer este servicio. Eh, por favor, busque el icono que es un mundo eh, donde dice interpretation, interpretación. Haga clic ahí, elija español, dice Spanish y ahí van a poder escuchar la interpretación. Pero nuevamente, esto va a suceder solamente si ustedes levantan virtualmente la mano o si lo piden por el chat. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Falcon Marquez. I don't see any hands, so there'll be no uh, Spanish interpreting for this item. Uh, Ms. Ho for Cantonese. Oh, I'm done, uh, General Counsel. Thank you, Ms. Ho. Uh, no hands for Cantonese, and so there will be no Cantonese interpreting this item either, uh, Madam President. Great. Well, I'll turn it over to our student board members for item N, which is a student board member report. Thank you, President Gonzalez. Good evening, board members, superintendent, students, families, and communities. And so beginning our presentation, um, is it okay if we have our presentation up? Give me one moment um, in terms of the presentation. I apologize. I, sorry, Director Powell. Thank you. No worries. Almost there. All right. Okay, I'm just show my screen. Okay, just let me know when to advance the slide, please. Thank you. Um, and so if we could go to the next slide. And so beginning our presentation, a quick summary of our report. We have listening to our families with resources from Family Central and dates for the reopening info and listening sessions. And then we have student voices highlighting the film Homeroom. And I believe in our student leadership and events section, Director Ramos will have updates on her own works. And so I will now be passing it off to you, Director Ramos. Thank you. Uh, sorry, guys. Sorry, everyone. I am uh, a little under the weather, but still sticking with you guys. Uh, listening to our families, we can go to the next slide. So again, we just want to uh, tell all our families that families, uh, the family resource on the page uh, with OUSC.org. It's the food distribution every Monday and Thursday from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. All children under 18 years old and younger are eligible to get food. For more information, you can go to OUSC.org slash nutrition or call 510-879-1700. Uh, of course, we also still have our technology, our survey, our tech check survey from Oakland Undivided. Um, there is a small, there's a big thing that's coming up to me and has been uh, brought from many students is the difference between the OUSD uh, loaner laptops and the tech checks, uh, sorry, the Oakland Undivided laptops. Uh, one of the differences you can check by knowing that you have an OUSD loaner laptop is if, if you can't go into different emails. So let's just say if you have uh, OUSD um, only one, you can only use one OUSD account on your OUSD loaner. That's one best, the best way to find out if you have an OUSD loaner. Um, if you qualify, you get to, for the Oakland Undivided, you get a free laptop for the rest of your life until uh, you go off to college and also a hotspot if you uh, need it. So please fill it out if you have not filled it out yet already. If not, you can also uh, contact the uh, techexchange.org. Next slide, please. There is appearing to, oh, there we go. Uh, so reopening, we are also listing our reopening dates, especially with our uh, next ones that are coming up, which is District 3, District 2, uh, listening sessions with Director Williams and uh, Director Ng. Uh, 
Um, we also invite all our families to start uh, listening for the reopening sessions and being able to connect with your uh, board directors. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. <laughs> Uh, the home room movie. We would a lot, love to tell you all about it, but you will be missing out and we're not watching the video, uh, the movie. I would love to thank our uh, our former student director, uh, Denelson Guerrero, who was able to share our, his story and about all of his Oakland student stories in this movie. Um, it is also named as one of the top five Sundance films, and I am so proud to be part of it, and director Sam as well, she is part of the movie, and showing how ACC's work was being um, during the COVID time and also during last year. And I'll pass it on to uh, Director Pao. Yes, and so again, a big shout out to our student directors of last school year, Denelson and Micah. They both inspire me so much, and so just thinking about Oakland has created so many young, amazing leaders that are ready to just take on this world. And we just wanna remind the community that for as long as we are here, our fight is not over. And for young leaders to not be scared to push yourself forward, that your voices do matter. And especially in these times, we need young people. We need more young people to have more control in their own education. Um, I wanted to quote Denelson in some powerful words that he had said in a post he made. He said, and I quote, it is on us black, brown, indigenous, most vulnerable communities to protect each other in unity and solidarity through organizing. There is power in the people to generate real change. Thank you. And so if we could go to the next slide. And I believe I'll be passing it back to Director Ramos. So we also got to meet with Oakland Undivided um, as ACC as a whole, uh, where Oakland Undivided shared the $12.5 million raised for phase one to purchase and distribute 25,000 laptops and 10,000 uh, hotspots. 97% of students in OUSC are now confirmed to be connected to online learning, which means that they have a laptop or, and or a hotspot with them at all times. Um, also, it's they have launched they have launched the Teach Equity and Access Action team to ensure all remaining OUSD students without verified access are getting in intensive outreach and intervention to improve the quality of their access. Uh, so there is a team um, being collected with Oakland Advisor to be able to uh, reach out to especially to our uh, Black and Brown folks um, who have not been connected yet, and also to our immigrant folks. So definitely is one of the things that uh, we would love to see as an updated thing and also getting our students involved and especially being able to have ACC uh, being able to share this uh, moment with Oakland and Divided. Next slide, please. Also, I um, am working with different board members, uh, with board member um, Ang, with the resolution from credit recovery, especially for our seniors who are dropping out during this pandemic. And we are totally understand that everybody's going through a lot and especially our seniors who are dropping out to work more hours to um, help their family, especially with their family responsibilities. Um, I have been be responding to different conversations with seniors all around Oakland, especially from uh, McClyman's and Skyline and Oakland Tech. Um, there's also a resolution that I'm working on with uh, Board Director Ang with mental health services for students, especially during these times and how, seeing how we can transition that to the reopening of schools. Um, also, this is another um, resolution I'm also working on with the Student Bill of Rights, which is introduced by Genup, which has been passed over 20 districts around uh, California. Next slide. I'll pass it on to uh, Director Pao. Thank you, Director Ramos. Um, and so again, um, reminders that we've been having an upcoming um, and focus areas. Uh, middle school students have established their 23rd annual middle school peer research and ethnic studies conference theme, which is the pandemic is real. So let's persevere and heal ourselves, our community, and our world. Um, and so for middle school students, um, save the date for the Ethnic Studies Conference, which is going to be held Tuesday, May 18th um, from 4 to 7 p.m. Um, our recent, we recently had a middle school meeting that was successful. And so upcoming meeting for our high school will be Thursday, February 25th from 4 to 6.30 p.m. Um, the RSVP link is up. Um, there has been um, governing board members reaching out to schools, and so that's also there. Also, to save the date for this year's High School Youth Action Summit, which is Saturday, 
April 21st, 24th from 1 to 4 p.m. Um, this is open to any high school students interested in running for a governing board position. And so to reach out to your student directors or to ACC, um, we think that it, it is really important for high school students to attend this third high school meeting um, in order to see how it is like um, to be in ACC, how it's like to be um, a delegate. And so we're opening it up to all students. Just, <clears throat> sorry, just adding on to some, uh, Director Powell's presentation, uh, we also advise for all our middle school, I mean, all our high school teachers who are watching to please, please uh, try to uh, convince your students to go to this high school meeting, which is we're also going to be talking about reopening schools and um, talking about the Oakland Youth Vote and the advancements with it. Also, we'll be hosting a small raffle to all our students. With that, we conclude our presentation. Thank you, student directors, colleagues, comments, questions? Go ahead, Director Hutchinson. Uh, thank you. Um, so thank you for the presentation that actually y'all covered a, a whole lot of stuff there. Um, however, I can support the Students' Bill of Rights. Um, please feel free to let me know, and I'm sure there's other board members that would really like to support that work and help facilitate it um, being impactful. Um, I, are the students or is the all city council going to be doing their own listening session or have one scheduled and um, whether they are or not, please also feel free to request that school board members are there to listen also, because I think it's, it's really important. We don't have enough opportunities where it's set up where we are specifically listening to students. Um, and, and I also want to give a plug in for homeroom. Uh, I bought a ticket to the Sundance Festival just to see it. Um, I think it was it was a really strong documentary and kind of what we're talking about right now was really featured in that documentary. And what I got of it out of it was um, there was a huge desire from Oakland students um, to really have their voices heard and to really um, have their leadership recognized and supported. So however I can help out with that going forward, and I just wanna keep encouraging our student directors, not just to do what you've been doing, but to really uh, jam up and press up whatever other adults are around um, because we should be serving you guys in this role a lot more than we are. So, so thank you and everyone go see Homeroom once it's available. Thanks, Director Hutchinson. Other comments or questions for the students? Go ahead, Director Yee. Uh, this is uh, just a, a short, but uh, Director Ramos, thanks you, thank you again for uh, the effort around uh, students at risk of uh, not completing um, their senior year. And um, one of the people that I'm hoping that you will, or one of the organizations, institutions that I hope you'll be able to connect with is the community colleges because I think that there's gonna be a need for some students who don't finish, uh, but don't wanna to go to a fifth year in high school. Um, and there should be some real um, outreach and opportunity uh, for those uh, uh, young adults then uh, to start, even though they don't have their high school diploma. And there are opportunities to do that. And I recall the lady college president when I was in a meeting with him saying that was uh, an interest that they had. So uh, is it possible, or maybe you've already uh, thought about that aspect? Uh, definitely, Director Yi. Uh, there was one of the things that I was talking with uh, Director Ng about also community colleges and getting them involved. Um, there's a lot of students who are completing a program through the community colleges, which, which basically you also get your high school credit and uh, community college credit. So the, the both concurrent enrollment, yeah. Right, concurrent enrollment. Um, so many students are actually, what they're doing is uh, either they like it's a whole new pathway which is basically they drop out of school like high school but they're also completing their credits still through community colleges but still they can get their diploma at the end of the year yeah, uh, that's but, a really imaginative way i hadn't even thought about that as an intervention but i, I hope you're able to lift that up and i'm gonna uh, put it in one of my uh, emails to just confirm that that's actually uh, something that the community college would support thank you any other comments or questions for our student directors? Go ahead, Director or Vice President Davis. Oh, no, uh, Director Williams, go ahead. Uh, sure, I, I can defer. Um, well, okay, cool. Um, Director Powell and Director Ramos, thank you very much. I always get excited to see young folks really, you know, just call to question what they see in the world and what solutions are. 
I'm really excited because uh, you're going to be leading the next generation uh, of young folks. And uh, it, it makes me tear up a second time. <laughs> it makes me tear up a second time to just um, really see your passion, to really like, you know, um, think about the young folks that are going through this pandemic. I mean, this pandemic has wreaked havoc on all of us. I could tell you myself, I have multiple Zoom meetings and it drives me crazy, right? I've had multiple breakdowns myself where I just could not take it anymore. And I had to just walk away from the Zoom meeting. Like I had four hour Zoom meetings, have multiple folks trying to do Zoom meetings at the same time. And it's just crazy. And so to see that uh, as a young person, you both of you are recognizing how impactful that is on our mental health is just a rock on. It's, it's, it's just a great feeling. And also to see, you know, like I said, the dropping out and just the tired of being on the video screen, to seeing our young folks, you know, come up with a solution with credit recovery. I, I'm just really excited. And I hope our district will come come around to you and say, how can we help, right? And that's really what it's all about. What, do, what can we do? You're calling this up. You see it. Your friends are experiencing it. Now us as a district need to step behind you or actually step on side to, to your side and say, let's do this together. Let's work it out. So thank you. Thank you for both of you. Thank you for just the amazing work you're doing. Appreciate it. Uh, Director Thompson, did I see your hand earlier? You are on mute, my yeah, friend. Yeah. I, I was just going to say that um, I thought the directors, the student directors did a wonderful job, very comprehensive. And um, it's given me a little um uh, to get some things done. So thank you guys very much. Great. Vice President Davis. Yeah, uh, real quick, I really appreciated the report. And uh, Director Ramos, I think you and I talked about the Student Bill of Rights. So let me know anything I can do to help move it along. Um, and I just, wow, that. That documentary was amazing. Um, I really encourage everyone to try and see it when you're able to. It was just so moving and it was great to see the student directors and uh, Denison Garibo and Micah and uh, Natalie and Benjamin, a whole bunch of folks um, from the ACC and it's just really moving to see that work and, and uh, that campaign in the middle of a pandemic. So thanks so much. Thanks, thanks. Vice President Davis. Can oh, real quick. Sorry, sorry, President. Uh, sorry, my mom. Um, basically, uh, the invite for the ACC meeting, as said, uh, Director Hutchinson, is also uh, basically, it's for all of you. Also, according to the Brown Act, there's only supposed to be three board members. So if you are welcome to attend our ACC meeting, it's open to all the board of members. Um, so it's three. <laughs> but uh, also, we'd love to have the superintendent as well. Um, yeah, so it's uh, it's invited to all. I mean, it's open to all of you if you are welcome to join. So, so Director Ramos, I would definitely like to be there, but I don't want there to be a conflict. So, should we? Uh, how would you like to do? Should I reach out to you and you will coordinate it to make sure there's not too many people there, or would you like me to just plan on showing up? And if too many of us are there, we can handle it. Then, how would you like to handle that? Definitely. I was, also, I was actually going to reach out for um, the board members to be able to meet with ACC leaders. Uh, so if you can respond to that, I'll, I'll send that up right after this meeting. But if you can respond to that and after that, uh, we also coordinate uh, if, if you would also like to, if there's ability with your time to attend the meeting, uh, attend to the ACC meeting. Ms. Talkington just said she can help coordinate so that we don't violate the Brown Act. Um, great. Colleagues, any other comments or questions for our student directors? Great, thank you guys for your work. Um, we'll move on to item O, the president's report. I just have one quick thing, which is that um, some of you have been contacted by some of our city leaders about teachers rooted in Oakland, a housing pilot um, to make a, to subsidize housing for Oakland teachers. Um, so I've signed on to this uh, as a funding request to the state. Um, I encourage other folks on the board to sign on if you haven't done so. Obviously, housing is one of the most common um, reasons cited by teachers for leaving the profession and for leaving OUSD. And so this would be an important source of funding for us and for um, LA Unified um, to subsidize housing for teachers. Um, with that, we will move on to item P, which is our superintendent report. Um, I believe you have a brief um, 
highlights and then the board can ask questions. Can we do a translation first, Madam President? Oh, sure, go ahead, General Counsel. We're gonna mix it up uh, a lot right now and go with Ms. Ho for Cantonese. Hawaii uh, I'm finished, General Counsel. Thank you, Ms. Ho. Uh, no hands for Cantonese. Uh, now, Ms. Walker Marquez for Spanish. Hola, buenas noches. Esta reunión cuenta con servicio de interpretación al español, si así nos lo piden. Si no lo piden, no lo vamos a ofrecer en este punto de la agenda, pero si lo piden con muchísimo gusto. Para pedirlo, por favor, levanten la mano virtualmente o si no pueden, en el chat escriban necesito interpretación y con gusto lo haremos. Si no lo piden, sin embargo, en este punto de la agenda no lo haremos. Y si para la, el punto T de la agenda nadie lo pide, se dejará de ofrecer el servicio. Para acceder a la interpretación, busquen el icono que dice interpretación. Es un símbolo de un mundo. Aprieten ahí, hagan clic y van a encontrar que dice Spanish. Hagan clic, significa español y ahí van a poder encontrar la interpretación si así lo piden. Entonces, por favor, en este momento escriban en el chat o levanten la mano virtualmente para que se dé el servicio. Si no, no se dará. Gracias. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, no hands for Spanish, and so there's no interpreting for this item. Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Navarro, and welcome, Superintendent. Uh, looking forward to hearing some highlights and, and hearing board member questions and comments. Thank you, Board President Gonzalez. Good evening again, everyone. Thank you for being here this evening. Um, I first, too, want to uh, publicly acknowledge that it is indeed Black History Month. Um, and so in these 28 days, one, obviously we want to highlight and recognize our ancestors, all of the leaders nationally, um, at the state level, the community level, and our future leaders and our students. Um, while at the same time, the hope is that we celebrate and do this 365 days. Uh, we're just taking these little 28 days, but uh, the spirit is to do this year round. Um, I want to give an appreciation to our Office of Equity for a lot of the work that they have done to launch the Black Lives Matter Week of Action with the theme, Keeping It Kwanzaa. The idea behind it is that for seven days aligned to the um, principles of Kwanzaa, um, that there will be um, a district-wide celebration in addition to things that are going on in school sites um, to highlight um, the work going on in the district. Um, on February 19th, I just want to highlight there is going to be a racial justice, equity, and healing summit. And the focus of that is to build the capacity of leaders inside the district um, to learn how to lead in ways that are anti racist and to create spaces, whether they be at the district level or school level, um, that are more welcoming. Um, so, looking forward to kicking off that discussion. And again, want to give deep gratitude to everyone in that Office of Equity. Um, their work was actually just highlighted today in Oakland side. Uh, some of the other things that are gonna be going on is Black uh, Jeopardy, students talking about their own experiences, being Black students in the district, Black Expo. So the details are in the report. I encourage you to check it out. Um, I also just wanna highlight, there are lots of different um, updates in terms of reopening. Um, there were many questions around what do the attendance percentages actually um, define or entail. Um, there is a detailed slide that talks about what attendance is. Um, obviously, in this age of virtual learning, we are being flexible in terms of what it means to participate, particularly for high school students. The attendance day actually ends at 6.30 um, so that whether a student attends a live session, a recorded session, looks at it later, turns in the work, there are many different ways that we are um, defining participating in class that day. So you will see um, that explanation within the report itself. There's also just regular updates just in terms of the work we're doing in terms of learning hubs, 
safety protocols, safety video that we have. Um, because of some of the feedback and questions from the last superintendent's report, there's information on um, our planning for summer school. We are planning to have summer school this summer, both in person and um, virtual. And so I will have our chief academic officer talk a little bit about that. And thank you, Frankie Navarro, for joining tonight. We are launching our uh, sports conditioning um, in high school. So there's a slide about that in the report. Um, and so with that, I will stop talking and we'll open it back up for the board to ask any questions and staff will be available to answer any questions that you have. Go ahead, Vice President Davis. Uh, yeah, um, Superintendent, thank you so much for that report, and I'm really glad to hear about the uh, summer plans, both in person and virtual, and I just wanted to encourage you and staff to ramp up those plans and offer the, um, I, I believe it said in the report, 6,000 students, and I would love to see it at a much higher level because I know there's been a lot of learning loss and that we're going to be getting some funding to address, you know, learning loss from both the federal government and hopefully the state if they can get their act together. And uh, I think we should be doing that because we have seen you know, what the pandemic has done. So I really hope that that can be part of the planning for, for this summer. Colleagues, other, go ahead, uh, Director Yi. Before um, uh, Board President Gonzalez, I just wanted to give um, our Chief Academic Officer, Dr. Aguilera, an opportunity to respond. Sure. Uh, great. Thank you um, for the question. Uh, we, you know, in addition to what we're planning for this year, last year we also opened it up to more seats uh, for summer school. And just a few things to um, consider. Uh, first is that uh, we go to um, our data to show uh, where we have learning loss that we can focus in on uh, the particular areas in which our students need more support. So traditionally for kinder through fifth, um, we focus on the literacy um, skills of our students um, in connection with parent engagement. And we have expanded our offerings through Springboard. Uh, we started with a smaller group of schools and have expanded that greatly. Uh, for middle school, um, we'll have both a math uh, focus uh, and a literacy focus and we partner with AIM High. Um, and for secondary, uh, we're looking at course grades uh, in order to um, make a more focused investment in what students need. So far, what we are seeing is that we'll invest more in Algebra 1 um, at the secondary level, and uh, we're creating a literacy bridge. Uh, so that way we can have more direct support uh, for students from 8th to ninth grade. A couple of things to um, also consider is that when we expand programming, we also need the staff. Um, and that was a little bit of a struggle last year in um, trying to have enough staff agree to do, um, well, then it was virtual. We are going to use the summer, um, our plan is to use it as like the test run for hybrid learning um, to expand um, that approach. And what we're noticing is that you also need increased investment because the class sizes need to be smaller than what we've done in the past. Uh, so we're working on the complete scope of work, um, also an expanded budget. And we'll be working with our fiscal department to ensure that um, we're preparing the right type of um, approach to the fiscal needs. Um, and Julie McCalmas is also here, I think, on our call. Um, so she is the mastermind behind all of the uh, design and is working closely with our network superintendents, our departments, and our principals um, to design the summer school intervention. So that's preliminary planning so far. Um, each time the superintendent um, reports out, we'll be able to give you an update. Um, one important piece is that in March, um, we have a plan to send out the request for parents' intent to um, sign up for our summer program. And we'll have more of a picture then about staffing. We're already going to start with pushing out um, the staffing request so our staff can say that they're interested. 
uh, but we will rely heavily on parents' interest uh, to attend our program. Um, of course, I mentioned we're going to go with a hybrid approach, but then if anything in terms of cases, um, you know, co conflicts with that, uh, we'll have to make adjustments. And last year we did a virtual program and we noticed that parents didn't want to opt in for more virtual learning. Um, so that was the, the rub there, even though we had expanded the seat. So we'll continue to provide, <coughs> excuse me, updates and, um, I don't know if Julie, if you'd like to add any uh, details that I might have uh, forgotten. I thought that was a perfect, great summary. I, I think it's going to be interesting. We're going to, you know, invite targeted families. So families where we see, um, we, we're looking at we're looking at families and, and student needs in three different ways. Of course, there's the academics. That's so important. But we're also looking at targeted populations. Um, uh, English English learners, uh, our foster youth, our, our unhoused youth, making sure that they get that first round of invitation to, to join summer. When they get the invitation, we're going to ask them, do you want to come in person? Do you want to stay distance learning? So that's going to be a, a great option for our families, but it will make a, for a tricky uh, hiring of staff and making sure that we can create a model that work that works both ways. Thank you, Dr. Aguilera and Ms. Um... Sorry, McCalmont, I believe is your last name. Um, colleagues, what other comments or questions do you all have for the superintendent? Uh, go ahead, Director Yi. Um, I'm just so uh, delighted to hear the uh, follow up on an expanded summer program. And I'm sure you're also including the, uh, and you mentioned a hybrid model of uh, uh, um, anticipating using the hybrid uh, strategies over the summer. Is there also an intention to uh, include our youth development uh, partners, you know, our after school providers and so forth. Because oh, oh yes, definitely. They're, they're our bread and butter. We can't do summer without them. So our, our lead agencies, we already had a, a, an RFP process back in December. They've already applied and they're raring to go. So we're, we, we have the ability to serve at least 2,600 kids can get the full complement of summer learning, which is that combination of academic intervention with the, with the enrichment from the lead agency. So that's been our most successful model. That's what would get your average middle school kid to actually wanna come for summer learning. If that, it's just more than just getting better in math and English, which we all want them to do, but having a, an organization like Safe Passages, eBAC, BACR there to really make sure it's fun, it's grounded in youth development, it, the kids get voice and choice around what the summer program will look like. That's what's gonna help us fill every seat. So we're already in process with that. And um, you know, we meet with them every month. We'll make sure our lead agencies are in alignment with our, our COVID mitigation protocols. And so they're, they're, they're ready to go. They have a lot of energy around summer. And of course, we all want to we all want to get in person as much as possible, but we're, you know, we're 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 scenario planning so we can go whatever direction and pivot whichever way we want to go. Great. Dr. Hutchinson. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm going to say the refrain I've said at every meeting, um, that this issue, uh, the COVID crisis, the reopening plan, needs to be agendized by the school board, and we need to be leading this conversation. Um, it's really troubling to hear that there's decisions, staff is telling us decisions that have been made for the summer, that requires a school board vote. And the school board, we are elected to represent the community and to make these decisions. And I don't understand why my fellow board directors have not joined me in saying we need to be involved and, and really driving this process. Um, again, uh, plans for summer school, it shouldn't be a board director asking what staff has planned. That requires a vote. I feel very uncomfortable to hear that this is going to be staffed not by credentialed classroom teachers, but by outside providers. It really feels like it's a, uh, an end run around the holdups to get agreements from our bargaining units. And this is backwards, y'all. We are a school board. We need to be leading on the issue. So again, I'm happy that we're gonna have a closed session hopefully next week to begin some conversations. But as my fellow school board directors, when are we going to pass a policy, make a decision, decide what our hybrid plan is going to be for 21-22? I heard the parents who were on this call earlier. There was frustration in the community because we haven't done our part in providing leadership. 
And so we need to be leading this. And again, I ask my fellow board directors, can we please take the lead for this issue? Because this is what we were elected to decide. I appreciate all the work from the staff. If they hadn't been doing it, there'd be nothing done. But this isn't all on staff to do. There has to be at least be a partnership with the school board. And we were elected to pass policy that then the superintendent and staff implement. Some of these policies should include what our reopening looks like and how we're going to be taking the lead in this process. So please, y'all, we, we need to do a better job. I appreciate staff keeping this together, but we just heard a presentation about summer and maybe next year's hybrid plan being in the works. And we as a school board have not had a conversation, let alone a vote. And, and this is going to be problematic going forward. So we really need to have community voice represented by the school board involved in these discussions at least. Um, if I may just, uh, Director Hutchinson, just clarify one piece that might have gotten confused with the way that I've, uh, you know, talked about the program. Um, we do hire a hundred, about like more than a hundred um, teachers. So we can't have a summer program without teachers. Um, what the um, lead agencies do, like more of our after school programs, they provide the enrichment. And um, so we're not, like we're not using that staff to go around hiring teachers. Teachers are, we have to have teachers, especially when we do credit recovery, because it's not um, legal for another um, agency to give students, as an example, high school credit for their courses. So teachers I, are employed. I, and, and as somebody who worked for after school providers for 20 years, I, I understand. But it makes me very uncomfortable that this is being told to me as a school board director and we as a school board didn't make this decision. You know, this requires a school board vote and we're talking about how we're going to deliver education going forward during a pandemic. And we're at a point now where our schools have been closed for 11 months and I feel like my fellow school board directors, the school board as a whole, has abdicated responsibility. Okay. And Dr. Hutchinson, there are people who haven't had a chance to speak yet. Our general um, rule is everybody so, gets to speak once before somebody speaks twice. So is there anyone else who would like to comment? So thank you. Question? Thank you for being the only one that gets cut off again. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to make comments or ask questions about the superintendent report? Go ahead, Director Williams. It's hard to follow that, I tell you. It's hard to follow that. Um, first, uh, Julie, thank you very much for your efforts. Um, and I say that because it's not an easy job that you are doing and trying to think about all the ramifications and trying to organize. So I do appreciate the effort that you're putting forth. Thank you very much. And Sandra, I want to apologize because I didn't know you were a doctor. So Dr. Sandra, <laughs> you know, I'll go ahead and call you out, Dr. Sandra. Uh, thank you very much as well. Um, there's a, there, you know, I'm glad that uh, Dr. Sandra um, has uh, made some clarifications to say that we're going to use um, our cert certificated educators in providing uh, those particular services. So thank you very much. That probably was my my concern, um, and Miss Julie. I again, I know it's a, a, a tough task, especially during this pandemic. Um, my other question would really be about our most um, vulnerable and marginalized kids. You know, I try to. We all think about our kids first, but I think sometimes we are, you know, as um, Student Director Ramos and and Ms. Director Powell had mentioned, you know, there's a lot of challenges that young folks are going through today, you know, with the credit recovery and just trying to uh, maintain throughout the system. My question is, uh, and, I, and maybe this is further just uh, conversation, but is this going to be like live teaching or is it going to be um, access curriculum that's already a uh, software um, you know, uh, software presentation, like, um, and two, uh, another one of my concerns is just continuing to, um, have opportunities to, um, professional development opportunities for our teachers to be able to, uh, engage our students at times when it becomes most difficult. Are we going to provide any supports, uh, 
uh, for our educators to be able to continue to support the students to get them through the summer because it's easy to uh, drop them or suspend them or you know make it difficult for our students to get to summer school sometimes. So I think that is always a challenge when I think about summer school because it's, it's a balance. We gotta somehow keep our students engaged um, and sometimes, you know, uh, our, our, edu our teachers, you know, have, you know, sometimes short uh, responses. And so I really want to know if we have opportunities to continue to support our educators and our students. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, quickly on the instructional design, of course, we're going to follow you know, we have to follow the health and, and labor mandates that we're you know, allowed to exist in, but live teaching, whether it's gonna be in-person or virtual, it's gonna be live teaching by a certificated teacher. And in terms of making sure things are engaging, one of the things that's great about summer is, is people elect to work summer, right? So you're only there if you actually wanna be there. So, we, so you, you sign up and that really uh, leads to, to teachers that really wanna try new things and do things in an interesting way. The, the class size is smaller during the summer. Uh, we do a lot of small groups with, with literacy intervention. And so things can get done uh, in a way, in a really focused small group way that's not as easy during the regular school year. Um, in terms of professional development, uh, it's, we, we do intensive professional development in May um, for our, our, our most successful small group literacy program, Springboard Collaborative that Sandra mentioned. Teachers go through 40 hours of professional development to get ready for the first day of summer school. And so they're reviewing their curriculum, they're conducting a home visit with every single family before the start of summer. And it's really, I've, you know, I've been doing summer learning for 10 years for the district, this is my 20th year with the district. And I've seen teachers just come out of summer learning refreshed and energized and like, I, I'm ready to go. I finally get small group instruction. I finally get how to do my phonics. So um, it's a powerful time to, for not only for students to keep learning going and, and, and to get ready for the next school year, but for teachers also to, to work on their craft. The, the other thing I'd like to add just to Julie is making sure that we're getting lessons learned from the pandemic. Um, we've had incredible creative partnership in many of our classified staff, um, partnering around um, educational and classroom um, support. And so absolutely, we want to um, have our teachers, they're critical, um, but a lot of what we're seeing in the pandemic is expanding You know, who falls in that educator piece. Um, and so doing pieces like Springboard, um, that has been the push, how we do a better job in terms of supporting parents in their role at home, but our paraprofessionals and some of our other um, classified staff, um, how we can, uh, and Julie, this is one of her sweet spots, is constantly thinking about how we innovate the model um, specifically to meet the needs of what we're hearing from our Black students, unhoused, foster youth and L's. So um, I know Julie is gonna be in contact with ACC. Um, so we can take the pieces that have worked, but we need to constantly evolve. And those are some of the things that we've seen in some pilots that have been working um, while we've been in the pandemic. So thank you for the question. Great. Um, is there anyone else who would like to ask the superintendent a question or her staff or her team? Okay. Well then, let's move on to item Q, which is comments from our collective bargaining units. I'm interpreting check. All right, we're gonna keep it, uh, keep you on, on your edge of your seat. Uh, Ms. Ho, why don't you do Cantonese first? I'm done, uh, General Counsel. Thank you, Ms. Ho. Uh, recognizing the names who raised their hand, I don't think they need Cantonese interpreting. Uh, so we will not do that for this item, and we'll move on to Ms. Walker Marquez for Spanish. 
Buenas noches. Esta junta cuenta con interpretación al español, interpretación simultánea, si así nos los piden. Así que, por favor, para pedirlo, levanten la mano virtualmente o escriban en el chat que quieren interpretación al español y con mucho gusto les daremos el servicio. Si no lo piden, no lo ofreceremos en este punto de la agenda. Para acceder al servicio de interpretación, primero pidan la interpretación y después vayan al icono, que es un mundo marquen ahí es interpretación y después elijan el idioma español que está en inglés, dice Spanish, pero marquen Spanish y van a poder escuchar todo lo que se dice en inglés y interpretado al español y van a tener la opción incluso de apagar el inglés que se escucha más bajito que el español si no quieren escuchar el sonido original. Entonces, por favor, si no levantan la mano o eh, escriben en el chat, no se va a dar en este punto de la agenda. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Walker Marquez. Uh, again, no new hands, so we will not do Spanish interpreting for this item. Back to you, Madam President. Great. I see um, our OEA um, president here, as well as our, um, I believe, our um, SEIU 10 to 1 um, chapter president here. Um, and Mr. Tapscott, if you are waiting to make public comments, we will do that after our labor partners. Ms. Floyd, can you call our labor partners? Yes, <clears throat> our first labor partner is Keith Brown from the Oakland Education Association. Good evening, Superintendent. Good evening, um, Board. Keith Brown um, from the Oakland Education Association. And it's been an honor to share this time with some strong Black labor leaders in the Oakland Unified School District, especially the last few board meetings. Um, we've had Melicia Lindsay, Melvin Phillips speak. Also shout out to Phyllis Copes and um, Deneva Reed. And we, we are public school workers, teachers, certificated educators, para professionals, food service workers, custodians, SSOs, clerical staff and support personnel. We as union workers are committed to doing this work and it's for one important reason, our, our students and it, all of our students, they deserve nothing less. They're the center of all that we do. And also as black labor leaders of OUSD unions, we stand on the shoulders this Black History Month for some great labor giants. Rest in power to Karen Lewis, president of the Chicago Teachers Union. Karen Lewis is a trailblazer in the movement for education justice for our students. Her leadership transformed the labor movement and pushed teacher unions to explicitly center their work around racial justice and involving the community and public schools. She fought tirelessly against school segregation, against school consolidations and closures and fought for more investments for black students. In Oakland and across the nation, we will continue this fight and win for our students. We also stand on the shoulders of giants such as C.L. Dellums, president of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, rest in power to Brother Dellums. In 1964, Dellums served on the California Fair Employment Practice Commission and he exposed the structural problems in OUSD as a result of hiring discrimination being one of the biggest obstacles in the district in serving black students. He proposed that OUSD employ a color consciousness in hiring to ensure that teachers from all racial and national groups would be selected for any position at any school. So 57 years later, black students in Oakland continue to need reparations. We see the, uh, how COVID has impacted our um, black community, the disparities in health, housing and education caused by anti-black racism. We must do our part to repair the harm that has, done, has been done to generations of Black students and Black families. So I urge 
that this board um, for Black History Month passes reparations for Black students in February to make a strong statement in Black History Month to build Black futures. Our students can't wait. Let's be bold and make history that will improve education outcomes for generations to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Our next, next speaker is Melvin Phillips from Service International, Service Employees International Union, I'm sorry. Good evening, Superintendent and board members. My name is Melvin Phillips. Um, this is the last thing I need to do. I, I'll be um, back in the uh, saddle again. Um, we have a new president. Her name is Phyllis Copes. So this is my last duty as, a, as the president stepping down. Um, but Truly, it's been a blessing to be able to be in this position as, as the SEIU president. Um, truly, there's a lot of issues that need to be rectified with the district. You know, I've been saying this for years. You know, our Black children are the ones that suffer the most. Um, just a quick story, you know, the reason why I, I got into the job that I'm doing now is about 2004, I was walking around the campus and this young lady of uh, a Caucasian was walking into the office, but she stopped me. She said, Officer Phillips. And I said, yes. She said, um, look at those students over there. They're cutting class. And I went to look and it was about five of our black students. And she said, you should do something about it. And I was getting ready to, but then she turned around and she made the comment. She said, that's all right. You don't have to do anything because when I get a job making $100,000, they will only make $20,000. So in other words, she was telling me, don't do anything because she didn't want any comfort. She didn't want any competition going after a job that pays a lot of money. So that made me very eager to make sure that our black children tried to get the resources that they need. I always was an advocate about bringing back um, a, a vocational training because a lot of our students nowadays, they use their hands a lot with these games. You know, they always on a game, playing a game all the time. Let's put something like a hammer in their hand. Let's put something like, like uh, tools in their hand, working on vehicles. The only way I learned how to, 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 to tear down a 351 Winsler is when I was had metal uh, uh, auto mechanics in high school. I can break an engine down and put it back together in three days because of the training that I got when I was in there. Another story with a black man who went to Skyline said, well, where are all the other, where are all the shops at? He said, because I learned how to do uh, uh, electricity. I'm, I'm an elect uh, electric man. So, you know, these things that a lot of our children need nowadays, we're not getting it. But if you look down there in Pleasant Inn, you look in San Ramon, they still have all the vocational training because they have the money. We need to bring resources back for our children so our children can learn a trade. Everybody is not college material, and we have to make sure that they get skills that are going to help them to achieve to become productive individuals in society. And the other thing is for the reopening of the schools. I'm, I'm, we're, stand, we're standing in solidarity with the teachers. We are not going back doing no purple tier. We're standing together with the teachers. When they're ready to go back, our members know we're ready to go back. We've been ready to go back, but safety is our biggest issue right now. So you continue to do what you need to do to make everything safe and please help our black striving students. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Phillips. 
I don't see any other union partners out there, uh, President Gonzalez. Thank you, Ms. Floyd. Um, with that, we will move on to our new legislative matters um, and we will start with public comment. We're gonna, we have a long way to go tonight. It's nine o'clock. So we're gonna consolidate um, the public comments on our new legislative matters. So we'll, um, if you would like to make a comment on either our- um, Sorry, uh, Madam President, before we go to that, if we could do a quick translation check. For sure. Okay, and if no Spanish or Cantonese requests are are, miss, um, are made for this one, then we will excuse our interpreters. Uh, so let's go back to tradition. Uh, Ms. Walker Marquez, if you could do Spanish, please. Buenas noches. Esta reunión está ofreciendo interpretación simultánea al español, si así no los piden. Así que si quieren interpretación simultánea para esta sección de la reunión, por favor, levanten la mano virtualmente o escriban en el chat. Quiero interpretación y con mucho gusto les daremos la interpretación. Sin embargo, no ofreceremos el servicio. Para hacerlo, levanten la mano virtualmente o escriben en el chat, pero encuentren en su, en su Zoom, en la parte de abajo en las configuraciones, un símbolo de un icono Eh, del globo terráqueo, donde dice interpreting, interpretación, marquen clic y ahí elijan español, que dice, de hecho dice Spanish, pero marquen Spanish y van a poder escuchar si nos lo piden la interpretación al español. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Walker Marquez. Uh, no hands for Spanish. And so Mr. Copenhagen, Ms. Walker Marquez, thank you very much for your time and have a good evening. Uh, Ms. Ho for Cantonese, please. Oh, I only say Cantonese, Ho. 這裡是歐倫聯合校區教育委員會會議,假如你需要廣東話翻譯,請你認定有下方,點擊一個地球形狀的符號,然後選擇中文,你就會聽到我們的廣東話翻譯。假如你需要廣東話翻譯,請你
you're not entitled as in your duties as a tyrant to uh, say that, uh, oh, we'll just, we'll, we'll, we'll just lock off this particular item and we won't let the public talk to that item. And, and uh, I'm getting no support from the school board members. Uh, hopefully the uh, student school board members will walk out at the next meeting and democracy will start to shine. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Here is Asad Olabala. Let me speak to the reparations for black students agenda item. You just heard with the presentation around summer school, the decision about what groups of children are the target group. And that would be the kids who are limited English speakers, the homeless and the foster children. Nobody said black children. And they are greatly impacted. But some kind of way, that wasn't a decision to mention them as a target group. They are a target group. Their literacy scores are way below level. Their, their scores in math are way below level. Their issues that they have to deal with in terms of in terms of trauma and emotional issues are way above what other people are dealing with. Why weren't they identified? Why do we need reparations for black students? I have seen in this body decisions around newcomers and there was never a need for a task force to be developed. We got a school for newcomers. I went online and looked at that school. It's fabulous. It covers everything in, in terms of job training, mental trauma, as well as the education. And they even changed the time that they go to school to accommodate them. There was no task force for that. We have all the issues that are going on with children in this district, and we deal with them without a task force. For Black children, we got to have a task force. This issue first came up in October by Black teachers. We are getting ready to move into middle of February and nothing has happened. We're going to be looking at a resolution. Resolution is not action. We need action on black children. And it, it is, and I, I'm going to bring it up. Every time you bring up an initiative around what you're doing for children, I'm going to be asking the question, why aren't black children identified as a target group? Why, and I need an answer. Why for summer school, we do not have black children. I heard the superintendent say it though, she didn't mention it, but the presentation didn't mention it. And so in the future, this will be an ongoing discussion until we get black children equitably in, uh, participating in their needs being addressed. It's not happening and it should have happened the next day in October when it came up. Thank you for the time. Our next speaker is Parent Voices. Um, good evening. I want to thank the school board um, and uh, thank the president um, for reading this item. I also want to thank um, board members Ben Cedric Williams and Mike Hutchinson for your leadership on this issue. Um, this is a deeply personal issue for me. My name is Clarissa Douthard, excuse me. <laughs> I'm under my um, organizational name, but I'm actually here as a parent speaking tonight who has a seventh grader, a middle school student at Bret Hart Middle School. And um, I'm speaking as a parent whose son was pushed out, a black parent who has a black child who was pushed out, um, who is, uh, expelled from preschool, pushed out of kindergarten in OUSD because he was seen to be um, not ready for kindergarten and unteachable by a, uh, seen as unteachable by a teacher and the principal agreed with that. Um, and I've seen firsthand and experienced the injustice and what happens to a child's self-esteem when they are not embraced, accepted and loved in our school district. When parents are not embraced, 
accepted and seen as leaders in our school district, specifically black parents. I am one of those parents. Um, I had to create a whole career around edu early education and access to literacy and programming in order to see my son have a future to survive. Um, we've seen a lot of impassioned testimony and I just wanna talk a little bit about, um, until my time runs out, uh, about my uh, history, which is my family's from Moss Point, Mississippi. My family's actually from the South and migrated here to California for better opportunities. My family literally came here to escape the Ku Klux Klan racist violence. I would not be sitting here and giving this testimony if my family stayed where they were. Um, and they migrated here to for specifically for educational opportunities for my family um, to be able to engage and have jobs in the public sector, um, good union jobs in our public sector. And my career and my life is grounded in the sacrifices that they made and the promises that this country ensured the descendants of slaves, right, for building an economy on their backs and not even able being able to provide an education that is the human that is a human right. And Thank this you, Mr. Is Arthur. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next speaker is Carol Delton. Um, thank you. Good evening. Uh, I do not see a clock, so I will do my best to speak within two minutes. Um, I would like to start with a budget. Um, I want to thank uh, Ms. Grant Dawson for the information that she posted. And along those lines, I'd like to add to uh, the information and questions that I sent to the board today. So one of my observations that's actually very upsetting is that when I look at the central office departments versus schools, I see that nearly 20% of general fund dollars are allocated to central office, which uh, way exceeds the target of the district at 12%, which would in itself be a large percentage. There are 33 departments listed, including a department that um, the board closed a couple of years ago, the Department of Post-Secondary uh, Readiness. There's not a lot of money in that budget, but there is a little bit. Um, I am uh, very upset with the pressure on the district to look at the quote unquote appropriate number of schools, but maybe not to look at the appropriate number of central office departments. And um, in particular, I heard that the Alameda County people told you that you should look at Inglewood about closing schools. I will send you an article that shows you that doing what Inglewood did is exactly what you don't want to do. Uh, thank you very much. I support the reparations for Black students and hope that you will vote that for this month. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Delta. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Bobby Lopez. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Uh, Bobby Lopez here, a parent of two children in OUSD um, at Columbia, soon to be Sankofa. Yay. Um, and I'm just here to support parent voices and the coalition in support of the resolution for reparations. I think it's really paramount to create a, a Black student and families task force. Um, you know, I, I've been at my school for the last, uh, my kids' school for the last four or five years. I think it's a phenomenal school. I think it has done great work with, uh, you know, my child who's mixed and also Latino students, but I definitely see that there's a lot more that can be done to support Black students at my school site. And I think that there needs to be more focus to figure out how we can create that equity and that support. I think this is a great step in that direction. I'll be brief because you have a lot of speakers, but I just wanted to share that I think this is a, a phenomenal resolution that we should be supporting. Thank you, Ms. Lopez. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Pacolia Manigo. Good evening again, Board of Education and um, Superintendent. I'm also here tonight speaking as a mother. Um, I'm a mother of LUSD. Uh, my daughter's greater and leader.
Ms. Manico, I don't know if you can hear me, but you're kind of cutting in and out. Um, Ms. Floyd, can we come back to her? Yes, and take sure. Next speaker? <clears throat> sure. Black Cliff Honk and Diane Lane that I've remained and watched. I have witnessed. Our next speaker is Rich Harrison. Hi, thank you. Rich Harrison, CEO of Lighthouse Community Public Schools. Uh, first, I just wanna thank uh, uh, the board members just for their boldness to bring such, such a resolution uh, to the table. And uh, I just wanna thank you and appreciate for that. Uh, appreciate you all for that. Uh, there are 16,000 students in, the char in charter schools across Oakland. And a significant percentage of those students are African-American. I'd like to ask the board to consider two things. One, uh, as you vote for this resolution, uh, honor the agency and power of choice for our black families to choose public schools, whether they're public district schools or public charter schools. And then two, uh, please continue to push both public district schools and public charter schools to push for excellence for our black students. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mr. Harrison. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Saleta Hunter. Hello again, Shanti. Thank you for increasing the time that we get to talk. So I get to talk about literacy again. I want to say thank you for this reparation. And I want to also say that I can see in the, in the reparation, um, resolution that we are talking about literacy and I know we've been talking about it because I see the data goes back to 2018 and 19 but again as was echoed I really want to know what we're going to do about this I think it's really important that we look at how we see African-American students as English learners um, if anybody can tell the story about forced migration that's caused us to bind together and create languages like Creole and Pigeon and be under slavery and be subjected to not being able to read, but to have to understand English and develop languages out of that, it is us. And we have been struggling in that same thing since they tried to bring Ebonics to Oakland and people shut it down. So looking at our black students as English language learners and develop that language based on that would be a better way of addressing this because we need to look at the source and find out why this happens and stop saying that our kids cannot learn. They come from a history of oppression in language. And so we have to foster and think about that when we think about how we're gonna create a plan in order to create literacy. Again, literacy is freedom. We do not have good literacy professional development at our district. I've been chasing people down for the last eight, nine months, and I cannot find anybody to answer me about why I cannot take my, my teachers to professional development around ELA. So how about we try to swing this to ELD or something in that vein? Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Hunter. Next speaker. Our next speaker is John. Hi, uh, my name is John Fast and I'm a resident of Oakland. Um, and I'm here to support the reparations for black students resolution. I'm white, I'm 50, I don't have kids <laughs> and I, I am not the target of this resolution, yet I'm here to speak for the, for the resolution to be passed. Education, wherever you end up, whether you end up in college or professional career or a working class career, it doesn't matter. Education is the Kickstarter for all of that. And I'm here to support the reparations for black students because I think education is incredibly important as a building block to getting, um, helping the black community. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Fast. Um, Ms. Manico, did you want to try again? I don't know if you were able to move to a place with better internet. Let's try again. I am looking for her name. She's up at the top. Oh, she's at the top now. Oh, I was at the bottom. Okay. Can you all hear me now? Okay, thank you all for your patience. The reception where I'm at is not very good. Um, 
you know, what I want to just lift up is, you know, I've worked with this district for many years. My daughter came into OUSD in the fifth grade. And even though I've sat on district budget advisory committee, even though I've been a partner with this district, we have experienced anti-Black racism. I have been on meetings with board members. <laughs> I have been in conversations um, with the Office of Equity and still had to rush to schools to advocate for my child, to defend my child, to ensure that she's able to graduate from, from your schools this year, to be able to go off and fulfill her dream. So this resolution is not just about doing right by black students and parents, it's about also repairing harm for those who have been your partners, your teachers, your educators. It's about making a bold statement at a time when people are losing hope in your capacity to make change for them in real time. Connecting it to your fiscal sustainability plan, you are already receiving dollars for black students and yet you don't track what you do for black students. We don't have a transparent way of understanding if the investments being made are reasonable, are impactful, or need to be reevaluated. And that is your job as a board. It is your job to say, is LCFF funding doing right for black students? It is your job to evaluate if Title I is doing right for black students. It's also your job to say, hey, we just created this fiscal uh, sponsorship agreement with Oakland Ed Fund. We want to make sure we prioritize fundraising for Black students. They are your second largest population in your district. You have a fiscal and a legal responsibility to prioritize them. And this is the resolution we are putting before you to take the stand and to work on the language that is necessary to prioritize them. We look forward to you passing this in February for working these kinks out, working with Van Cedric, Director uh, Williams, and working with Director Hutchinson. But you cannot delay this because you know the gravity of the problem that has been exposed by COVID and the necessary steps that we must take to systematically change the way we approach educating Black students. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Manigo. So with that, colleagues. Um, Can I just? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to, I appreciate all the comments from the public, but I just wanted to say, you know, there was one um, person who is calling you a name and I feel like, you know, I just would ask the members of the public, we can agree to disagree about, you know, the provisions of the Brown Act or the rules of our meetings, but please not to, to use name calling and, and to, to address the members of the board. Thank you. Thanks, Vice President Davis. Um, so we've done public comment, and so now we'll take up item. Uh, President Go Gonzalez, uh, another hand went up. Do ah, you okay. consider it? Yep. Go ahead. Then tap Scott. You know, I'm so sick and tired of charter schools saying they're public when they're not. But anyway, I want to go to uh, the water test that was conducted by the district August 2020 on McClyman's High School. Eight years later, we still have lead at McClyman's. My question is, when are we going to repipe Mac? When are we going to remodel Mac? Why do we need 69 district people downtown in the district office? Why are we still at 1000 Broadway? I don't know whether we've solved Acorn's problem that had chemicals out there in East Oakland. The fact that we are not addressing feeder patterns in East and West Oakland is disgraceful. They're talking about Black Lives Matters while well, Black Education Matters, and we need to make reading a top priority. A Black parent left Oakland and went to Elks Grove and called me back. She said, Coach, the best, made, best deal I did was go to Elks Grove and get out of Oakland. They provide two hours of testing and tutoring at my home to bring my Black child up to grade level. They do an hour on reading and they do an hour on math in the home. This was before the virus. We need to put our money on the front end of our kids. 44% of inmates are African-Americans, 34% are Latinos. So we are not serving the Latinos or the Blacks in Oakland, except when it comes to passing bond issues. The fact that we do not do the reading pre and post every year. Single class 
regardless of the numbers in the early ages. Some of our schools have first and second graders in the same room. I bet you those are black schools. So we need to clean it up. We need to get the problem of the reading solved or we will continue the pipeline to prisons. Thank you, Mr. Tapscott. That's your time. Um, so we are going to start into our new business matters. Um, and we're going to start with item 210194, reparations for black students. This is a first read and uh, Director Williams, I will turn it over to you or you can tell me who is going to introduce the matter. So I will as well as uh, Director Mike Hutchinson. Um, so we've both um, you know, co-authored co -authored this, so we will work together on that. Um, I'll just do a quick intro and then he will, you know, pick up from there. Um, so really, I, I can't, like I've been thinking, what am I going to say to the board? What am I going to say to the board to convince you that this matters? And I, I came to the conclusion that I really don't need to say anything because I'm listening to all these public comments. The public comments are saying every single thing you need to hear from all kinds of perspectives, all kinds of racial groups, all genders, every single thing we've heard it from the beginning of this meeting up to now. So what more can I add? Like, because this really is a call for us to really look at ourselves and say, do we stand by what we mean by equity and and social equity, social justice, racial social justice. Can we walk around and really say we advocate for that when we have this particular resolution before us and we feel a little jittery about, I don't know if I'm gonna vote on it or not. Like we really have to just stop that and take a look at it. So what I thought is, I said, what is OUSD's values? So let's take a look at the values here. And so I say our value, I am OUSD. When I see it says students first, we support students by providing multiple learning opportunities to ensure students to feel respected and heard. If I put black in front of that, our black students do not feel respected. They do not feel heard and they're not multiple learning opportunities for them. If I look at the second one, it says equity, we provide everyone access to what they need to be successful. And if I put black in front of that, I would say our equity formula is not helping us out because it's doing the opposite. And our students are not successful and our literacy rates, our math rates, our graduation rates, and our success to career and college rates. So I'm not sure. If I look at the third one that says, um, excellence, we hold ourselves to uncompromising standards to achieve extraordinary outcomes. And I put black in front of that, black excellence. I just don't see it there, right? The outcomes are not there for the black students. This is our value system. If I look at integrity, we are honest, trustworthy, and accountable. Nobody's been accountable for the poor performance. No one's been accountable. And we stand behind the institution of OUSD and not actually the personal investedness of the individual. So next one is cultural responsiveness. Responsiveness, we, we resist assumptions and biases that, that we see the gift of every student and adult. We know there is anti-blackness in the district. So if I put black cultural responsiveness, we're not doing a good job at that either. And the last one is joy. We, we seek and celebrate moments of laughter and wonder. Our kids are, our kids are being pushed into prison to, to school to prison pipeline. Our kids are being pushed out. They're being suspended. They're being, you know, used as uh, experiments. They're not getting that ed education. So black joy is not there at all. Now, I say that because if we look at the 
the, all of OUSD, these values may work. But if we add black students to this, these values are not there. And so now we're at a time that we have to really look at ourselves. And, and Shirley Chisholm says, don't make progress by standing on the sidelines or whimpering and complaining. You make progress by implementing ideas. This resolution is an idea and the time has come for us to respond. This is our time. This is our moment. The moment happened in 1964 for the civil rights agreement to stop discrimination. That get put us on it. That was our parents' moment. In 1954, that was their parents' moment, Brown versus Board. Our moment is right now. Our moment is 2021. And we need to walk from this moment and say, we did our best to support our young folks, our young Black folks. We are not afraid to actually say we care about young Black folks. And this resolution is asking you to actually uh, create the task force to actually talk about these things. I'm going to pass it to Brother um, Director Mike Hutchinson. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Director Williams. And, and I'm, I'm kind of in the same place. I don't really want to say a lot. I am trusting that, um, especially listening to the community, seeing the amount of emails we've all received, that we should be able to push forward and approve a resolution this month for Black History Month 2021. But I, I, I do want to touch on just one thing. Um, I don't want to bring up all the stories that I've witnessed. But you know, I have, I have personal experience in this, of course. And as a proud graduate of OUSD, you know, when I got to my senior year in high school, my high school skyline did not let me walk with my graduating class. Um, I had teachers at school who decided they didn't like my politics and they flunked me for the year. Really tried to, um, they threatened my future, even though I was a top student and even though they knew I had been accepted to Cal. And it was, a, it was a, a, a real eye awakening experience because I was in honors classes. My mom was a teacher. I had as much privilege as somebody who looks like me could have in OUSD. And even within that, I still didn't get to walk with my graduating class. Because of that, my younger brother went to a different high school. He still had his projects thrown in the trash by his high school teachers. And that was while my brother was on his way to an Ivy League education. And so what we have to realize is in the United States and even here in Oakland, white supremacy, racism, and anti-blackness has been here since day one. We have a huge opportunity now to honor the will of the community and take concrete steps to work on a solution and remedies that we as a community can all buy into and trust. You know, we saw our students lead marches over this past summer. And I think it is our responsibility now to follow the lead of the community and to pass this resolution this month to form this task force going forward and to really make this work meaningful going forward. So again, hopefully, um, you know, uh, Director Williams and I can, can answer what any, whatever questions people might have, but I'm hoping that this is more of a philosophical vote and a vote of morals that we as the Oakland School Board are declaring that we take reparations for black students seriously and we are pledging to engage in this work going forward. So thank you and, um, and hopefully this should be an easy move for everyone. Thank you both. Um, colleagues, comments, questions? Yes, can I make a couple of comments? Sure, go ahead, Director Johnson. Thank you. Um, first of all, I wanna say yes, I did sign on to the reparations um, resolution in order for it, for us to have a discussion. So I, I just want everyone to know that. Now, um, and it's also because I strongly believe that we have to really address um, the needs of our black students here in the district. However, I want, and as I talked to one of the authors and uh, suggested some things to her, I want to bring up some things that I talked about Number one, um, fiscally, um, I think we have to know where our resources are going to actually come from because we have to make certain that our district stays afloat, number one. Um, then number two, improving the schools um, for sure. I, I absolutely am committed to supporting schools 
where black students are thriving. Now, one such school is really in my district, in District 7, and that's Grass Valley Elementary. Also, there's another school that I know of, and that's Ames Charter School. It's actually uh, doing very well for black students. As a matter of fact, I even asked that um, um, uh, stats were pulled for me because I really want to see how well black students are doing um, in that school. But we need a strategy to turn around schools that are not serving our black students. So I think we need to devote some time there. And in terms of co-locations, because that was also um, broached in the resolution, we have to make certain that we're actually following the law uh, in terms of co-location and for black staff. That's really important to me because I was a staff also in OUSD when it was called OPS. So I realized the paucity of black educators in Oakland Unified School District, but I really feel that we need to create the avenue for our classified, our black classified staff to actually earn their certificates and become teachers in our district. Um, so um, I, I will stop there, but, but those are my comments and that's where I'm concerned. May, may I respond? Sure, go ahead. Um, thank you, Director Thompson. I really appreciate that. Um, that's good to hear. Um, one of the things that we're really trying to accomplish with this resolution is really get to the table with OUSD. Yeah. Um, and what it says is then the question you're asking about what it's gonna cost, we will be able to talk about that at the table, right? We will be able to sit down and really have those discussions. That's really the most important part is like, you know, in a sense there, our particular um, items on this resolution come from community members, or hundreds of community members' involvement in this. And so we are actually putting forth an opportunity to OUSD um, ourselves to say, let's come to the table and talk about these things and see what solutions are. You know, if you really, it, it re our budget reflects our values. And that's really where we should think about it. Our budget really reflects our values and our priorities. It's so easy to talk about what we want to do, but it's so hard to use the money to back that up, right? And so we really have to have those conversations to say, okay, these are the things that we see that are not going well. How can we work together to actually create a plan to move that forward? That's, that's a very easy to do. So I really want to work with you and work with OUSD, uh, Mike and I, uh, Director uh, Hutchinson and I, um, you know, and I, and I appreciate your courageousness to sign on and support us because you know that our kids really need this particular support. And so that's what we're asking today or tonight is number one through our celebration of Black History Month that this resolution is a first step to say to our Black students, we see you, we hear you, we want to re repair the generations of harm that's been going on for, for quite a while. So thank you very much for that. Yeah, thank you very much, sir. And, and let me just, the other part of that, um, when you mentioned Ames Charter, you know, it's one of the issues we have now where if we make a policy as a school board, um, we can't compel charter schools to have to follow that. So I would, if we come up with a strong um, um, policy out of this and the work coming out of the task force, I would love for then charter schools to adopt our model, but we have no way to enforce that as the public school board. Um, and so I think we can model that for the charter school going forward and we could all be better off for it. Director Hutchinson, you and I should have a conversation because I've had a conversation with them. So yes, you and I will have one. Great, colleagues, what questions or comments do you all have? Go ahead, Director Yeek. Um, thank you, uh, President Gonzalez. Um, I think um, one of the comments that uh, you made in the past is uh, the need for having a, um, a uh, a budget sheet for the uh, resolution if it's adopted as it is. Uh, has that uh, process begun yet? Can, can may I answer that? Sure. Uh, thank you, 
Mr. Dallas for giving me a few minutes to answer that. Um, Director Yi, thank you very much for that question. Um, so one of the things that we're looking for is this is, a, this is conceptual in nature. And so for us to come up with the ideas, we really have to work in tandem with the district to actually move it forward. If we want to start to try to put numbers ahead of this, this moral imperative, then we're actually stopping the process. You know, so when we come to the table, then we can say, okay, OUSD, let's look at the budget and see how we can um, make some adjustments. Maybe we can look at the equity plan. Maybe we can look at what does the indicators for black thriving look like and how those may apply. Maybe we can look at a number of different things that would actually be supportive. So we're saying that the, the, the actual budget numbers ahead of time is actually um, not built into this resolution because it's really about the con concept of us as a district to support our students. When we come to an agreement, which I'm hoping we do um, February 24th, then we're gonna sit down and talk about those numbers. And I would like you to be at the table, Gary. Thank you. Thanks, so there is, there is no, uh, there is no uh, projected dollar amount attached to this then? Well, I, there is no project, no, there's no cost analysis for each and every individual item. The cost analysis has been the, uh, the poor performance of our African-American students. That's the cost analysis and how, how, how painful that is for our students. So no, there is not a dollar amount to it at this present time, but it does not stop us from actually engaging with the district to uh, sit down at the table and have that discussion. We shouldn't allow a cost analysis to stop us from actually working together to actually get the answers that you want, Gary. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, may I just follow one more comment, Director, uh, President Gonzalez? Uh, because this is, um, you know, it, it's very thoughtful and very comprehensive. And I think some of us, uh, myself, I, I would say, um, what, uh, director, what director Dr. Thompson, uh, he's also Dr. Thompson, has um, uh, referenced um, what he mentioned the, uh, the Ames uh, Charter School is it seems that there's uh, some intentionality here to, um, refer to the uh, harm caused by school closures and charters. And is that, uh, is that what you consider part of black reparations, the rolling back of charters and the rolling back of closing schools? Can, can, can I take this one, Jerry Williams? I'm referring to, I'm referring directly to Mr. Williams, but you know, uh, when he's finished with his response, you should feel free to uh, refer to the president and uh, get her to call on you. Yeah, go ahead, Director Hutchinson. I, no, I, I love, I, I, I love, how, there's special, I love how there's special rules for Mike, especially while we're talking about Black Sanctuary here. Um, it's a very interesting dynamic that I'm used to at this point. So that's not the intention of why this was written. The why, the why the language was included about school closures and co-locations is when we look historically over the last 20 years of what schools have been subjected to closure and what schools have been subjected to co-locations, a high percentage of those schools, a very high percentage of those schools have been black majority schools. And so the reason why that language is in there is to address the disparate impact that school closures and co-locations have had on the black community. And I think it's one of the issues that we really need to get at as a district is there's citywide policies and then there's what's happened to the black community in a much harsher way. And that's what those measures are about. But just lastly, I think to the larger issue, kind of the model of this going in is what happened last year with the George, George Floyd resolution, that we are really looking for uh, an aspirational statement of intent and intent from the school board to create this task force so we can continue this work going forward like Director Williams said. And so I'm, I'll just say it personally, I'm gonna be upset if this turns into a conversation about looking at every word in the resolution and seeing if we can afford this or do this or not. 
the community wants us to take a principled position saying that we care about reparations and repairing the harm that's been done to the black community in Oakland. That is the intent of this. That is why these things were listed because these are the harms that community members have cited. And that's what we're really looking to address going forward. Um, I was waiting for a response from Director Williams. Uh, uh, Director Williams, would you like to respond? Sure. Um, Director Mike Hutchison took the words right out of my mouth. Okay. That's fine. That's all I need to know. Thank you. Okay. Vice I'll President Davis, I see your hand. Okay. I'll, I'll defer. Director Ang, did you want to talk first or I can go either way? You are on mute, Director Ang. You can go ahead, Vice President Davis. I just wanted to get in here. Oh, okay, thanks. So, um, yeah, I just want to express deep appreciation for all the work that went into creating this resolution. It's, as Ms. Manigo said, it's a bold statement. Um, it's a very rich document, and I think it really speaks to how much Oakland has transformed in recent years, that this is coming as a joint effort from the teachers union and several community groups, because back when I was a teacher, I didn't get to see this kind of a joint campaign uh, between labor and, and the community in, on a social issue like systemic racism. So it's a, real, it's a real good comment on the direction that Oakland has moved in, in the intervening time. Um, and it's clearly the right time for this because there's a lot of synergy that you see between some of the items in the resolution and other initiatives that are happening at the same time. I think on the, on the next meeting, we're gonna have a, a report from the California Collaborative for Educational Excellence and they also bring up you know, the issue of over-identification of students with special needs, the need to identify indicators, the need to develop a dashboard. Um, there's also other groups in the community like the NAACP that are raising issues around literacy, uh, cultural relevance in, in choosing a literacy curriculum. So you know, there's a lot in here that I think uh, resonates with a lot of other, uh, what a lot of other groups are saying. Um, I want to just stress that just because the board is, you know, addressing the issue of African-American students in this way, that in no way takes away resources for other groups, whether it's Latina and Latino students or Southeast Asian students or Pacific Islanders or, you know, any other group. This is just recognizing the historic nature of how our educational system has mistreated black students. Um, and in fact, as I think some of the community members said, uh, this work provides a template for how we can address the, these issues with other groups. Uh, because we're looking at the whole child and addressing not just one issue narrowly, but looking at how things like over-identification, disproportionate suspensions, uh, problems with literacy, education, lack of resources, how those problems all interact with each other as schools. Um, so I just had, uh, uh, I'm you know broadly supportive of the resolution. I just had a few questions. Um, I think for me, the biggest thing that I want to make sure is that when we're devoting resources, that that's gonna have direct strong impact at school sites. I don't want us to pass anything that concentrates resources, you know, um, centrally that then don't filter down to sites um, or, you know, I don't want us to pass something. And, you know, I, I do actually want a wordsmith because I don't want things to just be words on a page. I want them to have impact. So um, as an example, I wanna lift up the BOP resolution from last year that Director Hutchinson was referring to. And it was, you know, some of the brilliance of that proposal was that it lifted up the SSOs and, you know, transitioning them to a role where they're really the culture keepers and, and they are folks at school sites implementing, you know, a new safety plan. And so that's a way of, of taking resources and moving them from, a, you know, a central police force and moving them out to SSOs at sites, folks who have much more direct um, relationship with students. So that's the sort of work that I feel like has the, the biggest impact. Um, the second piece, oh, I know there's an existing group called uh, CBs. Um, I believe it's like a parent group and I'm wondering how the task force would interface with that group or would they be integrated together if you, if you worked with them? I think it's uh, the Committee to Empower Excellence in Black Student Education. And the third question is, um, you know, this big opportunity that that the proposal refers to of seeking philanthropy. 
um, on this issue. I know that, you know, with everything that's going on in the world right now, there is a lot of interest among foundations and other philanthropic organizations to support this kind of work. And so I'm just wondering, you know, I see that that's part of the resolution. Is that something that, that is that one of the things where the details need to be worked out or is that something that there's already some thinking about, you know, who would be our fiscal partner and, and our fiscal sponsor and, and how that would work? Director Mike. Okay, I'll just, so um, thank you. No way. <laughs> you go ahead, go ahead. Okay. I, I, you can come clean it up. You can come clean up what I'm saying. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Director Davis, for those questions. CV is definitely welcome. Come to the table. Um, I think, that, again, this is um, a community process um, of experiences from families as uh, one of our uh, public comment, uh, Carissa, Carissa, Clarissa, sorry. Carissa, um, <laughs> it's getting late. Um, one of these process that community voices are coming into the process. So we would definitely, you know, incorporate that. The second part I think is that we will look for philanthropy um, to be part of this conversation. I think there is this fear that we don't have enough money to provide these supports that we're asking for. But I think that there are alternative ways to address that. Um, OUSD has the, you know, open, you know, ed fund, right? Oakland ed fund that comes and supports. And so there's a number of ph philanthropic organizations that will come to the table. You know, we do have to get that particular, um, you know, process right. And, and the third one is that, you know, we don't have all the answers up front. You know, we don't have all the answers up front, but I think what we are saying is, you know, we really want to engage that conversation um, at the table with, uh, with the district staff so we can come up with these solutions here. Um, I think that that is just really what we're, we're, we're trying to say, um, let's go ahead and move in a moral imperative way, our values to say, let's work this out. Right, let's come to the table and work it out. So we don't have, you know, all those particulars, um, but we do have, you know, the uh, to understand that we need to extend resources, you know, to black families that are hit by COVID. We know that, um, you know, that the task force would be necessary to ensure communities input, you know, with, uh, you know, having black stakeholders voice at the table. So yes, we, we know these things. I think that we should step forward and engage the conversation and not be fearful that this is just going to consume the district because it hasn't consumed it with um, the George Floyd resolution. It's, it's, a, it's a conversation and it's been moving forward and we can do the same thing here. Thank you. Um, I don't think Director Ramos or Director Eng have spoken yet, and I would also like to hear from our superintendent at some point about how this would impact the existing work plan um, and priorities. But Director Eng or Director Ramos, would either of you like to ask questions or make comments? Director Ramos, did you want to? Go ahead. I'm, I'm trying to clear up my throat. Okay. <laughs> I know you have, you've been a bit under the weather. Hang in there. Um, okay, so I appreciate the the resolution. I'll just jump in because I know it's it's getting late here, um, and I you know I appreciate the spirit of the resolution. I I think um, at a high level the idea of um, you know a, a, a identifying harm that has been caused, finding creating a plan that's that's um, in partnership with community and identifying targeted um, strategies and resources is a is a um, a good thing. Um, I think that where I am having a challenge is that um, it is a pretty comprehensive document and I, and I appreciate the fact that um, from my understanding it's comprehensive because it's really um, lifting up all of the comments in the research process from families and youth um, that were identified. Um, so I, I appreciate the inclusion of all of those strategies. However, I think that what, what I was hearing Director Williams is that um, you know, we not having an answer and really wanting to create a table and a task force to be able to um, set out and determine some of these strategies 
it's not the way I read it, it didn't necessarily it it was uh, it didn't it, it had a lot more detail than that in terms of where where the investments and how the um, some of the different areas that we should be pursuing. So I wonder, and, and I think of the details, there's there's a lot I agree with around, I mean, we talked about budget and finance last time around revisiting the equity formula and, um, uh, you know, obviously the, the trainings and the, the, the work, um, lifting up the work around um, the George Floyd resolution and, and the other initiatives that are also going on that we, we really want to um, continue to, um, to heighten work on, um, particularly around the sig significant disproportionality um, of African American students within the special ed, which we are also mandated to be doing work on. And so, I, I guess what I'm saying is, I, I um, the way I read the resolution, it is, it's not. Um, I guess I'm trying to understand the grain size in terms of what the ask is, because I think on a um, on a level of um, really recognizing the harm and identifying that we want a targeted strategy and creating a table and for there to be a strategic um, table for us to work around, I'm definitely uh, supportive of. But I think when it gets down to a lot of the bullet points and the details, there are, while I definitely understand we don't want it to be a back and forth around um, you know, budget necessarily on the front end, if you're saying that that the table is supposed to create the opportunity of what the target investments are. There is a lot of detail there that does have some um, implicate financial implications and also just some, I, I don't necessarily philosophically agree, agree with all of the strategies, although although you know many of them I do. So I just wonder about um, if it is more of a philosophical statement, is there a way to um, you know, pull back some of the ideas and, and refer that on to the working group table to be able to um, to talk about some of the details and et cetera. Uh, thank you for that. I uh, appreciate that. Um, it is comprehensive. Um, over uh, a year's period, uh, over 150 parents, uh, there is a lot there. And I, there, there's actually more there. Um, but what what we've tried to do is uh, bring it to a manageable level. Um, I have extended myself to, we as an organization have extended ourselves to district staff um, to really just to uh, express what the conception of this particular uh, resolution is doing. And uh, the feedback has been it's, it's workable and it's doable. Um, and that they would be willing to sit at the table and talk to us about it. So I think there is a sense that um, this is like a first step to really engage this process. And, you know, I think there is the fear that um, we don't want the district to commit to something that we can't actually follow through on. And I, I totally get that. But also, I think we are we don't know what the district can do until we sit down and actually talk about it because there's just not one solution to any given item here. There are multiple solutions that we can utilize. Some have money, some don't have money. You know, some can be rolled into, you know, superintendent's uh, strategic plan. There, there are some things that, and that's what I was trying to say to Gary, everything doesn't have a cost item, but the, the, the whole, the resolution itself is actually um, built off the intention that we're gonna pay attention and really focus and be in, in, intentional on addressing our young folks. And so some of those are cost items, some are not cost items, but we don't know until we can sit at the table to see what is possible. So if I propose you know, a particular fund, you know, we have an idea, but we won't know until we sit at the table with OUSD to see what is it, what is possible. And that's what we're asking for is the step to get to what is actual possible. We're giving you, there's a, there's a number of, of things that we are concerned about, but if we try to pare them down into just, you know, four or five items, then there's still uh, the other 15 that haven't been addressed. So we want to put it all on the table to see what um, what what can OUSD do, and that is the first step. If we stop there 
and just kind of say is, is more than we can handle. Like, I, I get it. What type of staff will be able to do this work? What department will be able to do that work? You know, uh, how much money is it going to cost? I get it. Um, and those are great questions. But at the same time, we don't know unless we get to the table to actually talk to the district to see what can they provide? What can we provide? Director Williams, could you just clarify just because you keep on, when you say get to the table, do you mean um, the proposed task force in terms of discussions between staff and community and board and the task force? Or what, what do you mean by the table? Just so I'm understanding um, even procedurally or you know what the steps would be or the vision for for, uh, um, yes, um, and if Mike wants to elaborate, yes. It, so it, it really is, this resolution will signify an opportunity that we can actually talk about these concerns in an open uh, community way. And so like right now we can bring it to you and then we go back home and nothing actually gets done. But if we actually go ahead and you know really consider this and make a vote, and say, okay, I would like OUSD and the community folks who have done research, who provided these um, concerns, you know, to have this conversation, then we can move that forward. I mean, so this is the resolution is an opportunity for us to vote our values to say, we would like to talk about uh, the outcomes of black students, not just talk about it, but actually create the task force with the district to actually address these concerns. Now, and so those are two different things. Talking about it and actually putting action behind it is, is the other part. And that action part is the task force. And it is something that until we um, pass this resolution to, do the, to know what we can do, this, I mean, it, it is really modeled after George Floyd. It's a, co a continual conversation of what needs to be done, Mike. Yeah, and I I agree with that. This is the intention is that this is the starting point, but we're starting with all this data that we've co collected already, and and I think the other thing that's important in this conversation as we're talking about the cost, nobody has mentioned the cost to our black families and students um, historically under this system. So if we're going to talk about a cost benefit we really need to address the historical cost that black families have paid in Oakland. And that's also the intent of reparations is to correct that and to begin to repair that damage. And I just wanna backwards in this meeting tonight, I thought one of the most powerful statements from a community member was the uh, Japanese American community member who referenced the reparations that their family got after their internment. And so I, I think we don't wanna lose track of what we're trying to address. We're not proposing a new policy and we need to do a, a, a rate of return on it. We are talking about addressing the historical and systemic harm that our community has been facing all along. And that really needs to be in the cost benefit analysis, I think also. And I just say real quick, this is really about the task force, right? It's a, it's a create a plan with staff you know, but ongoing development of, you know, what black education is about, black education fund, and really look at the indicators that will um, move academic success. And so really that's what the resolution is asking to do is to create this task force to engage that conversation. And so, thank you. Director Yang, did you get your, did you get your questions out? Yeah, I know that we're out of time, so it's it's fine. I guess, okay. yeah, I, I know that we need to Okay, time. Director Ramos, did you have comments or questions? Yeah, absolutely. Um, real quick, just wanna thank both of you because I know I met I met the actual uh, the actual organizers who are behind us and, you know, uh, Clarissa and uh, Kampala. Clarissa. Like, is it Clarissa? I, I yes, feel like- yes. I couldn't say okay. it a few minutes okay. ago. Okay, okay. Uh, basically, yeah, I just I wanna thank them real quick because, you know, that it's, the reason that we're doing passing this or you know i mean not passing this but we're on to talk about this is because of them um and i i've seen it i've seen you know black especially like my black um class classroom peers who are like losing the motivation themselves and just being able to complete their high school um and it's like as ousd we should be on top of that especially our staff and just our teachers um 
And I think as this being passed, it's just a, it's just like the same thing with the George Floyd resolution. It's something to a change for the OUSD community. Uh, definitely, um, one of the things I really, really kind of see this at longest with the African with the African American achievement, uh, the male achievement. I remember when they were so on it, like eighth grade, my eighth grade year, like they would travel to. Uh, where did they go? They went to the Washington DC ones. They, they would travel, like it was all of these boys coming all together and, you know, saying that it was like, you know, like, oh, like y'all, y'all powerful. Like I see what y'all doing, but pretty much it's now that I see them, now that I look at them five years later, they're all in different places. They all have lost motivation in school. They all have, uh, cause they don't have that support anymore. So I uh, would, lo would love to see, you know, that support again, coming back to our, our students, especially coming back to, um, to our future generations that are going to be coming um so yes i i, I love this and uh hope to see what, what hope to see it pass thanks director ramos um i do have some questions but um superintendent i really would like to hear from you and your team um as everybody knows we have an existing work plan for this year um with you know really important things like the safety plan and reopening schools, um, the launch of the central kitchen, the teacher retention work, um, improving central service to sites, um, the learning loss and distance learning work. So um, I really wanna understand um, superintendent, um, and I don't, I know that Dr. Aguilera had a chance to speak to Director Williams, um, but I'm just curious from you, um, how does this fit into our existing work plan for the year? Um, and how would this impact our other priorities? Thank you, um, President Gonzalez, for, for the question. Um, I think I will say, um, first of all, from a value perspective, from a vision perspective, thinking about our work as a district holistically, and what we need to do to work differently to accelerate the outcomes of black students is what we should be doing. Um, I think the tension in the conversation is, you know, the angel is in the details. And I wanna go back to the George Floyd resolution because close to 10 years ago as a district, we did try to do this. This isn't the first time um, that that has been brought um, to the district. And, and I want to define, when we say the district, the district is everybody on the Zoom call. It's Oakland Unified School District, it's the board, it's the superintendent and staff. And that is important to make clear um, so that we do things where policy and the implementation are aligned and that they sustain even beyond the people that are in these roles. Um, so that the work, we're not changing direction every two years, which has been the fundamental problem in our district. We have so much change. We don't stay on anything long enough to get results. And the results that we need the most are for our black students um, and our brown students. And we're constantly changing. So the alignment between whoever is the superintendent and the board is important. And the strategic plan should not be my strategic plan because I'm not going to be here forever. And we don't want it to be when I leave, then the work goes away. It needs to be the district strategic plan and hopefully something that the community buys into so that we can be on the same work 10 years from now. That's how we get to systemic change. So the data is, is crystal clear. You can trace our literacy data, our attendance data, our disproportionate, uh, disproportionality data back 10 years. You see very little change for our black and brown students. What I would like to see as we think about the revisions is, I don't see in here the specific student outcomes we're after. Um, I, I would love to see that we're talking explicitly about literacy. We've heard it in the call tonight. It's been raised by NAACP. It's been raised by a number of groups as one specific outcome that can have ripple effects for kids to be better in math, to be ready for advanced courses. Um, and so what that means is a system level is we have to go big from an investment standpoint. It's not the just the curriculum and making sure it speaks to black students. It's training for teachers. It's recognizing teachers need help. It's the tutors. Um, someone was talking about the, uh, what was going on in Elk Grove. It's a comprehensive all hands on deck. If we're saying that that is a priority for our black students. Um, I know ACC and our students have talked about 
mental health, but we need to be looking at whatever we're investing in with our black students in mind, that should generate into more kids attending school. The four groups of students that we have had problems with for decades, black students. One of the reasons why we say unhoused and foster youth, those are primarily our black and our brown students that are unhoused and foster youth. So we need to be thinking about what is the do different? What has worked? What do we need to do? So more of our students are attending and the high school in A to G. So as we're looking at the pieces that are in here, I think most of the concepts are right on, but the angel is where are we gonna focus for the next three years? We can't do everything all, all at once, but we can do critical pieces in a lot of these different areas, whether we're talking about changing the mindset of staff, the right curriculum that folks need, the other supports that folks need in schools to make sure that they're not leaving any kid behind and they have the resources to, just, to support individual students and individual families. So I think us thinking about the outcomes that we need to go after is extremely um, important. Um, I, I asked the board to think about the power of it being connected to the strategic plan, because that does, there was someone in the community who said we need a multi-year comprehensive plan. That is the purpose of a strategic plan, so that you're setting direction on how you want to spend your funds over three to four years. You need to focus on something in the system at least three to five years to see change. How do we do that if everything's connected to one person, if we have all this turnover? We need to have a plan that represent everybody's interests so that we can stay on it and we can really narrow um, our, our, our focus of where we're investing so we get the outcomes for the Black students. Um, just to lift up some of the work we're planning to do and where we need, we constantly need our community to continue to push us. Yeah, but you need to be better. You know, you need to think about your implementation. Our George Floyd resolution, we have an early, early literacy block grant from the state that should be focused on our Black students. We have um, um, a mandate, if you will, from the state to interrogate and look at what's causing the disproportionality of our Black students. Um, next board meeting, there's going to be a presentation from the state around the CCEE plan. The three groups that that plan is focused on explicitly are Black students, unhoused foster youth, and English language learners. Um, and pretty much every board meeting, you hear Jessica representing um, our high school students talking explicitly around the pieces that we need um, for high school outcomes, specifically graduation and A to G. Um, so I think it's doable, um, but I think we need to think about timeline. Right now, the number one priority, particularly for black students, is thinking about the reopening and the virtual learning. That has got to be first, right? Um, and so should we be talking about these pieces? Yes, I would offer, um, it would be good that this is actually driving our strategic plan. So it's not just an add-on, it is the work that we're doing and focused on for the next three to five years. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Superintendent, that's really helpful. Did you wanna respond, Director Williams? Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, Thank you, uh, Superintendent, for that. Uh, I think that is, you're, you're speaking to the work that we're trying to get accomplished, really. Um, because what we know is that the outcomes, the data speaks to the outcomes that uh, the district has, has provided for us. The, the outcomes our students over the last two years haven't been very great. The last five years, they haven't been very great. And so I think what we're trying to do is to be intentional in the work. Um, and this particular task force is not taken, I don't think will take, um, take any work away from what you're already doing. Um, the task force in itself um, has phases. Um, we can create the timelines necessary. So if you think that it's a three-year process or five-year process, we can do that as well. I think what we're trying to say is that um, there are many projects that have been um, brought up to really say, um, we're working with black students, 
but the outcomes are not showing themselves. And so we're gonna say that again tonight. We will say that again next week. We will say that again and the outcomes have been the same. We're talking about generations here. We're not just talking about you know, this last couple. We're talking about for as long as this district has been in place, there have been uh, a devaluing of black students. And so what we're asking you as well as the district um, to uh, support us. And I think um, everything you said- Director Williams, I, I would respectfully appreciate you including yourself in the district because we all are the district, the board, superintendent and staff. That's the only way, that's to do different as well. Thank you, um, thank you very much. Um, and just so to finish up is, I want to thank you for your comments. Everything you're saying is is what we're talking about in in our in our proposal. And I appreciate, it and we do want to work with you. Um, we think that um, just continue to bring the spotlight to our young folks is just something that is uh, it shouldn't be a question how we come together. So. Um, just want to thank you for that. Um, appreciate it. Director Hutchinson, did you want to respond? Just, just briefly. Um, I, I think there, there would be um, huge support for embedding this work within the strategic plan. And, and so I, I don't want to speak for anyone else, but there is a real intent from the community. And I think from Director Williams also that we get this started now. And it, it, is, it is really this, I see it as a moral imperative for during Black History Month to really make this vote happen. And, uh, you know, I, I have to say as a, as, a, as a Black man born and raised in Oakland, um, it makes me a little bit nervous when I hear these reasons being brought up to maybe delay this. I, I would love for us to take a leap of faith in believing in um, the, the moral imperative and to make this happen for the community. Nobody wants us to bankrupt the district or is trying to, to destroy things. This is really to, to, to go about the work of restorative justice and reparations. And so I think what I've heard a lot of people saying is everyone, I don't want to speak for everyone, it sounds like we could be in the same place where we are looking for a start to this. We want to create the task force. There might be some changes needed on the scope of work of that task force. With, with the end outcome being actionable items, tangible outcomes, and hopefully embedding this work within the strategic plan so it is lasting and impactful. And hopefully we can, we can move to that point. And I, I just gotta say again, I'm gonna be a little bit disappointed, you know, if, if we're not willing to take that move um, based on what the community is asking for. Um, I see Director Yee and Director and Vice President Davis. I haven't had a chance to speak yet, so I'm going to say a couple things and then I'll go back to you guys. Um, so I fully support the idea of the task force. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, and if this comes back to us with a much narrower focus on the task force um, and perhaps some other pieces that we could take up with next year's work plan, since we already have a work plan for this year with very urgent items like the return to school, um, so I would definitely be behind that. Um, the rest of this, I have to agree with everyone else that, um, you know, from my perspective, one of the reasons our district has struggled to be fiscally sustainable is agreeing to, to initiatives without understanding all the costs. Um, and so I think what makes a lot of sense is for us to launch the task force and for the task force to have those exploratory conversations. Um, specifically what the superintendent said, around understanding specific outcomes that we're seeking. Director Williams, that's, the, that's what I was saying to you when we spoke about this before is that we have to understand what it is that we're trying to get at and why you know, whatever it is the task force would be proposing would be better than what we're already investing in because we have a lot of investments for African-American students. Maybe they're not working, um, but what, what is the evidence or the thinking around why some of these initiatives would be better than what we're already doing and we'll get different outcomes than the outcomes we're already getting for students, which are not satisfactory for the most part. Um, so that would be my suggestion is just um, let's, let's move forward with the task force 
Um, let's figure out which of these pieces we want to put in the work plan for 21-22. We're coming up on that conversation in a couple months. And what part of this goes into the strategic plan? Baking, baking it in um, to our long-term work, um, I think, makes a lot of sense. So that's where, um, that's where I'm at. Um, and I saw, um, why don't we start with Director Yi? Oh, I don't know if you would like to respond to that, um, Director Williams or Director Hutchinson. Uh, thank you, um, President Gonzalez, for that. Um, I think we both agree that it is important. I, I, I just want to really highlight the fact that um, our plan for addressing low achieving students and closing the achievement gap, I haven't heard of one from the district yet. And so what we're trying to do, uh, you know, what we're trying to do is take a step in that right direction. Um, and so I agree with you. We look forward to uh, uh, having those conversations. I think sometimes we get stuck with um, the sense of how much everything is going to cost, which limits the uh, creative thinking that we can come up with the solutions for it, right? And so when we come to the table and we come to the create the task force and really talk about these things, then those items will be very present in the conversation. So I, I appreciate everything you're saying. Um, thank you very much for that. I, I, I agree with working on the task force. Thank you. Director Hutchinson, did you want to add, did you want to respond? Uh, the only thing, um, I, I do have to say to hear a list of other things that are in the work plan and being told that those are important things and the discussion then by inference, uh, black reparations for our students is not as important as those other things already in our work plan, a work plan that us new board members had no part in discussing. Um, I, I actually find it a little bit offensive. And so we can say that we have a lot of things on our plate to address, but I think we should be careful as a board uh, deeming what's more important than reparations for our black students or what's less important. Okay. Director Yee, did you want to? Yeah, thanks. Uh, so, uh, and I, I appreciate the passion. Um, I particularly appreciate uh, the community engagement. Um, I started in uh, Oakland Public Schools, and this won't be long, but I started in Oakland Public Schools in uh, 71 uh, with uh, Marcus Foster and the Marcus Foster Master Plan Coordinating Committee. And, you know, the, when he came, he talked about the time is now, and he was addressing the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, disproportionality, the the harsh uh, conditions, and the uh, the limited advances of specifically black kids, and so that's what rallied people like me to become teachers. and uh, And my commitment to the district 50 years later is for the same purposes. Uh, but then, about 10 years ago, and I think um, uh, uh, I've forgotten who mentioned 10 years ago, but oh, uh, Dr. Uh, Johnson Tremell. You know, I think she was referring to the movement of uh, Dr. Smith, uh, Tony Smith, to build community schools, which is referenced in the reparations, and the targeted universalism of uh, Dr. John Powell's from uh, UC Berkeley. And so I'm just going to uh, I'm I'm in uh, in agreement with, and I've worked on actually many of the things that are in the reparations, not completely, not as thoroughly and comprehensively. The part that's the hardest for me is that the citywide plan and the blueprint is explicitly um, unwound in some of these, uh, in some of the uh, um, uh, uh, bullet points that you have here. And so that's the part that's really hard for me. I wasn't here to create the citywide plan. I wasn't here to create the blueprint, but that was the process that I, came, I walked into and I supported as part of the superintendent's agenda. So whether she wants to um, own it or whether the current board wants to own it, I think that's the discussion I'm prepared to have in the next year. And if the board decides that it wants to unwind the process and put the lay the onus of the uh, failure of uh, African American students on charters and school closures, then that's something we'll vote on. If we could distank, decouple that from the discussion about reparations, I'm fully, I think that I, 
could be uh, and a very uh, eager uh, supporter of that. But I think that those two items that I've just mentioned are very difficult for me to consider as part of the beginning. It seems to be that that could be an ending. After a year, we decide that we wanna actually unwind the citywide plan, the blueprint. We wanna change our relationship to the charter school, but that's a pretty dramatic change on the part of the entire community, 30% of whom invest in charter schools and all of our staff that is built into the, in the implementation so far of the citywide plan. So that's the part that's hard for me. And I don't mind saying it in public. Those are the parts that, that are sticking points for me. If you want my support and you could hear that it's there, it's a 50 year support, Director Williams and Director Hutchinson. If you want my support on this, that's uh, what I need to hear some willingness to give on. Either of you like to respond to Director Yee? Sure, I, I can. Um, that's the will of the community after uh, a couple of years of meeting, the community developed this plan. And so um, I, I think people on the school board or school board directors need to hear that the black community feels like the school closures over the last 17 years have been a direct attack on the black community and on black students. That's what's reflected in this resolution. And so there's still a lot of things to be decided with a task force, but, but I, don't, I don't want us to discount where these bullet points come from, which is from the community. And so this to me highlights why it is even more necessary to have this task force in these conversations because there's a disconnect between the black community and, um, and our school board. And this is the will of the community reflected in this resolution. Um, so I didn't I, write- I, 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 With you know, all respect, Mr. Mr. Hutchison, I'd say the community is represented by the seven of us who were elected to the board. The community is a bigger thing than the, than the people that are that uh, you are claiming to represent. No, but but okay, I know. Hey guys, who can we, let's it. keep it. Let's keep it civil, guys. Respect, member. We're trying to model the behavior that we want our students and our community to engage in. Um, okay. Director Williams, would you like to respond to anything, Director Yee said? Um. Uh, yes. So. I. I, 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 I'm, I, I, the, the charter thing throws me off a little bit because we're talking about public, 70% uh, of our black kids uh, in the public school system. Um, we're talking about the results that our kids are facing in the public school system. So I, I won't engage any charter talk. Um, appreciate you bringing that up. But I think that, you know, what, each and every one of you acknowledges that there is a problem here. Like we all know it is. The question is, what is our priority? And we're gonna say there's a problem here, but we have a priority of something else. And we engage in another year. And then that's another year that we have black students who are losing out. And so that's something that really kind of makes me feel uneasy because we all acknowledge that there is, the, the data's there, we all see it, we all know it, um, we acknowledge it, and then we're gonna punt it. We're gonna kick it down the field and say, we get to it later. And so all those other students, as Director Ramos was talking about, who are dropping out or having mental health or not having the supports that they need, we're gonna go ahead and just turn a blind eye to that. And so that's the appeal here is that, you, you, the, we feel that we have so much on our plate, but when it really comes to prioritizing the lives of black students, it, it is not a priority. It is one that we can push off to a later date. And so I just think that everything you've said, everything the superintendent said, everything that Amy said, we agree. We just trying to say, let's create this task force together to talk about them and see what comes out of it. What I'm hearing from um, a lot of the board members is create it first and bring it back to us so then we can agree on it. And it's like, well, once we create it ourselves and bring what well, we've just done, we've created it, we brought it to you and now you kick it back and say, go pare it down, 
create it again and bring it back to us. And we're gonna get the same result. So all I'm asking for from you, my board members is let's come together and let's talk about it, co-create it with our task force. That's, I mean, everything that you say, we agree to. And so it's not any extra pressure to schedule a one hour meeting to go through each one of these as we move throughout. It's not an, any extra pressure and you're not committing to anything. We have ideas, you have ideas. We sit down and we exchange our ideas with the task force, right? The task force just says, we're making a commitment to really looking at a plan that will assist because the past plans have not worked. They have not worked. And now we can say, oh, okay, we're gonna do something new. We're gonna do this and we're gonna do that. And we're like, well, let's sit down and talk about it. Let's do it together. That's what the task force is all about. So I'm asking you to consider that um, not to, um, not, not to add more burden to the district, to us, not add more burden to us, but actually say, you know, we have to pivot and really look at how we're doing this work together. Um, and that's what we're asking. So when folks say, oh, it's so convoluted with so many ideas, great. That's actually, we, we're bringing ideas to you that we can sit down and talk about. If you want to pare it down to very little ideas, then we, 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 we push all these other things out. So we're actually all in agreement. This is the crazy part. We're all in agreement that something can be done. And, all, and I, think the, 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 I think we're all in agreement. A task force is, is working, so thank you. Thanks, Dr. Wins. Um, I think Vice President Davis had another question or comment. Yeah, it's a comment um, because I just really appreciate the, the really rich discussion. And uh, I think there is a lot of, you know, concordance, even where there's a difference on certain issues, but there's certain points where I think there's a lot of agreement. And I just, um, I, I know when I was listening to public comment, I wrote down the, the um, one of the speakers talking about tracking our investments, you know, in terms of the fiscal impact, that there is money already being spent on behalf of educating African-American students. And what this is about is really trying to track those investments and evaluate you know, the efficacy of how we're investing that money. Um, and so I think that's a really good um, direction to be going in. And so the urgency that I'm hearing is really for the task force to be formed. And that's also what I heard from some of the authors of the, the language that I, that I talked to um, from the community. And so, uh, I'm wondering, I see kind of two paths forward. One would be to like rework the resolution a little bit just to say, and because I also hear a lot of agreement about the, the point about including this work as part of the strategic plan. And so to me, it would be, you know, two points kind of lifted up at the beginning of it saying, you know, we're going to form the task force. We're going to include uh, this work as part of the strategic plan at the district. And then some language saying, and the task force and the strategic plan will consider uh, avenues such as, and then list all of the, the, the points that, that we feel like, you know, there might need to be some further investigation or, or working of the details. So one way would be to do that. And the other way would be honestly, you know, it'd be even quicker than going for a vote is just, I think the superintendent is here listening to this discussion. She's heard that consensus developing. And so uh, it's certainly within, you know, she could simply go out and form a task force. Uh, I don't know that she needs to, to a formal vote in order to do that. Um, so I don't know if either of those are amenable to the authors, but I just wanted to throw those out, ideas out there as, as ways to move forward. May I respond? Go ahead, Director Williams. Oh, I'm sorry, Superintendent, please. No, go ahead, Director Williams, proceed. Heading relations. Thank, thank you. Um, thank you, Sam, for that. I, I would propose that we revisit this uh, February 24th. Um, give us an opportunity to uh, pare down some items or look at it again and revamp it um, to your liking. Um, I can get some suggestions from each of the board members to work on it and we can move forward. I think that would be a great compromise for all of us that you will give uh, 
Mike and myself and Cliff and the community members an opportunity to uh, address those ideas. Um, and then February 24th, we'll bring it back to you. Um, I think the, the thing that I know is that we as a board drive the agenda. And if we're gonna really prioritize, I think Director Mike Hutchinson said that, um, that we have the ability to drive, um, pick and choose what we want to focus on. And so I would say that if we can come together, if you're all saying we need this, I would really like to see us um, give, give me and Mike and our community an opportunity to go back and bring you what you're asking for. And on the 24th, present it one more time and then we can have you know, a much more fruitful discussion if you're looking for the details. I, I mean, because we all agree that this, I mean, there's no disagreement. I think what we're trying to figure out is how do we do this and what, and how do we bring it into a, a manageable space? And so if, we, if you give us the opportunity to do that, that continues to show your commitment to black students to say, we will look at this again on the 24th and we as a board can come together and use this as a priority. If this is a priority, then we can actually make this happen. Um, and we will, you know, there may be one or two items on, on the agenda that might be pushed a little bit back, but let's continue to move this forward. So I ask for the board to consider this item. Um, I make a proposal for the board to uh, consider this time certain by 224, give us an opportunity to bring you what you requested. Um, this is a priority for all of us and then we can actually um, have a better, clearer discussion on how we can move forward. Are you making a motion, Director Williams? Uh, yes, I am. Okay, so is there a second? Sorry, what's the, could you repeat the motion? What's the motion? I, I'm making a motion to move a vote on this um, matter for February 24th, that we will vote uh, on this for February 24th to create a task force. We have listened to everybody uh, concerns and what they would like to see. You, the, the two weeks will give me an opportunity and Mike an opportunity to give you what uh, you would like to see. And um, then we can have a vote on uh, the 24th. Oh, no. Okay. Um, is there a second? A second. Okay. Is there discussion, colleagues? I, oh. Go ahead, Director. Oh, yeah. So I would, so seeing that this is something that, that there is a lot of alignment of wanting to discuss and, and we've had, um, so I would support it coming back for, for discussion and possible adoption. But I think that, you know, obviously with the Brown Act, we're not able to discuss and, and, and I, would, I would, if it's not at a form that I, uh, if, if there's still further discussion, I would like to, for us to be able to, instead of voting it down, to be able to have a continued discussion around it. But I would, I would support it coming back for a discussion and possible adoption um, uh, in a paired back way, um, focus on the task force. For a second reading. For a, for a second read and possible adoption um, at the next meeting. Yeah, and maybe um, Director Williams, you can work with the general counsel because we can't all give you our feedback, but we can give feedback to general counsel and he can help you shape it so that we do it without violating the Brown Act. Um, other comments, questions, colleagues? Okay. Well, Mr. Rakestraw, can we have a roll call on the motion? Yes. On the motion to uh, bring this item back uh, on the 24th uh, with all the factors considered as stated in the motion. Uh, student Director Powell. 
Student Director Ramos? Yes. Director Yi? Uh, yeah. Director Ng? Yes. Director Williams? Yes. Director Hutchinson? Yes. Director Thompson? Yes. Vice President Davis? Yes. And President Gonzalez? Yes. Okay, so reschedule it for the 24th. Motion adopted. Good job, everybody. Um, we will move on to item 210313, the Fiscal Sustainability Plan. Superintendent, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Board President Gonzalez. Um, I would like to virtually ask our Chief Business Officer, Lisa Grant Dawson, to magically appear, and she will take us through the Fiscal Sustainability Plan. Good evening. Evening. I will be joined. We will not be before you long, I'm sure. Love that MOAD backdrop, by the way, Miss Grant Dawson. Had to have it, had to have it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we will not be before you um, long. Um, I will be joined by um, Mr. Daniel, so we'll be tag team. Um, this is our fiscal sustainability plan, which we've been communicating to the board that we have been working on as part of um, what we would call the uh, 2.0 and inclusive of the original fiscal vitality plan. Um, we've been able to share um, the framework about uh, this plan and what, how it differs. Um, but first we'd like to give you a little bit of history. And I'll turn it over to my partner in crime this evening, Mr. Daniels, um, to go through this portion of the presentation. All right, thank you, Ms. Grant Dawson. Um, I'm just sorry, I'm also making sure that everyone can see okay. Um, Is my Zoom okay. okay. Yeah, there's a weird thing with Zoom where like the chat boxes and stuff block it. It used to not be that way. Um, yeah, it's security. All right, so the, the, the history, um, you know, and I want to make clear that I wasn't here, Mr. Aaron Dawson wasn't here, you know, this, this extends back a few years. Um, but the fiscal vitality plan uh, comes out of the fact that back in 2016, the district began experiencing and exhibiting signs of fiscal distress. Um, and one sort of most concrete example of that is at the end of the 16, 17 fiscal year, the unrestricted fund balance was uh, less than three and a half million and the 2% required reserve was not met. Uh, and so that puts the, the district in a situation similar to what it was prior to the 2003 state takeover. However, the district did narrowly avoid uh, another takeover and they did so by taking a number of immediate and important actions. One of those things was to develop uh, the Fiscal Vitality Plan or FVP. Um, under the terms of that plan, it was a three-year plan uh, written up, you can find it online. It goes from 2018 to 2020. And obviously that year ended. Um, uh, there were 22 recommendations uh, provided in the plan uh, across three uh, different sets of recommendations, um, as you see on the screen. We can go, next, next slide is good. Um, and, you know, um, the, I think that the, the thing here, as I mentioned before, you know, the, the, the time frame of the vitality plan has, has ended. We are in, as a district, a much better and much stronger financial situation than we had been uh, at that point in time. As time has gone on, in addition, the sort of institutional awareness and investment in the original vitality plan has waned. Uh, new board members, uh, new staff, um, you know, just time has moved on. Um, and so, you know, there's now a benefit of adopting a new plan, in addition to the fact that it, the term of the prior plan has expired. Um, the current, the, a new plan could accurately reflect the district's financial situation. Um, and ideally, it would explicitly put the, 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 the district and the board uh, on a path to full independent governance and decision making. And so um, that sort of sets up sort of where we've been uh, and the rationale for why a new sustainability plan uh, makes, makes sense and at the right time. And I'll turn it back over to 
Ms. Grant Dawson to explain more of the details. So the difference in this plan, uh, the fiscal vitality plan had several areas that I would consider um, areas of focus and tasks for the district to do. Um, there were you know, components of implement, um, complete, uh, uh, train, so they were very action oriented. The sustainability plan and its structure that we seek to, to provide and what you have in front of you not only provides the history from the fiscal vitality plan, but also talks about our strategic development into the future. We are in this very unique um, circumstance to clear a very significant hurdle for the district to be able to move forward and to be able to focus on the priorities that we've established. So we've talked about what caused us to be in this place was a budget and financial situation. So the uh, various stakeholders that are focused to not only support the district, but also evaluate the district's ability, want to ensure that we're able to develop a sound budget um, in a multi-year format that assures that we will um, be in a sustainable position. They want to see quality in education and that the investments and the resources that we earn are uh, supporting all students. And we had a very robust and healthy conversation just prior to this about many of those areas that we need to address. Uh, we wanna be able to make sure that the, the confidence that the board can make difficult decisions, that comes up frequently because I think people don't realize that when a district goes under state receivership, it is um, a function of can the board um, make decisions to be able to um, ensure that the organization is in a good position or they're supporting the superintendent um, or, it, or are there challenges that continue to create um, crisis and therefore concern which places us um, in a precarious circumstance. So the various areas that um, we need to cover, we won't go over all of them, uh, definitely due to time. Um, to include purchasing and procurement, a very significant area that um, we need to work through um, and on beyond what uh, I think most may lift up as some of the contract processes that have been discussed, position control, our enrollment projections, which we spent a lot of time on and seeking to um, educate um, the entire district on. When we continue to move forward, um, our benefits and employee compensation are the key areas that we need to um, support and address internal controls, which uh, require not only that we develop them, but we are already, we're able to train and consistently uh, measure how we're controlling our operations within um, the district. Our use of one-time funds, the district again is very fortunate in many circumstances to have various resources, but the way that we use them um, and the length of time in which we're building the district sustainability on those one-time funds is significant. The budget development and stakeholder engagement, again, we felt was very key to point out because it's an area that, again, listening to the voice of the customer has not been a stronghold for the district. And so not only do we wanna do that, but we wanna also look at starting our budget de development process earlier so that we can um, have the opportunity to discuss strategize and make the best decisions uh, for the district. Um, we also have talked about and heard earlier about enrollment and how are we ensuring that we're able to maintain our enrollment year over year and the attendance that coincides with that, which is how we're funded. Um, we do want to continue to reduce um, our, our use of one-time resources, which um, I've um, just discussed and building our budget using our base program funding and then using those resources to supplement uh, with full awareness and um, the availability to see how long will we be able to maintain various um, investments um, based on some of the one-time and or restricted funding. Uh, we talked about the ability to make uh, difficult decisions. Um, many of those the areas are enhancing our enrollment. If we, again, in and enhance our enrollment and are able to maintain it, we'll see more resources come into the district and also be able to uh, continue to champion um, quality education um, in Oakland Unified School District. So we've uh, been talking about the sustainability plan prior to this um, evening, um, but today and tonight was the first read. Tomorrow, this will be back on the agenda at the Budget and Finance Committee. Um, it is the Thursday night place to be. 
um, the second Thursday of the month. And then on February 24th, we'll be back um, with uh, uh, presenting it to the board for action. So this evening, we are seeking your feedback and thoughts in preparation for our return on the 24th. And I will turn um, it over back over to President Gonzalez for um, next steps in facilitation. And so thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Grant Dawson. Colleagues, what questions or feedback do you all have? Go ahead, uh, Director Thompson. Yeah, uh, I was just wondering, under um, uh, difficult decisions, I know you have one, one item there and you talked about increasing the enrollment. Um, Will that include looking at the number of facilities that we operate in our district, or is that another item that you should place there? Um, so it was actually called out already within the plan. Um, uh, so currently it's not separate, it's a both end because the plan is what strategies are you going to develop district comprehensively um, to support um, your ongoing um, operations? A good question. Thank you so much for that. Okay, thank you. That's it. Any other questions or colleagues' comments? Um, I, I'll, I have a question, Ms. Grant Austin, which is how come this doesn't really have any numbers um, or, you know, like the direction we're trying to go? So, for example, you identified a bunch of strategies that we still need to get a better handle on. But I don't really see any connection to a specific idea that you have thoughts around how that, what that could save us, right? Cost savings um, or the revenue that different strategies could generate. So I'm just curious, is that coming? So the way that this plan works, it will. Um, there are several pending decisions and action items that are already in play and that we've already implemented. So when we're looking at the sustainability plan, whether it's uh, the components of the citywide plan, whether it's enrollment strategies, um, or whether it's our budget development process, those things are in play. When they're in play, we tie them back to the sustainability plan. And what we also have included um, in the actual plan is how we true up on the plan. That wasn't something that was necessarily in the vitality plan, but we tied it to the financial reports. So here's what we, we plan, whether it's for one year or two years, and then there's a true up that unaudited and as we're preparing for budget of what those strategies are. That is where the numbers and the strategy and the expectation and metrics come into play. So we've created a, a broader latitude for us to be strategic where before um, we, we've continued to keep all of the vitality plan elements and they were very task oriented. Um, you know, do this, check, done, complete, you know, do this, uh, check, done, complete, but it didn't really talk about what's the strategy about how you're going to maintain the sustainability. Okay. But thank you for the question. Uh, great question um, to frame uh, what happens next. Any other questions or comments, colleagues? Go ahead, Director, uh, Vice President Davis. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Ms. Grant Dawson, that's a really great presentation. And um, I just wanted to lift up, you know, something that came up in the discussion with um, Director Williams that, you know, one of the one of the difficult decisions is because we are in a state that drastically underfunds public education, that we are put in this position of, you know, how do we address the needs of schools that are, you know, declining enrollment and get them to be stronger and get them to, to a place where they're building their enrollment again and becoming stronger as schools versus how do we adequately resource our other schools um, that have high enrollment. And so it's a, it is a difficult decision um, to balance, you know, and I think it speaks back to the, the reparations proposal that we were just talking about because of the historical, you know, uh, racism between different schools, especially between the hills and the flats and, and all of the other dynamics. Um, but I had a question that's kind of tangential, um, but it's definitely related because I've gotten a lot of questions about uh, from the community about one-time monies that are coming to Oakland Unified. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit to the, the amounts and the different funds that, are, that might be coming or that we know are coming um, 
and what are the opportunities that that creates and what are the challenges that creates in terms of having a sustainable plan uh, because of you know the seeing a bunch of dollars coming our way but trying to do something that's sustainable for the long term. So thank you for the question. So thank and also thank you for looping in into the agenda item so we can stay on task and we don't get buzzed by making a race Uh So with that, I will say that uh, we're projecting that we're going to receive 57 million in pandemic relief funds. How does that fit into a sustainability plan? So one, we clearly identify those funds as one-time funds. They will have a, an expiration date. Two, based on the parameters of spending, we would determine what we're able to um, invest in. Most of those things will be, again, new, additional, as we discussed, and then how that will live, for instance, in the 21-22 uh, budget and uh, potentially into the 22-23. And so each year with the sustainability plan, as we add those elements, we would talk about the beginning and the end of one-time money and how those resources are helping to support um, the district and what they will enhance and then what they won't be able to address. And so those coinciding dollars for those things that the one-time money doesn't address how we continue to move forward back to the continuous balance that we will have uh, in the foreseeable future, just based on, again, the way that we're funding and the various needs that we have. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Director Yi, I believe you had your hand up. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for the presentation. I guess I was kind of going to where Dr. Thompson was as well, around quality and enrollment, because um, we just had a report from um, the middle school uh, in the middle where they talked about the capacity to market uh, schools. And so I did actually look at some of our um, school med data about um, enrollment, uh, school by school enrollment. <laughs> and the two questions that, that I'm curious about, do we, do we believe that, that our city has the capacity to significantly increase enrollment? In other words, the demographic the large scale demographics of uh, our city are actually showing the potential for a uh, growing enrollment. Is it possible that we're actually uh, facing a declining enrollment in the upcoming years, which over which we can do nothing? And then the second is school quality is, is correlated to school enrollment. I mean, it's not necessarily causal one way or the other, but the, uh, but the issue is going to be, um, as you know, Ms. Grant Dawson, having seen our uh, results-based budgeting, uh, reliance on uh, enrollment and attendance, um, that we may have uh, excess space at some of our schools and therefore inefficiencies in there. So is that part of sustainability? I think that's the tr question Dr. Thompson was raising and I just wanted to uh, reinforce it. The large part of the sustainability is data, um, as you're pointing out. And so one of the areas of uh, it's so an action item um, from my predecessor that um, she was unable to complete um, is that uh, demographic study that we do need to do. Um, I've looked back historically um, to see, you know, population changes, um, what the um, uh, family housing structure has been, because it definitely informs a lot. But that is the very question, you know, where is um, the city going and what can the district expect and where? as the demographic study will show. So that piece of data, all of those, the questions that you have, the, the sustainability plan helps us to launch those elements and therefore be able to say, here's what this data informs us of. And then this is where we can now be more poignant about enrollment um, and where we may have uh, challenges in the future and our triumphs based on projected plans for housing, which school districts do we stay on pulse of where um, uh, homes and other uh, infrastructure are not only being built, um, but potentially um, uh, managed, reimagined, and upgraded as far as neighborhoods. And then there is a predictability as far as uh, uh, who the targets are, families, and potentially you also have to look at dense housing. So there's a lot of components about that that this plan will be able to support, um, not only for the short term, but definitely for the long run, because that's what the district ultimately needs. And currently we don't have that data and we desperately do need it. Colleagues, any other questions or comments for Ms. Grant Dawson? 
Okay, seeing none. Thank you, Ms. Grant Dawson. Hopefully you get some sleep tonight. Thank you. <laughs> we will, we'll move on to item 210148, application for provisional internship permit. I will entertain a motion. So moved. Is there a second, Director Yee? Second. second. And a second from Director Thompson. Colleagues, any comments, questions? Mr. Rakestra, can we have a roll call? Yes, on the roll call to adopt item T4. I'm sorry, T3. Uh, Student Director Powell. Student Director Ramos. Yes. Okay, Director Ng. Yes. Director Yi. Yes. Director Williams. Yes. <laughs> okay. Director Hutchinson. Yes. Okay. Director Thompson. Yes. Vice President Davis. Yes. And President Gonzalez. Yes. Motion's adopted. Great. We will take up item T4. This is an application for a variable term waiver. Um, is there a motion to adopt? So moved. Uh, thank you, Director Thompson. Is there a second? Yes, second. Uh, thank you, Director Yi. Um, is there any discussion by the board? Mr. Rakestra, can we get a roll call on this item? Uh, Student Director uh, Ramos. Yes. Student Director Powell. Director Williams. Yes. Director uh, Hutchinson. Yes. Director Ng. Okay, Director Yi. Yes. Director Thompson. Yes. And Vice President uh, Davis. Yes. And President Gonzalez. Yes. The motion is adopted. Thank you, Mr. Rakestra. Um, we, I believe we do not have a pupil discipline consent report tonight. Um, so we will take up the general consent report minus item. V19, um, which is 21.0140, which we will take up at the end of the consent report. Um, is there a motion to adopt the general consent report? Minus item V19. Okay, you guys are tired. It, I will move adoption. Is there a second? second. I will second it. Okay, uh, <laughs> thank you, Director Thompson. Uh, is there any discussion? Go ahead, Director Hutchinson. Yes, I, I just want to uh, reference what uh, uh, Sister Asada brought up before that we still have contracts that are backdated in the consent report. Um, there are questions about some of these data collection contracts. And so again, I don't wanna pull them at this point, but we do need to firm this up. And at a certain point, I'm gonna start pulling all of these contracts because as a board, when we just had a conversation about uh, finances and these other things, we need to have a much tighter control on our contracting practices. So hopefully again, going forward, we can end the practice of putting predated contracts in the consent report so we can really have a, a better, a firmer hand on managing our finance. Thank you, Director Hutchinson. Uh, is there any other discussion by the board? Okay, Mr. Rakestra, can we have a roll call on the motion? Yes, yeah, so on the motion to adopt the general consent report as stated by the state. V19. Director Thompson? Director Thompson? Yes. Yes. Okay. Director Hutchinson? Yes. Okay. Director Williams? Yes. Director Yi? Yes. Director Ng? Yes. Senator Director Ramos? Yes. Okay, Vice President uh, Davis? Yes. And President uh, Gonzalez? Yes. The motion is adopted. Thank you, Mr. Rakestra. Item V1 is our second general consent report. These are our bond measure um, funded contracts. Uh, is there a motion to adopt um, item V1? Okay, I will move adoption of item V1. Is there a second? Second. 
Thank you, Director Yi. Is there any discussion by the board? Okay, Mr. Rakestraw, can we have a roll call? Yes, Student Director Reynolds. Yes. Student Director Powell. Uh, Director Yi. Yes. Director Ng. Yes. Director Thompson. Yes. Director Williams. Yes. Director Hutchinson. Yes. Vice President Davis. Vice President Davis. I think he stepped away. Okay. And President Gonzalez. Yes. Motion's adopted. Thank you, Mr. Rakestraw. Um, tonight we have several new legislative matters. This is- I would have been I've been pulled from the consent report. Uh, thank you, thank you, Director Hutchinson. Go B19, Mr. Hutchinson, take it away. May we have a motion? Um, I will move adoption of B19. Is there a second? Go ahead, uh, thank you, Director Yi. Go ahead, Director Hutchinson. Thank you. Um, I, I just really wanted to pull this item because um, this has been a point of contention for and a lot of questions in the community. And so this item is for a learning pod at United for Success um, being run by Safe Passages. And what's happened over the last nine months is what were originally uh, contracts with after school providers have had these rolling amendments and a change in the scope of their work. And now we're at this point where we're contracting and this is backdated again till August. We are contracting with after school providers to provide learning pods for our schools. Um, I think while our schools are shut down, while we don't have a current MOU with our teachers, um, that this is very problematic. And this is what's caused so many questions in the community. Because I would ask, how can we have learning pods that we're contracting for, but we can't have in-person schooling? And so I would really hope that we as a board are going to step up and be in charge of this reopening plan, creating a hybrid plan for next year and getting us through this school year but doing it through the consent report and contracting with outside providers as a workaround to not having a plan based in the district with our district employees, I think is very, very problematic. And so I would like us going forward not to contract for these pods with outside providers, but figure out a way for OUSD to start delivering education again. And if we can't do it in person, we shouldn't be contracting with an outside provider to do it in person. And so again, going forward, these are things that hopefully will not be on the consent report because this board has not weighed in on these larger policy issues, like what do we want to do going forward and what is our model going to be? And so, um, you know, I, again, uh, for the consent report, there were a lot of things in it. I can just pull it for now, but I'm going to have to start voting against these things because I don't think this is the way we should be doing business. And I really think we need to have a discussion as board directors first before these policy issues are put in the consent report. Thank you, Director Hutchinson. Colleagues, any discussion questions for Mr. Hutchinson or staff? Okay, not seeing any. Mr. Rakestra, can we have a roll call on the motion? Yes, Director Pell, Director Ramos? Yes. Okay, Director Ng? Yes. Director Yi? Director Yi? Yes. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, Director Williams? Yes. Uh, Director Hutchinson? No. Director Thompson? Yes. Vice President Davis? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you, sir. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. And President Gonzalez? Yes. Motion's adopted. Thank you, Mr. Rakestraw. We have a number of new legislative matters tonight. This is item W. Um, the first one is um, called changing um, the process for charter school petitions, renewals and material revisions. Um, if you had a chance to read the memo, the, the gist is that we um, 
have had in the past a situation where the charter school office has made a recommendation um, to either approve a school or to renew a school. Um, you know, and it was not the decision ultimately of the board was not consistent. Um, and then it caused confusion when it reached uh, the county on, you know, on appeal. And so um, this is a basically a request that the charter school office go back and rewrite um, our policy that would give us the option to not have the charter the office of charter schools make recommendations so that we don't end up in those situations again. Um, so that's the bottom. That's why I mean, that's why I'm bringing it forward. It'll come to the charter matters committee. I believe Mr. Rakestraw is working to confirm um, our next meeting date. Um, if it's March 4th, then it will yes. come forward on March, March 4th. 4th. Yes. Okay, March 4th. so we'll take it up on March 4th along with several other matters um, from uh, regarding charter schools. Um, Mr. Hutchinson, would you like to introduce your item? Yes, thank you. Um, so with, with the help of General Counsel Daniels, um, I'm introducing this item calling on the school board to ask for a waiver or the school board and the superintendent to ask for a one-year waiver from Prop 39 due to COVID. And I think it's, it's really important as we are just beginning the conversations about how we're gonna deliver education in 2122. And we know that we're gonna have to have social distancing in our schools, that we should have the freedom to decide what our plan is going to be before we are compelled to give away our space to anyone. And, and I think, you know, we have a lot of these yearly requirements that are, are really in conflict with us planning for what we're going to do uh, for our COVID reopening and hybrid plan for 2122. And so starting with Prop 39, I, I would really uh, ask my fellow board directors to consider us looking into waivers so we can have the freedom to first decide what we need to do as a district delivering education before we are compelled to give away space. And just lastly, the utilization formula was done prior to COVID. It doesn't reflect what we're gonna need for social distancing. I would also say that charter schools are gonna have different requirements now also. And so this is one of the um, unintended consequences of what's happened during this pandemic is we have all these yearly processes and there's been no thought put into how do we actually build a plan for next year to allow us to do the best we can before we're compelled to make these other decisions. So hopefully President Gonzalez will bring this back for a, uh, a vote during this Prop 39 cycle. And, and again, I really hope that we as a board can be proactive in creating our plan first so we can do the best by our students before we're compelled to give away space or make any of these other decisions. We have to prioritize and make sure we are fully utilizing um, our stuff first. So uh, in my conversations with General Counsel Daniels, um, this is like the pandemic itself. This is a, um, a new uh, thought and a new way to go about things. And so hopefully, again, um, the board will really consider looking into um, protecting our ability to come up with our plan to serve our students. Thank you. Thank you, Director Hutchinson. Um, this will probably also be agendized on March 4th for the Charter Matters Committee. Um, let's see here. So um, the third item here on new legislative matters is a policy, a draft policy that Director Thompson and I have been working on together. Um, we are about to, um, some of us had our two by twos today, um, starting to take up the measure Y spending plan. And before that happens, I thought it was a good time for us to revisit um, what is our, what are our existing policies on our bond program? And do we have enough guidance that we've given um, on our priorities for how we use bond funds? So that's really the, 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 the reason for this. Um, hope you all will have a chance to look at it. And when it comes up for um, discussion, I'm really looking forward to hearing everyone's feedback. Director Thompson, um, as a member of the facilities committee, um, would you like to chime in with anything? Well, the only thing is um, I um, had a conversation with um, Director Yi, and we're going to bring it to the facilities committee and we'll have a conversation uh, there. We're planning to do that. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're planning to do that Friday, Friday morning. Okay, so you guys will have a chance if you wanna watch online or for those of you who are on the facilities committee, we'll get to um, hear the discussion. So that's when that will come back. Um, and that's it for new legislative matters. Um, 
So with that, we will move on to item X, which is regular board member reports. Do any board members have reports that they'd like to make? Go ahead, Director Ng. Um, I will just, uh, I missed part of the celebration, so I will just do it in this section, is that um, uh, Friday is Lunar New Year, and there's a number of celebrations that are happening at different schools across the campus, or across the district, and I um, was able to participate in a virtual Lunar New Year celebration at Lincoln, and I know that there's other activities that are happening. And um, one thing I did want to mention um, as well on a related note is that um, um, as uh, many of you may know from some of the media um, and publicity, there's been an um, increase of incidents that have been happening downtown in Oakland Chinatown and also in San Francisco Chinatown. And so there's been a lot of um, outreach around ways to support um, the Chinatown community and, um, and um, Council Member President Bass has been really active in this area too, but but um, one of the best ways is to help support the small businesses there by by shopping there or or um, visiting restaurants in support, particularly of the Lunar New Year. And so, um, just wanted to lift that up. I know that um, when when staff was at One Thousand Broadway, there I know that some staff were very intentional about having lunch there on a regular basis to. Um, to be able to support the small businesses that have been hit really hard this past year. So anyways, I just want to just acknowledge um, the new year and all of the um, celebrations and, and efforts that are going on. Thank you. Thanks, Director Ng. Any other board member reports? Okay. Um, we will move on to item Y. Um, which is agenda building and work plan review. Um, we don't have our work plan posted here, at least not on the version that I have, so I cannot easily pull that up. But uh, I don't know if anybody would like to say anything about agenda building or work plan. We do have a very packed agenda for our next meeting, so everybody take your take your no-dos. Um, anything, any other comments on that before we move on to public comment um, on, on any other agenda items? Okay. This is, we're gonna move on to item Z, which is our last opportunity for public comment on, for the meeting. So please raise your hand if you would like to make a public comment. And Ms. Delton, we will do two minutes. I mean, sorry, Ms. Floyd, we will do two minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, first speaker is Davis. Thank you for the two minutes. Um, first, I wanna say thank you to Director Hutchinson for uh, the new legislative matter. I think it's, you know, I've raised this before um, in relation to using the COVID capacity numbers uh, that OUSD has already derived to ensure that we are able to get as many kids back onto campuses when it's safe next fall. Um, and, you know, our ability to do that is, uh, is impacted if we also are using old COVID capacity numbers, as Director Hutchinson pointed out, um, when calculating how much space to offer to charter schools. So I think that the idea of getting away, I think we should have had a statewide waiver anyway, because I think that that's, that would have been the right thing to do. But I also think as a district and something within your control, you can actually control that decision. And I think the last piece of that is we need to think about um, our facility use agreements, when we do get to the point where we've made these offers, that we ensure that, um, that the charter schools that are co-located with district schools are following sim similar protocols and density requirements so that we are not uh, overfilling the campuses uh, unintentionally. The other thing I wanted to say is, uh, you know, is hard listening to the reparations uh, conversation. I realized that there, you know, that there are practicalities that that need to be dealt with, but I also feel like this is a moment when um, the district has the opportunity to really stand up. But I wanted to specifically address the point that Dr. Yi brought up, which is, um, and, and I think unfairly, because uh, I did not read this in that, that it was anti-charter, that there were anti-charter provisions. I think the point is that it is uh, primarily uh, African-American schools that have been impacted by school closures and co-locations. The disruption that each of those causes, we've seen it you know, recently when we shoved uh, kids into closets at Howard, we've seen the disruption at uh, 
16 of our 18 closed schools over the last 15 years have been more than 60% African American students. And we can see that we are, our African American students are not thriving. So I don't think we can, we can take apart those two things and say that, that the uh, co-locations and school closures have not negatively impacted African American students. And I think that's your time. Students, Thank you. I think the point is that this reparations would fix that. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Carol Dilton. Okay, um, good, good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to address three items. Uh, first of all, as a voter, I very much um, appreciate the bond prioritization of facilities for students. Um, you know, that's something, uh, one of the reasons I got active um, as a, a public commentator at the district level was not getting satisfactory uh, answers to questions that I asked my then district director about the, the proposed usage of bond funds that I didn't think I had voted for um, building a new central office. Um, I'd also like to support Director Hutchinson's um, proposed legislation and um, how, say how important it is that that comes back to the board at a time when it is useful in this cycle of Prop 39 offers. I do understand it coming uh, to the Charter Committee. Uh, I hope it will promptly come back to the board for a vote to, to help with um, the health and education of OUSD district students. Um, and lastly, one of the ways that I see the reparations proposal is that it ties together uh, some of the work of the George Floyd resolution and as well as the disproportionality work that's going on um, through the special education department, but uh, branching into general education. Um, those have both been such rich discussions um, that touch on so many processes within the district but it is so important to see each part of that as part of systemic racism that needs to be dismantled. It is so important that all of those bits and pieces be addressed in a comprehensive way. And thank you, Director Williams, Director Hutchinson for bringing that forward. Thank you, Ms. Dalton, next speaker. Our next speaker is Jim Mordecai. Mordecai speaking as individual, um, my, my first point is the point I've been making all night is that uh, uh, Shanti Gonzalez is a tyrant in the way she runs the meeting. She allows the public to speak sometimes and other times they have to remain silent and it's up to her to decide how it's going to go according to the way she got the rules written. So I would like Jessica to ask the other students at the school, do they think the public should have more opportunities to comment or less? And if you think they should have less, then I would expect at the next meeting uh, with uh, you tell the students that that will mean that you will, you will stand up by standing out, walking out of the meeting, as I would hope at some point yeah, uh, you know, a month after month, you don't follow the Brown Act, and not a single board member member has walked out of any of these meetings. Oh, because it's silly. Well, then you need to change your registration. You should be Republicans. Republicans don't follow the rules. They just do what's expedient. So uh, you can follow the Republican way and continue to just, just allow yourself to be uh, led and go through routines rather than standing up for a basic law, which is the Brown Act. that says you don't get to comment after the, the board is considered an island item. It says it clearly. Jessica, when you read it, notice it doesn't allow you to comment after. You have to comment before or during. And then you got this silly thing the lawyer put in where you just... Uh, near the beginning, go ahead and say something like, uh, uh, we'll give you a minute to talk about everything on the agenda. And then you can freeze out 
the the public on like uh, speaking about the the the, uh, the basic budget and not allowing a comment. Thank or you, Ms. Morgan, for that's your time. Can we call the next speaker. Next speaker is Parent Voices. Hi, good evening. Um, I'll be brief. I know it's a late night. Um, I'm, this is regarding the, um, excuse me, I'm speaking as parent voices, but also this is Clarissa Douthard, um, Oakland Unified School District parent. Um, this is regarding the reparations for um, Black students campaign. I just want to thank the board, um, board of directors, uh, and the superintendent um, for moving the resolution to further the discussion for possible adoption. Um, I really want to um, especially thank um, our champions, Dr. Um, uh, Director Williams and uh, Director Hutchinson. And also just lift up um, the superintendent's comments about early literacy. Um, I don't see her on the screen now, but it is a critically important piece of our children's education. Really looking forward to exploring the options around that piece. Um, Parent Voices um, works on policy around child care and early care and education. And um, we often don't hear about uh, the need for a solid foundation, right, in those early years. Um, and I also just wanted to make a very quick comment around, I heard the discussion around en enrollment and the need to um, increase enrollment. And we can't look at um, enrollment and not see the patterns of gentrification in our city, which disproportionately affects the black community and has, right? Our black communities have been pushed out um, and that has a connection, right, to who is in our communities, who's attending our schools. Um, and I think that our reparations campaign is also looking at that. And school closures are a part of the gentrifying process. There's no ifs, ands, buts around it. When we are closing schools that are traditionally, traditional public schools in our neighborhoods um, that have community surrounding them, right, that have access to those schools, um, it has an impact on black communities. And so, you know, we can debate the semantics of that, but um, the realities of anti-Black racism, housing, and our school, community schools are something that we will continue to address um, in the Reparations for Black Students campaign. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Douthar. Next speaker. Our next speaker is a call-in listener, area code 510, and the last three numbers are 345. Caller, you will need to hit star six to unmute. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go okay, ahead. I'm sorry. This is Asada Oligbawa. Uh, I, I, I can't believe the volume of conversation that went on around passing the resolution for reparations for Black students. I don't know why I can't believe it because it happens all the time. Anytime you're talking about black people, it's a whole different level of how you deal with the issues related to black people. And in this city, black lives don't matter. I go through this all the time with the city council around gentrification, around the police department, around homelessness, around evictions of black people and nothing's happening. So we got a conversation tonight where people are saying we've got to look at the cost factor. We've got to look at something related to chartered schools and how you don't blame chartered schools. It is absolutely absurd that the task force can't go forward and you got to bring this back on the 24th. But Black lives don't matter. Systemic racism is in place. You are a part of it tonight. You are a part of it tonight. And you're talking about costs and every board meeting, you approve the, the consent agenda and you don't know what the hell is going on with the money. You rubber stamp everything. And when it comes to black children getting some attention, you got to bring up costs. Did you bring up costs when it came to the newcomer school and every time you have it on the agenda to, to meet the needs of the newcomer students, the newcomers get more attention in this district than black children do. So I'll be at the next meeting and stop talking about charter schools, Thompson, 
There was no need to bring up Ames Chartered School. You try to you represent chartered schools more than you represent black children. This is ridiculous. Black lives don't matter. Don't pretend like you have done something for black children tonight. You have failed black children again. Next speaker, please. Next speaker, Sayuri Valenza. Hello, my name is Sayuri Sakamoto Valenza. I'm a <clears throat> moderate um, intensive as special day class teacher at Bret Hart Middle School. Um, and I'm concerned about <clears throat> reopening at the time when we were still in school. I think we had 12 or 13 students and I think six adults in my classroom um, in a fairly small space. And I think at the time when we were talking about going in needing to be spaced six feet apart, I was told I would have to split the class into two separate classrooms and just go back and forth between the two classes. Um, and, and then, but also, uh, Bret Hart, I guess, was uh, Latitude High School was offered seven classrooms at Bret Hart. And so, um, and we already had teachers sharing classrooms. And so the notion that we have space to offer um, is not accurate. And so I just wanted to put that out there. And then also, when we talk about uh, literacy, please think about our libraries. Uh, it's ed code that every school should have a school librarian, a teacher librarian, I'm sorry, and we don't even have libraries at most of our schools. And we just cut the director of library position. And she was actually recruited by Oakland Unified because of what an amazing she job she did with the library system in juvenile hall. So they had better libraries than we did. So we recruited her and then we, we eliminated her position. And so please, when you're thinking about reparations for black students and literacy, please uh, think about our libraries and how we are totally out of compliance. And if we want our kids to read, we need libraries. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Valenza. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Kampala Ransifer. I think we lost Ms. Ratzifer. The, okay. next, the next speaker, oh, I'll see her again. Kampala Ransifer. All right, thank you. Sorry, I, I'm not sure exactly what happened. Um, the first thing I, I want to speak to is, um, you know, I want to appreciate um, Director Hutchinson for bringing the resolution around Prop 39. Um, it is very difficult to have a um, school that is co-located during a pandemic. Um, you can go ahead and talk to um, the Brookfield uh, school community about, about the, ch the challenge that was when they first, um, uh, when the pandemic first hit. And that was, you know, some of the things that the, the school community really had to deal with. Um, and now they're <laughs> being threatened with a second one um, during a pandemic. So I, I really just wanna appreciate um, that that this resolution is um, being brought forward. Um, I also want to um, just thank directors uh, uh, Hutchinson and Williams for for um, speaking to the reparations campaign. Um, I'm 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 struggling right now because there's a part of me that really had hoped that we were going to be able to have a different relationship with this board. I, I'm feeling and I'm working through my own personal feelings because um, as somebody who worked really hard on this resolution, um, I'm bringing some of my personal experience as a parent and I'm gonna talk to it. And when my son was not yet double digits in this district, they called him a nigga and nobody in this district, nobody cared. Nobody in this school, in his school, it went unaddressed. I had to go to the state to be able to get that harm repaired. I refused to bring my daughter to school in OUSD because I did not want that kind of harm to happen to her before she was double digits. But when I brought her back, 
within three months, that's exactly what happened to her. You know what else happened to her? She came in with her Afro. Somebody was like, oh, look at your hair. But because of where I put her in school, she said, I like being black. Thank you. I like my Afro and I like being black. That's what all of our students in this district deserve. They, be, they deserve to be able to come to school and not feel harm. I taught a classroom of first graders in almost in every single year, somebody was, their children assaulting another child. Their, their children, I can't play with you because you're black. This is happening right now. And the conversation that you're having, do we have money? I feel like as a parent, you're asking, do we have the money for this resolution? I'm saying, well, maybe you're gonna pay for it one way or the other, because maybe me as a parent, I don't want to tolerate this harm. You have an, a, do we have the time? Do you have the time to address what happens to my kid? Do you have the time? I, 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 I'm in my feelings. I can't believe the question would be raised. I would support this if we didn't have the Prop 39 or the closures in there. Well, if you're one of the parents at a school when your child is being taught in a closet so that some French dual aversion school can come in, you might feel a little sense of urgency and that that is an issue that you don't wanna have happen to anyone else. I, I, I really, I'm, I'm trying to understand that I know you guys are not coming from a bad place, but what I, what I feel like you're missing and what, I, what is becoming raised to me is that you don't understand what's happening out here for our kids. You don't feel it like we feel it. You don't know what's going on. It is like, it's like tone deafness. I am feeling very frustrated that even after people have watched on the television, black men die, that we can still have this kind of discussion over what you know you gotta do. You know you gotta do it. What do you mean do we have the money? Are you kidding me? I, 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 I'm, 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 I'm shaking with fury. I am trying my hardest to come with a positive attitude towards this new board, but I feel like we are looking at systemic racism and why it continues to present itself. You have got to stop doing what you're doing and do something else. Thank you, Ms. Taze Rancifer. Our next speaker, please. Our next speaker is Ms. Alvarado. Mayra Alvarado, fifth grade teacher at OUSD. I don't, I don't even know how to follow Kampala. Like, I'm here, like I said before, as a Latinx ally. And there's several things I wanted to comment on. But I'll start with the comments that Kampala just brought up. Black families, Black students have come tonight asking you for, for you to pass this resolution. And it really breaks my heart that we're asking about the money. And I remember Director Hutchinson saying earlier, why aren't we asking about the cost to our Black students, right? Like the emotional harm that this has done. I've seen Black teachers leave. I've seen Black, amazing Black leaders leave. Why are we still doing this in this district? We're pushing out our students. I don't want to talk about charter schools. We're pushing our students out into charter schools or out into other districts. Like, let's talk about keeping our students here. If we want to talk about like, fiscal responsibility, like we need to be able to keep our students here and think about that strategy. But it just really breaks my heart that we're not listening to the community. And we're thinking about the money, but we don't think about the money for other things. And for people to come here and really show their vulnerability, like that hurts. 
So that's one. Two, I just wanted to speak on uh, Director Hutchinson's proposal to uh, for a waiver to Prop 39. I agree with it wholeheartedly. Last year, I was at MLA, uh, co-located with the charter school. At one point, one of my co grade level partners, um, for one reason or another, you know, she had to take. Uh, she was absent. There was no sub, as tends to happen in our district. And I had a class of 45 students, while the charter school had an empty library. A predominantly white charter school had a empty library and I have 45 kids of very different backgrounds in a very hot classroom in the middle of the summer. Like, I don't know how that was okay then. And to think about how that could, there could be co-locations during a pandemic. Like, how are we gonna do social distancing? So I totally agree with Dr. Hutchinson's proposal and I hope that it goes through with the district. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Alvaro. Ms. Flood, are there additional speakers? And that's our last speaker. Oh, we have one more, Ben Tap Scott. Okay, Ms. Tap Scott. Mr. Tap Scott needs to unmute himself. Okay, let's come back to Mr. Tapscott. Are there any other speakers? Yes, uh, Kaya Dantzler. Okay, I'm ready. Can you hear me? I can hear you. You know, I had high hopes for new board members coming in and I'm still gonna have some. It seems that some of you are complicit with racism. An hour and 20 minutes talking about black students. We've been failing them for years. The Latinos have given up on public schools. They thought they had found the golden ring with charters. I cannot believe the things you've done to schools in West Oakland. You've closed a total of 14 public schools, six in West Oakland. We have 300 middle school kids having to go outside their neighborhood because the superintendent, the board will not give West Oakland a feeder school because they want to destroy McClymonds. A location, who's counting empty seats when the kids haven't been in school since March? Why don't we co-locate charter schools with charter schools? We've got an adult ed campus out there across from East Mod Mall. Why don't you put the charter school students over there? We own the property. Talking about money, you can spend $5 million on 1,000 Broadway, but you can't remodel McClymonds even though we voted for the funds. You've got 75, 76 staff members in the district office. It doesn't make sense that you won't take care of 24%, but you're not taking, really taking care of the Latinos either. I'm telling you, don't bring American Indian over to West Oakland. There will be problems. I'm telling you, don't bring it over there. I don't understand why some of you, Sam, you and Amy, you got to step up. That vote should be five to two every time. You know where Chauncey and Gia are coming from. Bought and paid for. Sam, you need to step up. That's why we got you in there and we want to see it. Amy, you need to decide where you're going to go. I can't believe that the city of Oakland doesn't care about black students. I've watched it for over 20 years. And it's hurtful to see what happens. We have 450 students leaving West Oakland because this district will not give them a feeder school because you want to close them out. And I'm telling you, it's not going to happen without a fight in West Oakland. East Oakland has problems. 
they don't realize six That's high schools and only a half a middle school, Cliff. Next speaker is Kaya Dantzler. Yeah, hello. I just want to echo what was already said around the conversation that was had about the reparations campaign for Black students. I'm really just horrified by the inhumanity on display um, and the conversation around funding and trying to find funding for this resolution. I think that Director Hutchinson really hit it on the head when he was talking about the real cost uh, benefit analysis that should be happening in terms of all of the Black children, all the Black families who have been harmed over decades of funneling um, Black students into the school to prison pipeline and how that has completely destroyed people's lives. I just think it's ridiculous that it's you guys are even having this conversation around wanting to have an itemized budget for something that is a moral imperative. And really, it's just so disheartening to hear this and to see this happening because it's a no brainer. When you look at the numbers, when you look at the way that Oakland has been devastated by gentrification and the way black people have been harmed. And when we look at what we've been through this year for you all to continue to have this conversation around whether or not you can find funding or whether or not, you know, the solutions that have been outlined by the community are appropriate is ridiculous. And I'm just so disgusted, honestly, by the way that you all are in conversation around this resolution. It needs to be passed. You need to address and repair the harm that has been done to black children and black families for decades in Oakland. Like there, what is there, what is there for you guys to be talking about? Figure it out. Like there's no reason for you to be having that sort of conversation when you have so many people advocating on behalf of this resolution. You have so many people who have, who have come to the table across the district, whether they're parents, whether they're teachers, whether they're administrators that know that this needs to happen. I think that you guys need to pass this resolution and you need to figure it out. And that's it. Thank you, Ms. Dantzler. With that, we will conclude um, our last public comments for the night um, and we will adjourn the meeting in honor of Chan Fin Seichow, um, a good, uh, and Linda Grayson, uh, two good friends of our district and the people who work for our district. Everybody have a good night. We will see each other in a couple weeks or at a committee meeting coming up soon.